Section 1 of The Prairie Wife This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jennifer Perry. The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer Thursday the 19th Splash! That's me, Matilda Ann. That's me falling plump into a pool of matrimony before I've even had time to fall in love. And, oh, Matilda Ann, Matilda Ann, I've got to talk to you. You might be 6,000 miles away, but you've got to be my safety valve. I'd blow up and explode if I didn't express myself to someone. For it's so lonesome out here, I could go and commune with the gophers. This isn't a 20-part letter, my dear, and it isn't a diary. It's the coral ring I'm cutting my teeth of desolation on. For every so long, I've simply got to sit down and talk to someone, or I'd go mad, clean, stark, raving mad, and bite the tops off the sweet grass. It may even happen that this will never be sent to you, but I like to think of you reading it someday, page by page, when I'm fat and 40. Or what's more likely, when Duncan has me chained to a corral post or finally shut up in a padded cell. For you were the one who was closest to me in the old days, Matilda Ann, and when I was in trouble, you were always the staff on which I leaned, the calm-eyed Tilly on the spot who never seemed to fail me, and I think you'll understand. But there's so much to talk about, I scarcely know where to begin. The funny part of it all is I've gone and married the other man, and you won't understand that a bit unless I start at the beginning. But when I look back, there doesn't seem to be any beginning, for it's only in books that things really begin and end in a single lifetime. Howsomever, as Chinky used to say, when I left you and Schemin' Jack in that funny little stone house of yours in Corfu, I got to Palermo and found Lady Agatha and Chinky there at the Hotel de Palms, and the yacht being cold from a tramp steamer's bunkers in the harbor. So I went on with them to Monte Carlo. We had a terrible trip all the way up to the Riviera, and I was terribly seasick. And those lady novelists who love to get their heroines off on a private yacht never dreamed that in anything but duck pond weather. The ordinary yacht at sea is about the meanest habitation between heaven and earth. But it was in Monte Carlo I got the cable from Uncle Carlton telling me the Chilean revolution had wiped out our nitrate mine concessions and that your poor tabby last little nest egg had been smashed. In other words, I woke up and found myself a beggar. And for a few hours, I even thought I'd have to travel home on that Monte Carlo Vaticum Fund, which so discreetly ships away the stranded adventurer before he messes up the Mediterranean scenery by shooting himself. Then I remembered my letter of credit and firmly but sorrowfully paid off poor Hortense, who, through her tears, proclaimed that she would go with me anywhere and without any thought of wages. Imagine being hooked up by a maid to whom you were under such democratizing obligations. But I was firm, for I knew the situation. Might as well be faced first as last. So I counted up my letter of credit and found I had exactly $671 American money between me and beggary. Then I sent a cable to Theobald Gustav so condensed that he thought it was code, and later on found that he had been sending flowers and chocolates all the while to the Hotel de la Thine, the long boxes duly piled up in tears like coffins at the morgue. Then Theobald's aunt, the Baroness, called on me, in state. She came in that funny, old-fashioned, shallow lando of hers, where she looked for all the world like an oyster on the half-shell, and spoke so pointedly of the dangers of international marriages that I felt sure she was trying to shoo me away from my handsome and kingly Theobald Gustav, which made me quite calmly and solemnly tell her that I intended to take Theobald out of undersecretary ships, which really belonged to Oppenheim romances, and put him in the shoe business in some nice New England town. From Monte Carlo, I scooted right up to Paris, 
Two days later, as I intended to write you but didn't, I caught the boat train for Cherbourg. And there, at the rail, as I stepped on the Baltic, was the other man. To wit, Duncan Argyle McCall, in a most awful-looking yellow-plaid English Macintosh. His face went a little blank as he clamped eyes on me, for he dropped up to Banff last October when Chinky and Lady Agatha and I were there for a week. He'd been very nice that week in Banff, and I liked him a lot, but when Chinky saw him going a bit too strong, as he put it, he quickly tipped Duncan Argyle off as to Theobald Gustav. The aforesaid D.A. bolted back to his ranch without as much as saying goodbye to me, for Duncan Argyle McCall isn't an Irishman, as you might in time gather from that name of his. He's a Scotch-Canadian, and he's nothing but a broken-down civil engineer who's taken up farming in the Northwest. But I could see right away that he was a gentleman. I hate that word, but where will you get another one to take its place? And had known nice people, even before I found out he'd taught the Duchess of S to shoot Bighorn. He'd run over to England to finance a cooperative wheat-growing scheme, but had failed because everything is so unsettled in England just now. But you're a woman, and before I go any further, you'll want to know what Duncan looks like. Well, he's not a bit like his name. The West has shaken a good deal of the Covenanter out of him. He's tall and gaunt and wide-shouldered and has brown eyes with hazel specks in them and a mouth exactly like Holbein's astronomers and a skin that is almost as disgracefully brown as an Indian's. On a whole, if Lena Cavallari happened to marry a Lord Kitchener and had happened to have a 30-year-old son, I feel quite sure he'd have been a dead spit, as the Irish say, of my own Duncan Argyle. And Duncan Argyle, alias Dinky Donk, is rather reserved and quiet and, I'm afraid, rather masterful, but not as Theobald Gustav might have been. For with all his force, the modern German, it seems to me, is like the bagpipes being somewhat lacking in suavity. And all the way over, Dinky Dunk was so nice that he almost took my breath away. He was also rather audacious, gritting his teeth in the face of the German peril. And I got to like him so much, I secretly decided we'd always be good friends. Old-fashioned, above-board, platonic good friends. But the trouble with platonic love is that it's always turning out too nice to be platonic or too platonic to be nice. So I had to look straight at the bosom of that awful yellow plaid English Macintosh and tell Dinky Dunk the truth. And Dinky Dunk listened with his astronomer mouth set rather grim and otherwise not in the least put out. His sense of confidence worried me. It was like the quietness of a man who's holding back his trump. And it wasn't until the impossible little wife of an impossible big lumberman from Saginaw, Michigan, showed me the Paris Herald, with the cable in it about the spidery Russian stage dancer L getting so nearly killed in Theobald's card down at Long Beach, that I realized there was a trump card, and that Dinky Dunk had been too manly to play it. I had a lot of thinking to do the next three days. When Theobald came on from Washington and met the steamer, my conscience troubled me, and I should have still been kindness itself to him if it hadn't been for his proprietary manner, which, by the way, had never annoyed me before, coupled with what I already knew. We had luncheon in the Della Robia room at the Vanderbilt, and I was digging the Marins out of a nestle road when... Presto! It suddenly came over me that the baroness was right and that I could never marry a foreigner. It came like a thunderclap. But somewhere in that senate of instinct which debates over such things down deep in the secret chamber of our souls, I suppose the whole problem had been talked over and fought out and put to the vote. And in the face of the fact that Theobald Gustav had always seemed more nearly akin to one of Ouida's demigods than any man I had ever known, the vote had gone against him. My hero was no longer a hero. 
I knew there had been times, of course, when that hero, being a German, had rather regarded this universe of ours as a department store and this earth as the particular section over which the August Master had appointed him floorwalker. I had thought of him as my Isenfrieser and my big blonde Sabarassler, but my eyes opened with my last Moran and I suddenly sat back and stared at Theobald's handsome pink face with its croup steel blue eyes and its howdily upturned mustache ends. He must have seen that look of appraisal on my own face, for with all his iron and blood Prussianism, he clouded up like a hurt child. But he was too much of a diplomat to show his feelings. He merely became so uncruciously polite that I felt like poking him in his steel blue eye with my mint straw. Remember, Matilda Ann, not a word was said not one syllable about what was there in both our souls. Yet it was one of life's biggest moments, the great divide of a whole career. And I went on eating Nassau Road, and Theobald went on pleasantly smoking his cigarette and approvingly inspecting his well-manicured nails. It was funny, but it made me feel blue and unattached and terribly alone in the world. Now I can see things more clearly. I know that mood of mine was not the mere child of caprice. Looking back, I can see how Theobald had been more critical, more silently combative, from the moment I stepped off the Baltic. I realized, all at once, that he had secretly been putting me to a strain. I won't say it was because my dot had gone with the nitrate mines, or that he had discovered that Duncan had crossed on the same steamer with me, or that he knew I'd soon hear of the L episode. But those prophetic bones of mine told me there was trouble ahead, and I felt so forsaken and desolate in spirit that when Duncan whirled me out to Westbury in a hired motor car to see the Great Neck first defeated by the Meadowbrook Hunters, I went with the happy-go-lucky glee of a truant who doesn't give a hang what happens, Dinky Dunk was interested in polo ponies, which, he explained to me, are not a particular breed, but just come along by accident, for he bred and sold mounts to the Coronado and San Mateo clubs and the Philadelphia City Calvary Boys. And he loved the game. He was so genuine and sincere and human as we sat there side by side that I wasn't a bit afraid of him and knew we would be chums and didn't mind his lapses into silence or his extension sole English shoes and crazy London cravat. And I was happy until the school bell rang, which took the form of Theobald's telephone message to the Ritz, reminding me of our dinner engagement. It was an awful dinner, for intuitively I knew what was coming— and quite as intuitively, he knew what was coming, and even the waiter knew when it came, for I flung Theobald's ring against his stately German chest. There'd be no good in telling you, Matilda Ann, what led up to that most unladylike action, but I don't intend to burn incense in front of myself. It may have looked wrong, but I know you'll take my word when I say he deserved it. The one thing that hurts is that he had the triumph of being the first to sever diplomatic relations. In the language of Shorty McCabe and my fellow countrymen, he threw me down. Twenty minutes later, after composing my soul and powdering my nose, I was telephoning all over the city trying to find Duncan. I got him at last, and he came to the Ritz on the run. Then we picked up a residuary old horse handsome on Fifth Avenue and went rattling off through Central Park. There I, who once boasted of seven proposals and three times that number of nibbles, promptly and shamelessly proposed to my dinky dunk, though he is too much of a gentleman not to swear it a horrid lie and that he'd have fought through an acre of Greek fire to get me. But whatever happened, Count Theobald Gustav von Gunther threw me down, and Dinky Dunk caught me on the bounce. And now, instead of going to embassy balls and talking world politics like a Mrs. Humphrey Ward heroine, I've married a shack owner who grows weed up in the Canadian Northwest. 
and instead of wearing a tiara in the grand tier at the Metropolitan, I'm up here a dot on the prairie and wearing an apron made of butcher's linen. Sir some corda. For I'm still in the ring, and it's not an easy thing to fall in love and land on your feet, but I've gone and done it. I've taken the high jump. I've made my bed, as Uncle Carlton had the nerve to tell me, and now I've got to lie in it. But, assise de l'étanger. That wedding day of mine I'll always remember as the day of smells, the smell of the pew cushions in the empty church, the smell of the lily of the valley, that dear, sweet, scatterbrained Fanny rain in the face, she rushed to town an hour after getting my wire, insisted on carrying, the smell of the leather in the damp taxi, the tobacco-y smell of Dinky Dunk's quite impossible best man who'd been picked up at the hotel on the fly to act as a witness, and the smell of Dinky Dunk's brand new gloves as he lifted my chin and kissed me in that slow, tender, tragic, end-of-the-world way big, bashful men sometimes have with women is all a jumble of smells. Then, Dinky Dunk got a wire saying he might lose his chance on the Stewart Ranch if he didn't close before the Calgary interest got hold of it, and Dinky Dunk wanted that ranch. So we talked it over, and in five minutes had given up the idea of going down to Aiken and were telephoning for the stateroom on the Montreal Express. I had just four hours for shopping, scurrying about after cookbooks and golf boots and table linen and a chafing dish and a lot of other absurd things I thought we'd need on the ranch. And then we flew off for the West before poor, extravagant, ecstatic Dinky Dunk's 36 wedding orchids from Thorley's had faded, and before I had a chance to show Fanny my nighties. Am I crazy? Is it all wrong? Do I love my Dinky Dunk? Do I? The good Lord only knows, Matilda Ann. Oh, God, oh, God, if it should turn out that I don't, that I can't, but I'm going to. I know I'm going to. And there's one other thing that I know, and when I remember it, it sends a comfy warm wave through all my body. Dinky Dunk loves me. He's as mad as a hatter about me. He deserves to be loved back, and I'm gonna love him back. That is a vow I hear with duly register. I'm going to love my Dinky Dunk. But Oh, isn't it wonderful to wake love in a man, in a strong man, to be able to sweep him off that way, on a tidal wave that leaves him rather white and shaky in the voice and trembly in the fingers, and seems to light a little luminous fire at the back of his eyeballs so that you can see the pupils glow, the same as in animals when your motor headlights hit them. It's like taking a little match and starting a prairie fire and watching the flames creep and spread until the heavens are roaring. I wonder if I'm selfish. I wonder. But I can't answer that now, for it's supper time, and your tabby has the grub to rustle. End of section one. Section 2 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Saturday, the 21st. I'm alone in the shack tonight, and I'm determined not to think about my troubles. So I'm going to write you a ream, Matilda Ann, whether you like it or not. And I must begin by telling you about the shack itself and how I got here. All the way out from Montreal, Dinky Dunk, in his kindly way, kept doing his best to key me down and make me not expect too much. But I'd hold his hand, under the magazine I was pretending to read, and whistle, Home Sweet Home. He kept saying it would be hard for the first year or two, and there would be a terrible number of things I'd be sure to miss. Love me and the world is mine, I hummed as I leaned against his big, wide shoulder. And I lay there smiling and happy, blind to everything that was before me, 
And I only laughed when Dinky Dunk asked me if I'd still say that when I found there wasn't a nutmeg grater within seven miles of my kitchen. Do you love me? I demanded, hanging on him right in front of the carporter. I love you better than anything else in all this wide world, was his slow and solemn answer. When we left Winnipeg, too, he tried to tell me what a plain little shack we'd have to put up with for a year or two, and how it wouldn't be much better than camping out, and how he knew I was clear grit and would help him win that first year's battle. There was nothing depressing to me in the thought of life in a prairie shack. I never knew, of course, just what it would be like, and had no way of knowing. I remembered Chinky's little love of a farm in Sussex, and I'd been a week at the Westbury's place out on Long Island, with its terraced lawns and gardens and greenhouses and macadamianized roads. And on a whole, I expected a cross between a shooting box and a Swiss chalet, a little nest of a home that was so small it was sure to be lovable. With a rambling rose draping the front and a crystal spring bubbling at the back door, a little flowery island on the prairie where we could play Swiss Family Robinson and sally forth to shoot prairie chicken and ruffled grouse to our heart's content. Well, that shack wasn't quite what I expected, but I mustn't run ahead of my story, Matilda Ann, so I'll go back to where Dinky Dunk and I got off the sideline accommodation at Buckhorn with our traps and trunks and handbags and suitcases and these had scarcely been piled onto the wooden platform before the station agent came running up to Duncan with a yellow sheet in his hand. And Duncan looked worried as he read it and stopped talking to his man called Oli, who was there beside the platform in a big, sweat-stained Stetson hat, with a big team hitched to a big wagon with straw in the bottom of the box. Oli, I at once told myself, was a Swede. He was one of the ugliest men I ever clapped eyes on, but I found out afterward that his face had been frozen in a blizzard years before, and his nose had split. This had disfigured him, and the job had been done for life. His eyes were big and pale blue, and his hair and eyebrows were pale yellow. He was the most silent man I ever saw. But Dinky Dunk had already told me he was a great worker and a fine fellow at heart. And when Dinky Dunk says he'd trust a man through thick and thin, there must be something good in that man, no matter how bulbous his nose is or how scared looking he gets when a woman speaks to him. Oli looked more scared than ever when Dinky Dunk suddenly ran to where the train conductor was standing beside his car steps, asked him to hold that accommodation for half a minute, pulled his suitcase from under my pile of traps and grabbed little me in his arms. Quick, he said. Goodbye. I've got to go to Calgary. There's trouble about my registrations. I hung on to him for dear life. You're not going to leave me here, Dinky Dunk, in the middle of this wilderness? I cried out while the conductor and brakeman and station agent all called and hallooed and clamored for Duncan to hurry. Oli'll take you home, beloved, Dinky Dunk tried to assure me. You'll be there by midnight, and I'll be back by Saturday evening. I began to bawl. Don't go. Don't leave me, I begged him. But the conductor simply tore him out of my arms and pushed him aboard the tail end of the last car. I made a face at a fat man who was looking out a window at me. I stood there as the train started to move, feeling that it was dragging my heart with it. Then Dinky Dunk called out to Oli from the back platform. Did you get my message and paint that shack? And Oli, with my steamer rug in his hand, only looked blank and called back, No. But I don't believe Dinky Dunk even heard him, for he was busy throwing kisses at me. I stood there at the edge of the platform, watching that lonely last car end fade down into the lonely skyline. Then I mopped my eyes, took one long, quivery breath, and said out loud, as Bertalone Pebbly said Shiner did when he was laying wounded in the field of Magersfontein, squealer, squealer, who's a squealer?
I found the big wagon box filled with our things and Oli sitting there waiting, viewing me with wordless yet respectful awe. Oli, in fact, has never yet got used to me. He's a fine chap, in a rough and inarticulate way, and there's nothing he wouldn't do for me, but I'm a novelty to him. His pale blue eyes look frightened, and he blushes when I speak to him. And he studies me secretly, as though I were a dromedary or an archangel or a mechanical toy whose inner mechanism perplexed him. But yesterday, I found out through Dinky Dunk what the probable secret of Oli's mystification was. It was my hat. It ban so dumb foolish, he fervently confessed. That wagon ride from Buckhorn out to the ranch seemed endless. I thought we were trekking clear up to the North Pole. At first, there was what you might call a road, straight and worn deep, between parallel lines of barbed wire fencing. But this road soon melted into nothing more than a trail, a never-ending, gently curving trail that ribboned out across the prairie floor as far as the eye could see. It was a glorious afternoon. One of those opaline, blue-arched autumn days when it should have been a joy merely to be alive. But I was in an antagonistic mood, and the little cabin-like farmhouses that every now and then stood up against the skyline made me feel lonesome, and the jolting of the heavy wagon made me tired, and by six o'clock I was so hungry that my ribs ached. We had been on the trail then almost five hours and Oli calmly informed me that it was only a few hours more. It got quite cool as the sun went down, and I had to undo my steamer rug and get wrapped up in it. And we still went on. It seemed like being at sea, with a light now and then miles and miles away. Something howled dismally in the distance and gave me the creeps. Oli told me it was only a coyote, but we kept on and my ribs ached worse than ever. Then I gave a shout that nearly frightened Oli off the seat, for I remembered the box of chocolates we had had on the train. We stopped and I found my handbag and lighted matches and looked through it. Then I gave a second and more dismal shout, for I remembered Dinky Dunk had crammed it into his suitcase at the last moment. Then we went on again with me a squaw woman all wrapped up in her blanket. I must have fallen asleep, for I woke with a start. Oli had stopped at a slough to water his team and said we'd make home in another hour or two. How he found his way across that prairie, heaven only knows. I no longer worried. I was too tired to think. The open air and the swaying and jolting had chloroformed me into insensibility, Oli could have driven over the edge of a canyon, and I should never have stopped him. Instead of falling into a canyon, however, at exactly ten minutes to twelve, we pulled up beside the shack door, which had been left unlocked, and Oli went in and lighted a lamp and touched a match to the fire already laid in the stove. I don't remember getting down from the wagon seat, and I don't remember going into the shack, but when Oli came from putting in his team, I was fast asleep on a luxurious divan made of a rather smelly steer hide, stretched across two slim cedar trees on four little cedar legs, with a bag full of pine needles at the head. I lay there watching Oli, in a sort of torpor. It surprised me how quickly his big, ungainly body could move, and how adept those big sunburned hands of his could be. Then, sharp as an arrow through a velvet curtain, came the smell of bacon through my drowsiness. And it was a heavenly odor. I didn't even wash. I ate bacon and eggs and toasted biscuits and orange marmalade and coffee, the latter with condensed milk, which I hate. I don't know how I got to bed, or got my clothes off, or where the worthy Oli slept, or who put out the light, or if the door had been left open or shut. I never knew that the bed was hard or that the coyotes were howling. I only know that I slept for ten solid hours without turning over, and that when I opened my eyes, I saw a big square of golden sunlight dancing on the unpainted pine boards of the shack wall. And the funny part of it all was, Matilda Ann, 
I didn't have the splitting headache I'd so deloriously prophesized for myself. Instead of that, I felt buoyant. I started to sing as I pulled on my stockings, and I suddenly remembered that I was terribly hungry again. I swung open the window beside me, for it was on hinges, and I poked my head out. I could see a corral and a long, low building, which I took to be the ranch stables, and another and a newer-looking building with a metal roof and several stacks of hay surrounded by a fence and a row of portable granaries. And beyond these stretched the open prairie, limitless and beautiful in the clear morning sunshine. Above it arched a sky of robin egg blue, melting into opal and pale gold down toward the rim of the world. I breathed in lungfuls of clear, dry, ozonic air, and I really believe it made me a little lightheaded. It was so exhilarating, so champagneized with the invisible bubbles of life. I needed that etheric eye-opener, Matilda Ann, before I calmly and critically looked about our shack. Oh, that shack, that shack. What a come down it was from your heart sore chatty. In the first place, it seemed no bigger than a ship's cabin and not one half so orderly. It is made from lumber, not of logs, and is about 12 feet wide and 18 feet long. It has three windows, on hinges, and only one door. The floor is rather rough and has a trap door leading into a small cellar where vegetables can be stored for winter use. The end of the shack is shut off by a tarp, which I have just found out is short for tarpaulin. In other words, the privacy of my bedroom is assured by nothing more substantial than a canvas drop curtain shutting off my boudoir, where... I could never very successfully boudet from the larger living room. This living room is also the kitchen, the laundry, the sewing room, the reception room, and the library. It has a good big cook stove, which burns either wood or coal. A built-in cupboard with an array of unspeakably ugly crockery dishes and a row of shelves for holding canned goods, books, and magazines, cooking utensils, gun cartridges, tobacco jars, carpenter's tools, and a coal oil lamp. There's also a plain pine table, a few chairs, one rocking chair, which has plainly been made by hand, and a flour barrel. Outside the door is a wide wooden bench, on which stands a big tin wash basin and a cake of soap in a sardine can that has been punched full of holes along the bottom. Above it hung a roller towel, which looked a little worse for wear. And that was to be my home, my one and only habitation, for years and years to come. That little cat-eye cubbyhole of a place. I sat down on an overturned wash basin about 20 paces from the shack and studied it with calm and thoughtful eyes. It looked infinitely worse from the outside. The reason for this was that the board siding had been first covered with tar paper, for the sake of warmth, and over this had been nailed pieces of tin, tin of every color and size and description. Some of it was flattened out stovepipe, some was obviously the sides of tomato cans, even tin tobacco boxes and Dundee marmalade holders, and the bottoms of old bake pans and the sides of an old wash boiler had been pieced together and patiently tacked over those shack sides. It must have taken weeks and weeks to do. And it suddenly impressed me as something poignant, as something with the Virgilian touch of tears in it. It seemed so full of history, so vocal of the tragic expedience to which men on the prairie must turn. It seemed pathetic. It brought a lump into my throat. Yet that Joseph's coat of metal was a neatly done bit of work. All it needed was a coat of paint or two, and it would look less like a crazy quilt solidified into a homestead. And I suddenly remembered Dinky Donk's question called out to Oli from the car end, and I knew he'd hurried off a message to have the telltale tinning job painted over before I happened to clap eyes on it. 
As Oli had disappeared from the scene and was nowhere to be found, I went in and got my own breakfast. It was supper over again, only I scrambled my eggs instead of frying them, and all the while I was eating that meal, I studied those shack walls and made mental note of what should be changed and what should be done. There was so much that it rather overwhelmed me. I sat at the table, littered with its dirty dishes, wondering where to begin. And then the endless vista of it all suddenly opened up before me. I became nervously conscious of the unbroken silence about me, and I realized how different this new life must be from the old. It seemed like death itself, and it got a stranglehold on my nerves, and I knew I was going to make a fool of myself the very first morning in my new home, in my home and Dinky Dunks. But I refused to give in. I did something which startled me a little, something which I had not done for years. I got down on my knees beside that plain wooden chair and prayed to God. I asked him to give me strength to keep me from being a piker and make me a wife worthy of the man who loved me and lead me into a way of bringing happiness to the home that was to be ours. Then I rolled up my sleeves, tied a face towel over my head, and went to work. It was a royal cleaning out, I can tell you. In the afternoon, I had Oli down on all fours, scrubbing the floor. When he had washed the windows, I had him get a garden rake and clear away the rubbish that had littered the dooryard. I draped chintz curtains over the windows and had Oli nail two shelves in a packing box and then carry it into my boudoir behind the drop curtain. Over this box, I tacked fresh chintz, for the shack did not possess so feminine a thing as a dresser, and on it put my folding mirror and my Tiffany traveling clock and all my foolish, shimmery, silver toilet articles. Then I tacked up photographs and magazine prints about the bare wooden walls and decided that before winter came, those walls would be painted and papered or I'd know the reason why. Then I aired the bedding and mattress and unpacked my brand new linen sheets and those ridiculous hem-stitched pillow slips that I scurried so frenzily about the city to get and stowed my things away on the box shelves and had Oli pound the life out of well-sunned pillows and carefully remade the bed. And then I went at the living room. And it was no easy task, reorganizing those awful shelves and making sure I wasn't throwing away things Dinky Dunk might want later on. But the carnage was great, and all afternoon the smoke went heavenward from my fires of destruction. And when it was over, I told Oli to go out for a good long walk. I intended to take a bath, which I did in the wash tub, with much joy and my last cake of rage and galet soap. And I had to shout to poor ambulating Oli for half an hour before I could persuade him to come in to supper. And even then he came tardily, with countless hesitations and pauses, as though a lady tamararious enough to take a scrub were for all time taboo to the race of man. And when he finally ventured in through the door, round-eyed and blushing a deep russet, he gaped at my white midi and my little white apron with that silent but eloquent admiration which couldn't fail to warm the cockles of the most unimpressionable housewife's heart. End of section two. Section 3 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Monday the 23rd. My dinky dunk is back, and oh, the difference to me! I kept telling myself that I was too busy to miss him. He came Saturday night as I was getting ready for bed. I'd been watching the trail every now and then, all day long, and by nine o'clock had given him up. When I heard him shouting for Oli, I made a rush for him, with only half my clothes on, and nearly shocked Oli and some unknown man, who'd driven Dinky Dunk home, to death. How I hugged my husband. My husband. I love to write that word. 
And when I got him inside, we had it all over again. He was just like a big overgrown boy. And he put the table between us so he'd have a chance to talk. But even that didn't work. He smothered my laughing and kisses and held me up close to him and said I was wonderful. Then we'd try to get down to earth again and talk sensibly. And then there'd be another death clinch. Dinky Dunk says I'm worse than he is. Of course, it's all up with the man, he confessed, when he sees you coming for him with that Australian crawl stroke of yours, for which I did my best to break his floating ribs. Heaven only knows how late we talked that night, and Dinky Dunk had a bundle of surprises for me. The first was a bronze reading lamp. The second was a soft little rug for my bedroom, only an Axminster, but very acceptable. The third was a pair of Juliet's, lined with fur, and oceans too big for me. And Dinky Dunk says by Tuesday, we'll have two milk cows, part Jersey, at the ranch, and inside of a week, a crate of hens will be ours. Thereupon, I couldn't help leading Duncan to the inventory I had made of what we had, and the list, on the opposite side, of what we had to have. The second thing under the heading of needs was lamp, and the fifth was bedroom rug, and the thirteenth was hens, and the next was cow. I think he was rather amazed at the length of that list of needs. But he says I shall have everything in reason. And when he kind of settled down and noticed the changes in the living room, and then went in and inspected the bedroom, he grew very solemn of a sudden. It worried me. Lady Bird, he said, taking me in his arms. This is a pretty hard life I've trapped you into. It will have to be hard for a year or two, but we'll win out in the end, and I guess it'll be worth the fight. Dinky Dunk is such a dear. I told him of course we'd win out, but I wouldn't be much used to him at first. I'd have to get broke in and made bridal-wise. But, oh, Dinky Dunk, whatever happens, you must always love me. And I imagine I swam for him with my Australian crawl stroke again. All I remember is that we went to sleep in each other's arms. And as I started to say, but forgot to finish, I'd been missing my Dinky Dunk more than I imagined those last few days. After that night, it was no longer just a shack. It was home. Home It's such a beautiful word. It must mean so much to every woman. And I fell asleep telling myself it was the loveliest word in the English language. In the morning, I slipped out of bed before Dinky Dunk was awake, for breakfast was to be our first home meal, and I wanted it to be a respectful one. Der Minst ist was her ist. So, I must feed my lord and master on the best in the land. Accordingly, I put an extra tablespoon of cream in the scrambled eggs and two whole eggs in the coffee to make dead sure it was crystal clear. Then, feeling like Van Roon when Berlin declared war on France, I rooted out Dinky Dunk, made him wash, and sat him down in his pajamas and ragged old dressing gown. I suppose... I said, as I saw his eyes wander about the table, that you feel exactly like an oyster man who's just clipped his blue point and got his knife edge under the shell, and the next wrench is going to tell you exactly what sort of an oyster you've got. Dinky Dunk grinned up at me as I buttered his toast, piping hot from the range. Well, Lady Bird, you're not the kind that'll need paprika, anyway, he announced as he fell to and he ate like a boa constrictor and patted his pajama front and stentoriously announced that he'd picked a queen, only he pronounced it Kavin, after the manner of our poor old Swedish Oli. As that was Sunday, we spent the morning pirooting around the place. Dinky Dunk took me out and showed me the stables and the haystacks and the granaries, which he'd just waterproofed so there would be no more spoilt grain on that farm and the cool hole he used to use before the cellar was built, and the ruins of the sod hut where the first homesteader that owned that land had lived. Then he showed me the new bunkhouse for the men, which Oli is finishing in his spare time. 
It looks much better than our own shack, being of plain lumber, but Dinky Dunk is loyal to the shack. He says it's really better built and the warmest shack in the West, as I'll find out before winter is over. Then we stopped at the pump, and Dinky Dunk made a confession. When he first bought the ranch, there was no water at the shack, except what he could catch from the roof. Water had to be hauled for miles, and it was muddy and salty at that. They used to call it gopher soup. This lack of water always worried him, he said, for women always want water, and oodles of it. It was the year before, after he had left me at Banff, that he was determined to get water. It was hard work putting down that well, and up to the last moment, it promised to be a dry hole. But when they struck that water, Dinky Dunk says, he decided in his soul that he was going to have me, if I was to be had. It was water fit for a queen, and he wanted his queen. But of course, even queens have to be well laved and well laundered, He said he didn't sleep all night after they found that water was there. He was too happy. He just went meandering about the prairie, singing to himself. So you were pretty sure of me, kitten cats, even then? I demanded. He looked at me with his solemn Scotch-Canadian eyes. I'm not sure of you even now, was his answer. But I made him take it back. It's rather odd how Dinky Dunk got this ranch which used to be called the Cochrane Ranch, for even behind this peaceful little home of ours, there's a touch of tragedy. Hugh Cochrane was one of Dinky Dunk's surveyors when he first took up railroad work in British Columbia. Hugh had a younger brother, Andrew, who was rather wild and had to be brought out here and planted on the prairie to keep him out of mischief. One winter night, he rode nearly 30 miles to a dance. They do that, apparently, out here and think nothing of it. And instead of riding home at five o'clock in the morning with the others, he visited a whiskey runner who was operating a blind pig. There, he acquired much more whiskey than was good for him and got lost on the trail. That meant he was badly frozen and probably out of his mind before he got back to the shack. He wasn't able to keep up a fire, of course, or do anything for himself and I suppose the poor boy simply froze to death. He was alone there, and it was weeks and weeks before his body was found. But the most gruesome part of it all is that his horses had been stabled, tied up in their stalls without feed. They were all found dead, poor brutes. They'd even eaten the wooden boards the mangers were built of. Hugh Cochran couldn't get over it and was going to sell the ranch for $1,400 when Dinky Dunk heard of it and stepped in and bought the whole half section. Then he bought the McKinnon place, a half section to the north of this, after McKinnon had lost his buildings because he was too shiftless to make a fire guard. And when the railway work was finished, Dinky Dunk took up wheat growing. He's a great believer in wheat. He says wheat spells wealth in this country. Some people call him a land miner, he says. But when he's given the chance to do the thing he wants to, he'll show them who's right. End of section three. Section four of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Wednesday, the 25th. Dinky Dunk and I have been making plans. He's promised to build an annex to the shack, a wing to the north side, so that I can have a storeroom and a clothes closet at one end and a guest chamber at the other. I'm to have a sewing machine and a bread mixer, and the smelly steerhide divan is going to be banished to the bunkhouse. And Dinky Dunk says I must have a pinto, a riding horse, as soon as he can lay hands on the right animal. Later on, he says I must have help, but out here in the West, women are hard to get and harder to keep. They're snatched up by lonely bachelors like Dinky Dunk. They can't even keep the school teachers, mostly girls from Ontario, from marrying off. But I don't want a woman about, not for a few months yet. I want Dinky Dunk all to myself, 
and the freedom of isolation like this is such a luxury. To be oneself in civilization is a luxury. It is the greatest luxury in the world, and also the most expensive, I have found to my sorrow. Out here, there's no objection in being anything but oneself. Life is so simple and honest, so back to first principles. There's joy in the thought of getting rid of all the subliminated junk of city life. I'm just a woman, and Dinky Dunk is just a man. We've got a roof and a bed and a fire. That's all. And what is there, really, after that? We have to eat, of course, but we really live well. There's all the game we want, especially wild duck and prairie chicken, to say nothing of jackrabbit. Dinky Dunk sallies out and pots them as we need them. We get our veal and beef by the quarter, but it will not keep well until the weather gets cooler. So I put what we don't need in brine and use it for boiling meat. We have no fresh fruit, but even evaporated peaches can be stewed so that they're appetizing. And as I had the good sense to bring out with me no less than three cookbooks from Brentano's, I am able to attempt more and more elaborate dishes. Ole has a wire-fenced square where he grew beets and carrots and onions and turnips and the biggest potatoes I ever saw. These will be pitted before the heavy frosts come. We get our butter and lard by the pail and our flour by the sack, but getting these things in quantities sometimes has its drawbacks. When I examined the oatmeal box, I found it had weevils in it and promptly threw all that meal away. Dinky Dunk, coming in from the corral, viewed the pile with round-eyed amazement. It's got worms in it, I cried out to him. He took up a handful of it and stared at it with tragic sorrow. Why, I ate weevils all last winter, he reprovingly remarked. Dinky Dunk, with his scotch strain, loves his porridge, so we'll have to get a hundredweight, guaranteed strictly uninhabited, when we team into buckhorn. Men are funny. A woman never quite knows a man until she's lived with him and day by day unearthed his little idiosyncrasies. She may seem close to him in those early days of romance, but she never really knows him, any more than a sparrow on a telegraph wire knows the Morse code thrilling along under its toes. Men have so many little kinks and turns, even the best of them. I tacked oilcloth on a shoebox and draped chintz around it and fixed a place for Dinky Dunk to wash in the bedroom when he comes in at noon. At night, I knew it would be impossible, for he's built a little wash house with old binder carrier canvas nailed to four posts. And out there, Ole and him strip every evening and splash each other with horse pails full of well water. Dinky Dunk is clean whatever he may be, but I thought it would look more civilized if he performed his limited noonday abolitions in the bedroom. He did it for one day, in pensive silence, and then sneaked the wash things back out to the rickety old bench outside the door. He said it saved time. Among other vital things, I found out that Dinky Dunk hates burnt toast. Yesterday morning, Matilda Ann, I got to thinking about Corfu and Ragusa and you, and it did burn a little around the edges, I suppose. So I kissed his ear and told him that carbon would make his teeth white. But he got up and went out with a sort of in-this-way-madness-lies expression, and I felt wretched all day. So this morning, I was more careful. I did that toast just to a turn. Feast, O oh, Kikobod, on the blondest of toast. I said as I salimed and handed him the plate. He wrinkled up his forehead a little at the sting in that speech, but he could not keep from grinning. Then, too, Dinky Dunk always soaps the back of his hand to wash his back and reach up high. So do I. And on cold mornings, he says, one, two, three, the bumblebee, before he hops out of bed. And I imagined I was the only grown-up in all the wide world who still made use of that foolish rhyme. And the other day, when he was hot and tired, I found him drinking a dapper full of cold water fresh from the well. So I said, Many a man has gone to his sarcophagus through pouring cold water down his warm esophagus. When I recited that rhyme to him, he swung about as though he'd been shot. Where did you ever hear that? 
he asked. I told him that was what Lady Agatha always said to me when she caught me drinking ice water. I thought I was the only man in the world who knew that crazy old couplet, he confessed, and he chased me around the shack with the rest of the dapperful to keep from chilling his belly, he explained. Then, Dinky Dunk and I both like to give pet names to things. He calls me Ladybird and Gigi and sometimes Honey and sometimes Boca Chica and Tabby. And I call him Dinky Dunk and the Dower Man and Kitten Cats. Though for some reason or another, he hates that last name. I think he feels it's an affront to his dignity. And no man likes a trace of mockery in a woman. But Dinky Dunk's names are born of affection, and I love him for them. Even the ranch horses have all been tagged with names. There's Sipalong and Waterlight and Bonk and Patsy Crocker and Pick and Shovel and Tumbleweed and others that I can't remember at the moment. And I find I'm picking up certain of Dinky Dunk's little habits and dropping into the trick of looking at things from his standpoint. I wonder if husbands and wives really do get to be alike. There are times when Dinky Dunk seems to know just what I'm thinking. For when he speaks, he says exactly the thing I was going to ask him. And he is inexplorable in his belief that one's right shoe should always be put on first. So am I. End of section four. Section 5 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Thursday, the 26th. Dinky Dunk is rather pinched for ready money. He is what they call land poor out here. He has big plans, but not much cash. So we shall have to be frugal. I had decided on vast and sudden changes in this household, but I'll have to draw in my horns a little. Luckily, I have nearly $200 of my own money left and have never mentioned it to Dinky Dunk. So almost every night I study the magazine advertisements and the catalog of mail order house in Winnipeg. Each night I add to my list of needs, then go back and cross out some of the earlier ones as being too extravagant for the length of my list almost gives me heart failure. And as I sit here thinking of what I have to do without, I envy the women I've known in other days, the women with all their white linen and their cut glass and silverware and their prayer rugs and their period rooms and their white tiled baths and their machinery for making life so comfortable and so easy. I envy them. I put away my list and go to bed envying them. But, oh, I sleep so soundly, and I wake up so buoyant in heart, so eager to get at the next day's work, so glad to see I'm slowly getting things more shipshape. It doesn't leave room for regret. And there's always the future, the happier tomorrow to which our thoughts go out. I get to thinking of the city again of the hundreds of women I know going like hundreds of crazy squirrels on their crazy treadmill of amusements, and the thousands and thousands of women who are toiling without hope, going on in the same old rut from day to day, cooped up in little flats and back rooms with bad air and bad food and bad circulation, while I have all God's outdoors to wander about in and can feel the singing rivers of health in my veins. And here I sidestep my song of Solomon voluntary, for they have one thing I do miss, and that is music. I wish I had a cottage piano or a baby grand or a whelk mignon. I wish I had any kind of old piano. I wish I had an accordion or a German sweet potato or even a Jew's harp. But what's the use in wishing for luxuries when we haven't even got a can opener? Dinky Dunk says he used a hatchet for over a year, and our only toaster is a kitchen fork wired to the end of a lath. I even saw Dinky Dunk spend half an hour straightening out old nails taken from one of our shipping boxes, and the only colander we have was one made out of a leaky milk pan with holes punched in its bottom. 
and we haven't a double boiler or a mixing bowl or a donut cutter. When I told Dinky Dunk yesterday that we were running out of soap, he said he'd build a leech of wood ashes and get beef tallow and make soft soap. I asked him how long he'd want to kiss a downy cheek that had been washed in soft soap. He said he'd keep on kissing me if I was a mummy pickled in bitumen. But I prefer not risking too much of the pickling process. Which reminds me of the fact that I find my hair a terrible nuisance with no Hortez to struggle with it every morning. As you know, it's as thick as a rope and as long as my arm. I begrudge the time it takes to look after it. And such a thing as a good shampoo is an event to be approached with trepidation and prepared for with zeal. Koi Sazami beauty, I think I'll cut that wool off. But on each occasion when I have my mind about made up, I experience one of Mr. Polly's little dog moments. The thing that makes me hesitate is the thought that Dinky Dunk might hate me for the rest of his days. And now that our department store aristocracy seems to have a corner in counts, and I seem destined to worry along with merely an American husband, I don't intend to throw away the spoons with the dishwater. But having to fuss so with that hair is a nuisance, especially at night, when I'm so tired that my pillow seems to bark like a dog for me to come and pat it. And speaking of that, reminds me that I have to order arch supports for my feet. I'm on them so much that by bedtime my ankles feel like a chocolate mousse that's been left out in the sun. Yet this isn't a whimper, Matilda Ann, for when I turn in, I sleep like a child. No more counting and going to the medicine chest for coal tar pills. I abjure them. I, who used to have so many tricks to bring the starry-eyed goddess bending over my pillow, hereby announce myself the noblest sleeper north of the line. I no longer need to count sheep as they come over the wall, or patiently try to imagine the sound of surf waves, or laboriously redesign the perennial dinner gown, which I've kept tucked away in the cedar chest of the imagination as long as I can remember elaborating it over and over again down to the minutest detail through the longest hour of my whitest white night until it began to merge into the velvety ropes of slumber itself. Nowadays, an ogre called Ten O'Clock steals up behind my chair with a club in his hand and stuns me into insensibility. Two or three times, in fact, my dear old clumsy-fingered Dinky Dunk has helped me get my clothes off but he says that the nicest sound he knows is to lay in bed and hear the tinkle of my hairpins as I toss them into the little coal port pin tray on my dresser. Which reminds me what Chinky once said about his idea of heaven being eating my divinity fudge to the sound of trumpets. I brag about being busy, but I'm not the only busy person about this wacky up. Oli and Dinky Dunk talk about summer following and double disking and drag howering and fire guarding, and I'm beginning to understand what it all means. They are out with their teams all day long, working like Trojans. We have midday dinner, which Oli bolts in silence with the rapidity of chain lightning. He is the most expert of sword swallowers, with a table knife. And Dinky Dunk says it keeps reminding him how Burbank could make a fortune inventing a square pea that would stay on a knife blade. But Dinky Dunk stopped me calling him the sword swallower and has privately tipped Oli off as to the functions of the table fork. How the males of this old earth stick together. The world of men is a secret order and every man is a member. Having bolted his dinner, Oli always makes for outdoors. Then Dinky Dunk comes to my side of the table. We sit side by side with our arms around each other. Sometimes I fill his pipe for him and light it. Then we talk lazily, happily, contentedly, and sometimes shockingly. Then he looks at our nickel alarm clock up on the bookshelves, which I made out of old biscuit boxes, and invariably says, this isn't the spirit that built Rome, and kisses me three times, once on each eyelid, tight, and once on the mouth. I don't even mind the taste of the pipe. Then he's off, and I'm alone for the afternoon. But I'm getting things organized now so that I have a little spare time. And with time on my hands, I find myself turning very restless. 
Yesterday, I wandered off in the prairie and nearly got lost. Dinky Dunk says I must be more careful until I get to know the country better. He put me on his shoulder and made me promise. Then he let me down. It made me wonder if I hadn't married a masterful man. Above all things, I've always wanted freedom. I'm a wild woman, Duncan. You will never tame me, I confessed to him. He laughed a little. So you think you will? I demanded. No, I won't, Gigi, but life will. And again, I felt some ghostly spirit of revolt stirring in me, away down deep. I think he saw some shadow of it, caught some echo of it, for his manner changed, and he pushed back the hair from my forehead and kissed me, almost pityingly. There's one thing must not happen, I told him as he held me tight in his arms. He did not let his eyes meet mine. Why? he asked. I'm afraid, out here, I confessed as I clung to him and felt the need of having him close to me. He was very quiet and thoughtful all evening. Before I fell asleep, he told me that on Monday, the two of us would team to Buckhorn to get a wagon load of supplies. End of section 5「The Prairie Wife」by Arthur Stringer Read by Jennifer Puri Saturday the 28th I have got my cayuse. Dinky Dunk meant for him to be a surprise, but the shyest and reddest-headed cowboy that ever sat in a saddle came cantering along the trail, and I saw him first. He was leading the shaggiest, pie-ballest, pottest tummied craziest-looking little cayuse that ever wore a bridle. I gave one look to his tawny-colored forelock, which stood pompadour-style about his ears, and shouted out, Paderewski! Dinky Dunk came and stood beside me and laughed. He said that cayuse did look like a Paderewski, but the youth of the fiery locks blushingly explained that his present name was Jailbird, which some fool Scandinavian had used instead of Greybird, his authentic and original appellative. But I stuck to my name, though I have shortened it into Patty. And Patty must indeed have been a Jailbird, or deserved to be one, for he was marked and scarred from end to end. But he is good-tempered, tough as hickory, and obligingly omnivorous. Everyone in the West, men and women alike, rides astride, and I have been practicing on Patty. It seems a very comfortable and sensible way to ride, but I shall have to toughen up a bit before I hit the trail for any length of time. I've been wondering, Matilda Ann, if this all sounds pagan and foolish to you, uncultured, as Theobald Gustav would put it. I've also been wondering, since I wrote that last sentence, if people really need culture, or what we used to call culture, and if it means as much to life as so many imagine. Here we are, out here, without any of the refinements of civilization, and we're as much at peace with our own souls as are the birds of the air, when there are birds in the air, which isn't in our country. Culture it seems to me as I look back on things, tends to make people more and more mere spectators of life, detaching them from and lifting them above it. Or can it be that the mere spectators demand culture to take the place of what they miss by not being actual builders and workers? We are farmers, just rubes and hicks, as they say in my country. But we're tilling the soil and growing wheat. We're making a great new country out of what was once a wilderness. To me, that seems almost enough. We're laboring to feed the world, since the world must have bread. There's something satisfying and uplifting in the mere thought that we can answer to God, in the end, for our lives, no matter how raw and rude they may have been. And there are mornings when I'm Browning's Saul in the flesh. The great wash of air from skyline to skyline puts something in my blood or brain that leaves me almost dizzy. I sizzle. 
It makes me pulse and tingle and cry out that life is good. Good. I suppose it's nothing more than altitude and ozone. But in the manner of intoxicants, it stands on a par with anything that was ever poured out of bottles at Martinis or Bistanabis. And at sunrise, when the prairie is thinly silvered with dew, when the tiny hammocks of the spider web swing a million sparkling webs strung with diamonds, when every blade of grass is a singing string of pearls, hymning to God on high for the birth of a golden day, I can feel my heart swell. I am so abundantly, so inexpressibly alive, alive to every fingertip. Such space, such light, such distances. And being Saul is so much better than reading about him. Wednesday the 1st. I was too tired to write last night, though there seemed so much to talk about. We teamed into Buckhorn for our supplies, two leisurely, lovely, lazy days on the trail, which we turned into a sort of gypsy holiday. We took blankets and grub and feed for the horses and a frying pan and camped out on the prairie. The night was pretty cool, but we made a good fire and had hot coffee. Dinky Dunk smoked, and I sang. Then we rolled up in our blankets, and as I lay there watching the stars, I got to thinking of the lights of the Great White Way. Then I nudged my husband and asked him if he knew what my greatest ambition in life used to be, and of course he didn't. Well, Dinky Dunk, I told him, it was to be the boy who opens the door at Millard's. For two whole years, I ate my heart out with envy of that boy, who always lived in the odor of such heavenly hot chocolate and wore two rows of shining buttons down his braided coat and was never without white gloves, and morning, noon, and night paraded about in the duckiest little skull cap cocked very much to one side like a grenader's. And Dinky Dunk told me to go to sleep or he'd smother me with a horse blanket. So I squirmed back into my blanket and got nested and watched the fire die away while far, far off somewhere a coyote howled. And that made me lonesome. So I got Dinky Dunk's hand and fell asleep holding it in mine. I woke up early. Dinky Dunk had forgotten about my hand, and it was cold. In the east, there was a low bar of ethereal pale silver which turned to amber and then to ashes of rose, and then to gold. I saw one sublime white star go out in the west, and behind the bars of gold the sky grew rosy with morning until it was one burgundian riot of bewildering color. I sat up and watched it. Then I reached over and shook Dinky Dunk. It was too glorious a daybreak to miss. He looked at me with one eye open like a sleepy hound. You must see it, Dinky Dunk. It's so resplendent, it's positively vulgar. He sat up, stared at the pageantry of color for one moment, and then wriggled down into his blanket again. I tickled his nose with a blade of sweet grass. Then I washed my face in the dew, the same as we did in Christ Church Meadow that glorious May Day in Oxford. By the time Dinky Dunk woke up, I had the coffee boiling and the bacon sizzling in the pan. It was the most celestial smell that ever assailed human nostrils, and I blushed with the shame at the thought of how much I ate at that breakfast, sitting flat on an empty oat sack and leaning against a wagon wheel. By eight o'clock, we were in the metropolis of Buckhorn and busy gathering up our things there, and they made a very respectable wagon load. Thursday the 2nd. I have been practicing like mad learning to play the mouth organ. I bought it in Buckhorn without letting Dinky Dunk know, and all day long, when I knew it was safe, I've been at it. So tonight, when I had my supper table all ready, I got the ladder and leaned it against one of the granaries and mounted the nearest haystack. There, quite out of sight, I waited until Dinky Dunk came in with his team. 
I saw him go into the shack and then step outside again, staring about in a brown study. Then I struck up Tramarehi. You should have seen that boy's face. He looked up at the sky as though my poor little harmonica were the aerial outpourings of archangels. He stood stock still, drinking it in. Then he bolted for the stables, thinking it came from there. It took him some time to corner me up on my stack top. Then I slid down into his arms, and I believe he loves that mouth organ music. After supper, he made me go out and sit on the oat box and play my repertory. He says it's wonderful from a distance, but that mouth organ's rather brassy, and it makes my lips sore. Then, too, my mouth isn't big enough for me to tongue it properly. When I told Dinky Dunk this, he said, Of course it isn't. What do you suppose I've been calling you Boca Chica for? And I've just discovered Boca Chica is Spanish for little mouth. And me with a trap, Matilda Ann, that you used to call the Cave of the Winds. Now, Dinky Dunk vows he'll have a Victrola before the winter is over. Ye gods and little fishes, what a luxury. There was a time, not so long ago, when I was rather inclined to sniff at the Westbury's electric player piano and its cabinet of neatly canned classics. How life humbles us. And how blind all women are in their ideals and their search for happiness. The sea stones that lie so bright on the shores of youth can dry so dull in the hand of experience. And yet, as Bertalone's nanny once announced, if you thuck them, they boofle. And I guess it must be a good deal the same with marriage. You can't even afford to lay down on your job of loving. The more we ask, the more we must give. I've just been thinking of those days of my fiercely careless childhood, when my soul used to float out to placid happiness on one piece of plum cake. Only even then, alas, it floated out like a polar bear on its iceberg. For as that plum cake vanished, my peace of mind went with it, madly as I clung to the last crumb. But now that I'm an old married woman, I don't intend to be Hamlet in petticoats. A good man loves me, and I love him back, and I intend to keep that love alive. End of section six. Section 7 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Friday the 3rd I have just issued an ultimatum as to pigs. There shall be no more loose porkers wandering about my dooryard. It's an advertisement in bad management. And what's more, when I was hanging out my washing this morning, a shoot rooted through my basket of white clothes with his dirty nose. And while I made after him, his big brother actually tried to eat one of my wet table napkins. And that meant another hour's hard work before the damage was repaired. Saturday the 4th. Oli is painting the shack, inside and out. And now you'd never know our poor little Joseph Coat home. I told Dinky Dunk if we ever put a chameleon on that shack, he'd have died of brain fag trying to make good on the color schemes. So Dinky Dunk made Oli take a day off and ply the brush. But the smell of paint made me think of channel passages. So I went off with Dinky Dunk, a la team, and buckboard to the Dixon Ranch to see about some horses, nearly 70 miles there and back. It was a glorious autumn day and a glorious ride with bronc and tumbleweed loping along the double trail and the air like crystal. Dinky Dunk and I sang most of the way. The gophers must have thought we were mad. My lord and master is incontinently proud of his voice, especially the chest tones, but he rather trails behind me on the tune, plainly not always being sure of himself. We had dinner with the Dixons and about three million flies. They gave me the blues, that family, and especially Mrs. Dixon. She seemed to make prairie life so ugly and empty and hardening. 
poor, dried up, sad eyed soul, she looked like a woman of 60, and yet her husband said she was just 37. Their water is strong with alkali, and this and the prairie wind, combined with something deep down in her own makeup, have made her like a vulture, lean and scrawny and dry. I stared at that hard line of jaw and cheekbone and wondered how long ago the soft curves were there, and if those overworked hands had ever been pretty, and if that flat back had ever been rounded and dimpled. Her hair was untidy, her apron was unspeakably dirty, and she used it as both a handkerchief and a hand towel. Her voice was hard as nails, and her cooking was wretched. Not a door or window was screened, and as I said before, we were nearly smothered with flies. Dinky Dunk did not dare to look at me all dinner time. And on the way home, Mrs. Dixon's eyes kept haunting me. They seemed so tired and vacant and accusing, as though they were secretly holding God himself to account for cheating her out of her woman's heritage of joy. And I asked Dinky Dunk if we'd ever get like that. And he said, not on your life, and quoted the Latin phrase about mind controlling matter. The Dixons, he went on to explain, were of the slum type, only they didn't happen to live in a city. But tired and sleepy as I was that night, I got up to cold cream my face and arms, and I'm going to write for almond meal and glycerin from the mail order house tomorrow, and a brassiere, for I saw what looked like the suspicion of a smile on Dinky Dunk's unshaven lips as he watched me struggling into my corsets this morning. It took some writhing, and even then I could hardly make it. I threw my wet sponge after him when he turned back in the doorway with the mildly impersonal question, who's your fat friend? Then he scooted for the corral. And I went back and studied my chin in the dresser mirror to make sure it wasn't getting terraced into a dewlap like Uncle Carlton's. But I can't help thinking of the Dixons and feeling foolishly and helplessly sorry for them. It was dusk when we got back from that long drive to their ranch, and the stars were coming out. I could see our shack from miles off, a little lonely dot of black against the skyline. I made Dinky Dunk stop the team, and we sat and looked at it. It seemed so tiny there, so lonely, so strange, in the middle of such miles and miles of emptiness, with a little raft of smoke going up from its desolate little pipe end. Then I said, out loud. Home. My home. And out of the clear sky, for no earthly reason, I began to cry like a baby. Women are such fools sometimes. I told Dinky Dunk we must get books, good books, and spend the long winter evenings reading together to keep from going to seed. And he said, all right, Gigi, and patted my knee. Then we loped along the trail toward the lonely little black dot ahead of us. But I hung on to Dinky Dunk's arm all the rest of the way. Until we pulled up beside the shack, and poor old Oli, with the frying pan in his hand, stood silhouetted against the light of the open door. Monday the 6th The last few days I've been nothing but a two-footed retriever, scurrying off and carrying things back home with me. There have been rains, but the weather is still glorious, and I've discovered such heaps and heaps of mushrooms over at the old Tichborne Ranch. They're thick all around the corral and in the pasture there, and now I'm what your English lord and master would call a perfect seat on Patty, and every morning I ride over after my basketful of agaricus campestris. That ought to be the plural, but I've forgotten how. We have them creamed on toast, we have them fried in butter, and we have them in soup, and such beauties. I'm going to try and can some for the winter and spring use. But the finest part of the mushroom is the finding it, to ride into a little white city that has come up overnight and looks like an encampment of fairy soldiers, to see the milky white domes against the vivid green of the prairie grass, to catch sight of another clump of them, suddenly, like stars against the emerald sky a hundred yards away, to inhale the clean morning air and feel your blood tingle, and hear the prairie chickens whir and the wild ducks scolding along the coulee edges. I tell you, Matilda Ann, it's worth losing a little of your beauty sleep to go through it. 
I'm awake even before Dinky Dunk. And I brought him out of his dreams this morning by poking his teeth with my little finger saying, 12 white horses on a red hill. And I asked him if he knew what it was. And he gave the right answer and said he hadn't heard that conundrum since he was a boy. All afternoon, I've been helping Dinky Dunk put up a barbed wire fence. Barbed wire is nearly as hard as a woman to handle. Dinky Dunk is fencing in some of the range for a sort of cattle run for our two milk cows. He says it's only a small field, but there seem to be miles and miles of that fencing. We had no stretcher, so Dinky Dunk made shift with me and a claw hammer. He'd catch the wire, lever his hammer about a post, and I'd drive in the staple with a hammer of my own. I got so I could hit the staple almost every whack. The one staple went off like shrapnel and hit Didim's ear. So I'm some use, you see, even if I am a chichaco. But a wire slipped and tore through my skirt and stocking, scratched my leg and made the blood run. It was only the tiniest cut, really, but I made the most of it. Dinky Dunk was so adorably nice about doctoring me up. We came home tired and happy, singing together, and Oli, as usual, must have thought we'd both gone mad. This husband of mine is so elementary, he secretly imagines that he's one of the most complex of men, but in a good many things, he's as simple as a child, and I love him for it. Although I believe I do like to bedevil him a little. He is dignified and hates flippancy, so when I greet him with, Morning, old boy! I can see that nameless little shadow sweep over his face. Then I say, Oh, I beg its little pardon. He generally grins, in the end, and I think I'm slowly shaking that monitorial air out of him. Though once or twice, I've had to remind him about La Rochefoucauld saying gravity was a stratagem invented to conceal the poverty of the mind. But Dinky Dunk still objects when I put my finger on his Adam's apple when he's talking. He wears a flannel shirt when working outside, and his neck is bare. Yesterday, I buried my face down in the corner next to his shoulder blade and made him wriggle. As he shaves only on Sunday mornings now, that is about the only soft spot, for his face is prickly and makes my chin sore, the bearded brute. Then I bit him. Not hard, but... Satan said bite, and I just had to do it. He turned quite pale, swung me around so that I lay limp in his arms, and closed his mouth over mine. I got away, and he chased me. We upset things. Then I got outside the shack, ran around the horse corral, and then around the haystacks, with Dinky Dunk right after me, giving me goose flesh at every turn. I felt like a cave woman. He grabbed me like a Stone Age man and caught me up and carried me over his shoulder to a pile of prairie sweetgrass that had been left there for Oli's mattress. My hair was down. I was screaming, half sobbing, half laughing. He dropped me in the hay like a bag of wheat. I started to fight him again, but I couldn't beat him off. Then all my strength seemed to go. He was laughing himself, but it frightened me a little to see his pupils so big that his eyes looked black. I felt like a lamb in a lion's jaw. Dinky Dunk is so much stronger than I am. I lay there quite still with my eyes closed. I went flop. I knew I was conquered. Then I came back to life. I suddenly realized that it was midday in the open air between the bald prairie floor and God's own blue sky, where Oli could stumble on us at any moment and possibly die with his boots on. Dinky Dunk was kissing my left eyelid. It was a cup his lips just seemed to fit into. I tried to move, but he held me there. He held me so firmly that it hurt. Yet, I couldn't help hugging him. Poor, big, foolish, baby-hearted Dinky Dunk. And poor, weak, crazy, storm-tossed me. But, oh God, it's glorious, in some mysterious way, to stir the blood of a strong, big man. It's heaven, and I don't quite know why, but I love to see Dinky Dunk's eyes grow black. Yet it makes me a little afraid of him. I can hear his heart pound, sometimes quite distinctly, and sometimes there's something so pathetic about it all. 
We are such puny little mites of emotion played on by nature for her own immitigable ends. But every woman wants to be loved. Dinky Dunk asks me why I shut my eyes when he kisses me. I wonder why. Sometimes, too, he says my kisses are wicked and that he likes them wicked. He's a funny mixture. He's got the soul of a Scotch Calvinist tangled up in him somewhere, and after the storm, he's very apt to grow pious and a bit preachy. But he has feelings, only he's ashamed of them. I think I'm taking a little of the ice crust off his emotions. He's a stiff clay that needs to be well stirred up and turned over before it can mellow. And I must be a sandy loam that wastes all its strength in one short harvest. That sounds as though I were getting to be a real farmer's wife with a vast knowledge of soils, doesn't it? At any rate, my husband, out of his vast knowledge of me, says I have a swamp cedar trick of flaring up into sudden and explosive attractiveness. Then, he says, I shower sparks. As I've already told him, I'm a wild woman and will be hard to tame. For as Victor Hugo somewhere says, we women are only perfected devils. End of Section 7 Section 8 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Wednesday the 8th. I've cut off my hair. Right bang off. When I got up yesterday morning with so much work ahead of me, with so much to do and so little time to do it in, I started doing my hair. I also started thinking about that Frenchman who committed suicide after counting up the number of buttons he had to button and unbutton every morning and every evening of every day of every year of his life. I tried to figure up the time I was wasting on that mop of mine. Then the great idea occurred to me. I got the scissors and in six snips had it off, a big tangled pile of brownish gold rather bleached out by the sun at the ends. And the moment I saw it there on my dresser and saw my head in the mirror, I was sorry. I looked like a plucked crow. I could have ditched a freight train. And I felt positively lightheaded. But it was too late for tears. I trimmed off the ragged edges as well as I could, and what didn't get in my eyes got down my neck and itched so terribly that I had to change my clothes. Then I got a nail punch at a Dinky Dunk's tool kit and heated it over the lamp and gave a little more wave to that two-inch shock of stubble. It didn't look so bad then. And when I tried on Dinky Dunk's coat in front of the glass, I saw that I wouldn't make such a bad-looking boy. But I waited until noon with my heart in my mouth to see what Dinky Dunk would say. What he really did say, I can't write here for there was a wicked swear word mixed up in his ejaculation of startled wonder. Then he saw the tears in my eyes, I suppose, for he came running toward me with his arms out and hugged me tight and said I looked cute, and all he'd have to do would be to get used to it. But all dinner time he kept looking at me as though I were a strange woman, and later I saw him standing in front of the dresser, stooping over that tragic pile of tangled yellow-brown snakes. It reminded me of a man stooping over a grave. I slipped away without letting him see me. But this morning I woke him up early and asked him if he still loved his wife. And when he vowed he did, I tried to make him tell me how much. But that stumped him. He compromised by saying he couldn't cheapen his love by defining it in words. It was limitless. I followed him out after breakfast with the hunger in my heart which bacon and eggs hadn't helped a bit and told him that if he really loved me, he could tell me how much. He looked right into my eyes, a little pityingly, it seemed to me, and laughed and grew solemn again. Then he stooped down and picked up a little blade of prairie grass and held it up in front of me. 
Have you any idea how far it is from the Rockies across to the Hudson Bay and from the line up to the Peace River Valley? Of course I hadn't. And have you any idea how many millions of acres of land that is? And how many millions of blades of grass like this there are in each acre? He somberly demanded. And again, of course I hadn't. Well, this one blade of grass is the amount of love I am able to express for you. And all those other blades in all those millions of acres is what love itself is. I thought it over, just as solemnly as he had said it. I think I was satisfied, for when my dinky dunk was away off in the prairie, working like a nailer, and I was alone in the shack, I went to his old coat hanging there, the old coat that had some subtle aroma of dinky dunkness itself about every inch of it, and kissed it on the sleeve. This afternoon, as Patty and I started for home with a pail of mushrooms, I rode face to face with my first coyote. We stood staring at each other. My heart bounced right up into my throat, and for a moment I wondered if I was going to be eaten by a starving timber wolf, with Dinky Dunk finding my bones picked as clean as those animal carcasses we see in the occasional buffalo hollow. I kept up my end of the stare, wondering whether to advance or retreat, and it wasn't until that coyote turned tail and scooted that my courage came back. Then Patty and I went after him, like the wind, but we had to give up and at supper, Dinky Dunk told me that coyotes were too cowardly to come near a person and were quite harmless. He said that even when they showed their teeth, the rest of their face was apologizing for the threat. And before supper was over, that coyote, at least I suppose it was the same coyote, was howling at the rising full moon. I went out with Dinky Dunk's gun, but I couldn't get near the brute. Then I came back. Sing, you son of a gun, sing, I called out after him from the shack door. And that shocked my lord and master so much that he scolded me for the first time in his life. And when I poked his Adam's apple with my finger, he got in his dignity. He was tired, poor boy, and I should have remembered it. And when I requested him not to stand there and stare at me in the heratic rigidity of an Egyptian idol, I could see a little flush of anger go over his face. He didn't say anything, but he took one of the lamps and a three-year-old Pall Mall magazine and shut himself up in the bunkhouse. Then I was sorry. I tiptoed over to the door and found it was locked. Then I went and got my mouth organ and sat meekly down on the doorstep and began to play the Don't Be Cross Waltz. I dragged it out plaintively with a vox humana tremolo on the coaxing little refrain. Finally, I heard a smothering snort, and the door suddenly opened, and Dinky Dunk picked me up, mouth organ and all. He shook me and said I was a little devil, and I called him a big British brute. But he was laughing, and a wee bit ashamed of his temper, and was very nice to me all the rest of the evening. I'm getting, I find, to depend a great deal on Dinky Dunk, and it makes me afraid, sometimes, for the future. He seems to be able to slip a hand under my heart and lift it up, exactly as though it were the chin of a wayward child. Yet I resent his power and keep elbowing for more breathing space, like a rush hour passenger in the subway crowd. Sometimes, too, I resent the over solemn streak in his mental makeup. He abominates ragtime, and I have rather a weakness for it. So once or twice in his dour days, I have found an almost satanic delight in singing the humming coon, and the knowledge that he'd like to forbid me from singing rag seems to give a zest to it. So I go about flashing my saber of independence. Ole Ephraim Johnson was a deacon of the church in Tennessee, and of course it was against the rules to sing ragtime melody. But I am the one, I notice who always makes up first. Tonight, I was making cocoa before we went to bed, and I tried to tell my didums that there was something positively dog-like in my devotion to him. He nickered like a pony and said that he was the dog in this deal. 
Then he pulled me over on his knee and said that men get short-tempered when they're tuckered out with worry and hard work, and that probably it would be hard for even two of the seraphim always to get along together in a two-by-four shack where you couldn't even have a deadline for the sake of dignity. It was mostly his fault, he knew, but he was going to try to fight against it. And I experienced the unreasonable joy of an unreasonable woman who has succeeded in putting the man she loves with all her heart and soul in the wrong. So I could afford to be humble myself and make a foolish lot of fuss over him. But I shall always fight for my elbow room. For there are times when my dinky dunk, for all his bigness and strength, has to be taken sedately in tow. The same as a racing automobile has to be hauled through the city streets by a dinky, little, low-powered hack car. Saturday the 10th. We've had a cold spell, with heavy frosts at night, but the days are still glorious. The overcast days are so few in the West that I've been wondering if the optimism of the Westerner isn't really due to the sunshine they get. Who could be gloomy under such golden skies? Every pore in my body has a throat, and it's shouting out a Tarantella sincera of its own. But it isn't the weather that has keyed me up this time. It's another wagon load of supplies which Oli teamed out of Buckhorn yesterday. I've got wallpaper and a new iron bed for the annex, and galvanized wash tubs, and a crock churn and storm boots, and enough ticking to make ten big pillows, and unbleached linen for two dozen slips. I love big pillows. And I've been saving up wild duck feathers for weeks. The downiest feathers you ever sank your ear into, Matilda Ann. And if pillows will do it, I'm going to make this house look like a harem. Can you imagine a household with only three pillow slips, which had to be jerked off in the morning, washed, dried, and ironed, and put back on their three lonely little pillows before bedtime? Well, there will be no more of that in this shack. But the important news is that I've got a duck gun, the duckiest duck gun you ever saw, and waders, and a coonskin coat and cap, and a big leather school bag for wearing over my shoulder on Patty. The coat and cap are like the ones we used to laugh at when we were up in Montreal for the tobogganing, in the days when I was young and foolish and willing to sacrifice comfort on the altar of outward appearances. The coonskins make me look like a Laplander. But they'll be mighty comfy when the cold weather comes, for Dinky Dunk says it drops to 40 and 50 below sometimes. I also got a lot of small stuff I'd written for from the mail order house. Little feminine things a woman simply has to have. But the big thing was the duck gun. I no longer get heart failure when I hear the whir of a prairie chicken, but drop my bird before it's out of range. Poor, plump, wounded, warm body little feathery things. Some of them keep on flying after they've been shot clean through the body, going straight on for a couple of hundred feet, even more, and then dropping like a stone. How hard hearted we soon get. It used to worry me. Now I gather them up as though they were so many chips and toss them into the wagon box or into my school bag if it's a private expedition of only Patty and me. And that's the way life treats us, too. I've been practicing on the gophers with my new gun and with Dinky Dunk's twenty-two rifle. A gopher is only a little bigger than a chipmunk and usually pokes nothing more than his head out of his hole. So when I got 13 out of 15 shots, I began to feel that I was a sharpshooter. But don't regard this as wanton cruelty, for the gopher is worse than a rat. And in this country, the government agents supply homesteaders with an annual allowance of free strychnine to poison them off. End of Section 8 Section 9 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Sunday the 11th. 
I've made my first butter, be it recorded. But in doing so, I managed to splash the ceiling and the walls and my own woolly head, for I didn't have sense enough to tie a wet cloth around the handle of the churner dasher until the damage had been done. I was too intent on getting my butter to pay attention to details, though it took a disheartening long time and my arms were tired out before I had finished. And when I saw myself splattered from head to foot, it reminded me of what you once said about me and my reading, that I had the habit of coming out of a book like a spaniel out of water, scattering ideas as I came. But there are not many new books in my life these days. It is mostly hard work, although I reminded Dinky Dunk last night that while Omar intimated that love and bread and wine were enough for any wilderness, we mustn't forget that he also included a book of verses under the bow. My Lord says that by next year we can line our walls with books. But I'm like Moses on Mount Nebo. I can see my promised land, but it seems a terribly long way off. But this, as Dinky Dunk would say, is not the spirit that built Rome and has carried me away from my butter, the making of which cold creamed my face until I looked as though I had snow on my headlight. Yet there is real joy in finding those lovely yellow granules in the bottom of your churn and then working it over and over with a saucer in a cooking bowl until it is one golden mass. Several times before, I'd shaken up sour cream in a sealer, but this was my first real butter making. I have just discovered, however, that I didn't wash it enough so that all the buttermilk wasn't worked out of my first dairy product. Dinky Dunk, like the scholar and gentleman that he is, swore that it was worth its weight in Klondike gold. And next time, I'll do better. Monday the 12th Golden weather again, with a clear sky and soft and balmy air. Just before our midday meal, Oli arrived with mail for us. We've had letters from home. Instead of cheering me up, they made me blue, for they seemed to bring word from another world, a world so far, far away. I have decided to have a half day in the open, so I strapped on my duck gun and I went off on Patty as soon as dinner was over and the men had gone. We went like the wind until both Patty and I were tired of it. Then I found a soft water pond hidden behind a fringe of scrub willow and poplar. The midday sun had warmed it to a tempting temperature. So I hobbled Patty, peeled off, and had a most glorious bath. I had just soaked down with the bank mud, which is an astonishingly good solvent, and had taken a header and was swimming about on my back, blinking up at the blue sky as happy as a mud turtle in a mill pond, when I heard Patty nicker. That disturbed me a little, but I felt sure that there could be nobody within miles of me. However, I swam back to where my clothes were, sunned myself dry, and was just standing up to shake out the ends of this short cropped hair of mine when I saw a man's head across the pond, staring through the bushes at me. I don't know how or why it is, but I suddenly saw red. I don't remember picking up the duck gun and I don't remember aiming it. But I banged away with both barrels, straight at that leering head, or at least it ought to have been a leering head, whatever that may mean. The howl that went up and out of the wilderness in the next moment could have been heard for a mile. It was Dinky Dunk, and he said I might have put his eye out with birdshot if he hadn't made the quickest drop of his life. And he also said that he'd seen me, a distinct splash of white against the green of the prairie, three good miles away, and wasn't I ashamed of myself, and what would I have done if he had been Oli or Old Man Dixon? But he kissed my shoulder where the gunstock had bruised it and helped me dress. Then we rode off together, four or five miles north, where Dinky Dunk was sure we could get a bag of duck, which we did, thirteen altogether, and started for home as the sun got low and the evening air grew chilly. It was a heavenly ride. 
In the west, a little army of thin blue clouds was edged with blazing gold, and up between them spread great fan-like shafts of amber light. Then came a riot of orange-yellow and ashes of roses and the palest of gold with little islands of azure in it. Then, while the dying radiance seemed to hold everything in a luminous wash of air, the stars came out, one by one, and a soft, cool wind spread across the prairie, and the light darkened, and I was glad to have Dinky Dunk there at my side, or I should have had a little cry, for the twilight prairie always makes me lonesome in a way that could never be put into words. I tried to explain the feeling to Dinky Dunk, and he said he understood. I'm a sourdough, Gigi, but it still gets me that way, he solemnly confessed. He said that when he listened to beautiful music, he felt the same. And that got me thinking of Grand Opera and that Romeo and Juliet night at La Scala in Milan when I'd first met Theobald Gustav. Then I stopped to tell Dinky Dunk that I'd been hopelessly in love with the tenor at thirteen and had written in my journal, I shall die and turn to dust, still adoring him. Then I told him about my first opera, Rigoletto, and hummed La Donna Immobile, which of course he remembered himself. It took me back to Florence and to a box at the Pigliano, and me, all in dimity and corkscrew curls, weeping deliciously at a lady in white, whose troubles I could not quite understand. Then I got to thinking of New York and the Metropolitan and poor old Morris's lines. And still with listening soul I hear, strains hushed for many a noisy year, the passionate chords which wake the tear, the low-voiced love tales dear. Scarce changed, the same musicians play. The self-same themes today, the silvery swift sonatas ring, the soaring voices sing. And I could picture the old Metropolitan on a Caruso night. I could see the golden horseshoe and the geranium red trimmings and the satiny white backs of the women and smell that luxurious heavy smell of warm air and hothouse flowers and Paris perfumery and happy human bodies, and hear the whisper of silk along the crimson stairways. I could see the lights go down in a sort of sigh before the overture began, and the scared-looking blotches of white on the musicians' scores, and the other blotches made by their dress shirt fronts, and the violins going up and down, up and down, as though they were one piece of machinery and then the heavy curtain stealing up, and the thrill as that new heaven opened up to me, a gawky girl in her first low-cut dinner gown. I told Dinky Dunk that I'd sat in every corner of that old house, up in the sky parlor with the Italian barbers, in the press seats in the second gallery with dear old Fanny Rain in the face, and in the Westbury's box with the first lady of the land and a Spanish princess with extremely dirty nails. It seemed so far away, another life, and another world. And for three hours of Manon, I'd be willing to hang like a chimpanzee from the Metropolitan's center chandelier. I suddenly realized how much I missed it, and I could have sung to the city as poor Charpenter's Louise sang to her Paris and a coyote howled up near the trail, and the prairie got dark, with the pale green rind of light along the northwest, and I knew there would be a heavy frost before morning. Tonight, after supper, my soul and I sat down and did a bit of bookkeeping. Dinky Dunk, who'd been watching me out of the corner of his eye, went to the window and said that it looked like a storm and I knew he meant that I was the medicine hat it was to come from. For before he got up from the table, he'd explained to me that matrimony was like motoring, because it was really traveling by a means of a series of explosions. 
Then he tried to explain that in a few weeks the fall rush would be over and we'd have more time for getting what we deserved out of life. But I turned on him with a sudden fierceness and declared that I wasn't going to be merely an animal. I intended to keep my soul alive. That it was everyone's duty, no matter where they were, to ennoble their spirit by keeping in touch with the best that has ever been felt and thought. I grimly got out my mouth organ and played the Pilgrim's Chorus, as well as I could remember it. Dinky Dunk sat listening in silent wonder. He kept up the fire and waited until I got through. Then he reached for the dishpan and said, quite casually, I'm going to help you wash up tonight, Gigi. And so I put away the mouth organ and washed up. But before I went to bed, I got out my little vellum edition of Browning's The Ring and the Book and read at it industriously, doggedly, determinedly, for a solid hour. What it's all about, I don't know. Instead of ennobling my spirit, it only tired my brain and ended up making me so mad I flung the book into the wooden box. Dinky Dunk has just pinned a piece of paper on my door. It is a sentence from Epictetus, and it says, Better it is that great souls should live in small habitations than that abject slaves should burrow in great houses. Sunday the 18th I spent an hour today trying to shoot a hen hawk that's been hovering around the shack all afternoon. He's after my chickens. And as new laid eggs are worth more than browning to a homesteader, I got out my duck gun. It gave me a feeling of impending evil having that huge bird hanging about. It reminded me there was wrong and rapine in the world. I hated that brute. But I hid under one of the wagon boxes and got him in the end. I brought him down a tumbling fury of wings like Satan falling from heaven. When I ran out to possess myself of his satanic body, he was only wounded, however, and was ready to show fight. Then I saw Red again. I clubbed him with the gun butt, going at him like fury. I was moist with perspiration when I got through with him. He was a monster. I nailed him with his wings out on the bunkhouse wall, and Oli shouted and called Dinky Dunk when they came back from rounding up the horses, which had gotten away on the range. Dinky Dunk solemnly warned me not to take risks, as he might have taken an eye out or torn my face with his claws. He said he could have stuffed and mounted my hawk if I hadn't clubbed the poor thing almost to pieces. There's a devil in me somewhere, I told Dinky Dunk, but he only laughed. Monday the 19th. Tonight, Dinky Dunk and I spent a solid hour trying to decide on a name for the shack. I wanted to call it Krunknakula, which is Gaelic for a little hill of sleep. But Dinky Dunk brought forward the objection that there was no hill. Then I suggested Barnavista, since about all we can see from the door are the stables. Then I said the Biltmore, in a spirit of mockery. And then Dinky Dunk, in a spirit of irony, suggested Casa Grande. And in the end, we united on Casa Grande. It is marvelous how my hair grows. Oli now watches me studiously as I eat. I can see that he's patiently patterning his table deployment after mine. There's nothing that silent, rough-mannered man wouldn't do for me. I've gotten so I never notice his nose, any more than I used to notice Uncle Carlton's receding chin. But I don't think Oli's getting enough to eat. All his mind seems taken up with trying to remember not to drink out of his saucer, as history saith George Washington himself once did. End of Section 9Section 10 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Puri Tuesday, the 20th
I knew that old hen hawk meant trouble for me. And the trouble came, all right. I'm afraid I can't tell about it very coherently, but this is how it began. I was alone yesterday afternoon, busy in the shack, when a mounted policeman rode up to the door and for a moment nearly frightened the life out of me. I just stood and stared at him, for he was the first really, truly live man outside of Oli and my husband I'd seen for so long. And he looked very dashing in his scarlet jacket and yellow facings, but I didn't have long to meditate on his color scheme, for he calmly announced that a ranchman named McMain had been murdered by a drunken cowboy in a wage dispute, and the murderer had been seen heading for the Cochrane Ranch. He, the MP, inquired if I would object to him searching the buildings. Would I object? I most assuredly did not, for little chills began to play up and down my spinal column and I wasn't exactly in love with the idea of having an escaped murderer crawling out of a haystack at midnight to cut my throat. The ranchman, McMain, had been killed on Saturday, and the cowboy had been kept on the run for two days. As I was being told this, I tried to remember where Dinky Dunk had stowed away his revolver holster and his hammerless ejector and his Colt repeater but I made that handsome young man in the scarlet coat come right into the shack and begin his search by looking under the bed and then going down the cellar. I stood holding the trap door and warned him not to break my pickle jars. Then he came up and stood squinting thoughtfully out through the doorway. Have you got a gun? He suddenly asked me. I showed him my duck gun with its silver mountings and he smiled a little. Haven't you got a rifle? he demanded. I explained that my husband had, and he still stood squinting out through the doorway as I poked around the shack corners and found Dinky Dunk's repeater. He was a very authoritative and self-assured young man. He took the rifle from me, examined the magazine, and made sure it was loaded. Then he handed it back. I've got to search those buildings and shacks, he told me, and I can only be in one place at once. If you see a man break from undercover anywhere when I'm inside, be so good as to shoot him. He started off without another word with his big army revolver in his hand. My teeth began to do a little foxtrot all by themselves. Wait, stop, I shouted after him. Don't go away. He stopped and asked me what was wrong. I, I don't want to shoot a man. I don't want to shoot any man. I tried to explain to him. You probably won't have to, was his cool response. But it's better to do that than have him shoot you, isn't it? Whereupon Mr. Redcoat made straight for the haystacks, and I stood in the doorway with Dinky Dunk's rifle in my hands and my knees shaking a little. I watched him as he beat about the haystacks. Then I got tired of holding the heavy weapon and leaned it against the shack wall. I watched the red coat go in through the stable door and felt vaguely dismayed at the thought that its wearer was now quite out of sight. Then my heart stopped beating, for out of a pile of straw, which Oli had dumped not a hundred feet away from the house to line a pit for our winter vegetables, a man suddenly erupted. He seemed to come up out of the very earth like a mushroom. He was the most repulsive-looking man I ever had the pleasure of casting eyes on. His clothes were ragged and torn and stained with mud. His face was covered with stubble, and his cheeks were hollow, and his skin was just about the color of a new saddle. I could see the whites of his eyes as he ran for the shack, looking over his shoulder toward the stable door as he came. He had a revolver in his hand. I noticed that but it didn't seem to trouble me much. I suppose I'd already been frightened as much as mortal flesh could be frightened. In fact, I was thinking quite clearly what to do and didn't hesitate for a moment. Put that silly thing down, I told him, as he ran up to me with his head lowered and that indescribably desperate look in his big, frightened eyes. If you're not a fool, I can get you hidden, I told him. 
It reassured me to see that his knees were shaking much more than mine as he stood there in the center of the shack. I stooped over the trap door and lifted it up. Get down there quick. He searched the cellar and won't go through it again. Stay there until I say he's gone. He slipped over to the trap door and went slowly down the steps, with his eyes narrowed and his revolver held up in front of him, as though he still half expected to find someone there to confront him with a blunderbuss. Then I promptly shut the trap door, but there was no way of locking it. I had my murderer there, trapped, but the question was to keep him there. Your little chatty didn't give up many precious moments to reverie. I tiptoed into the bedroom and lifted the mattress, bedding and all, off the bedstead. I tugged it out and put it silently down over the trap door. Then, without making a sound, I turned the table over on it. But he could still lift that table, I knew, even with me standing on top of it. So I started to pile things on the overturned table, until it looked like a moving van, ready for a May Day migration. Then I sat on top of that pile of household goods, reached for Dinky Dunk's repeater, and deliberately fired a shot up through the open door. I sat there, studying my pile, feeling sure a revolver bullet couldn't possibly come up through all of that stuff. But before I had much time to think about this, my corporal of the RNWMP, which means, Matilda Ann, the Royal Northwest Mounted Police, came through the door on the run. He looked relieved when he saw me triumphantly astride that overturned table loaded up with all of my household junk. I've got him for you, I calmly announced. You've got what? He said, apparently thinking I'd gone mad. I've got your man for you, I repeated. He's down there in my cellar. And in one minute, I'd explained just what had happened. There was no parley, no deliberation, no hesitation. Hadn't you better go outside, he suggested as he started piling things off the trap door. You're not going down there, I demanded. Why not, he asked. But he's got a revolver, I cried out, and he's sure to shoot. That's why I think it might be better for you to step outside for a moment or two, was my soldier boy's casual answer. I walked over and got Dinky Dunk's repeater. Then I crossed to the far side of the shack with the rifle in my hands. I'm going to stay, I announced. All right, was the officer's unconcerned answer as he tossed the mattress to one side and with one quick pull, threw up the trap door. A shot rang out from below as the door swung back against the wall. But it was not repeated, for the man in the red coat jumped bodily, heels first, into that black hole. He didn't seem to count on the risk, or what might be ahead of him. He just jumped spurs down on that other man with the revolver in his hand. I could hear little grunts and wheezes and a thud or two against the cellar steps. Then there was silence except for one double click-click, which I couldn't understand. Oh, Matilda Ann, how I watched that cellar opening, and I saw a back with a red coat on it slowly rise out of the hole. He, the man who owned the back, of course, was dragging the other man bodily up the narrow little stairs. There was a pair of handcuffs already on his wrists, and he seemed dazed and helpless, for that slim-looking soldier boy had pummeled him unmercifully, knocking out his two front teeth, one of which I found on the doorstep when I was sweeping up. I'm sorry, but I'll have to take one of your horses for a day or two, was all my RNWMP hero condescended to say to me as he poked an arm through his prisoners and helped him out through the door. What, what will they do with him? I called out after the corporal. Hang him, of course, was the curt answer. Then I sat down to think things over, and like an old maid with the vapors, decided that I wouldn't be any the worse for a cup of good strong tea. And by the time I'd had my tea and straightened things up, and incidentally discovered that no less than five of my cans of mushrooms had been broken to bits below stairs. 
I heard the rumble of the wagon and knew that Oli and Dinky Dunk were back, and I drew in a long breath of relief. For with all their drawbacks, men are not a bad thing to have about now and then. End of section 10. Section 11 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Thursday, the 22nd. It was early Tuesday morning that Dinky Dunk firmly announced that he and I were going off on a three day shooting trip. I hadn't slept well the night before, for my nerves were still rather upset, and Dinky Dunk said I needed a picnic. So we got guns and cartridges and blankets and slickers and cooking things and stowed them away in the wagon box. Then we made a list of provisions we'd need, and while Dinky Dunk bagged up some oats for the team, I was busy packing the grub box. And I packed it cram full. And took along the old tin bread box as well, with pancake flour and dried fruit and an extra piece of bacon. And bacon, it is now called in this shack for I have positively forbidden Dinky Dunk to ever speak of it as sow belly or even as a slice of grunt again. Then we started off across the prairie, after duly instructing Oli as to feeding the chickens and taking care of the cream and finishing up the pit for the winter vegetables. Still, once again, Oli thought we were both a little mad, I believe, for we had no more idea where we were going than the man in the moon but there was something glorious in the thought of gypsying across the autumn prairie like that, without a thought or worry as to where we must stop or what trail we must take. It made every day's movement a great adventure, and the weather was divine. We slept at night under the wagon box, with a tarpaulin along one side to keep out the wind and a fire flickering in our faces on the other side, and the horses tethered out, and the stars wheeling overhead, and the peace of God in our hearts. How good every meal tasted, and how that keen, sharp air made snuggling down under a couple of Hudson Bay five-point blankets a luxury to be spoken of only in the most reverent of whispers. And there was a time, as you already know, when I used to take bromide, and sometimes even sulfonal, to make me sleep. But here it is so different. To get leg-weary in the open air, tramping about the sagey slough sides after a mallard and a canvas back, to smell coffee and bacon and frying grouse in the cool of the evening, across a thin veil of campfire smoke, to see the tired world turn over on its shoulder and go to sleep. It's all a sort of monumental lullaby. The prairie wind seems to seek you out and make a bet with the Great Dipper that he'll have you off in forty winks, and the orchestra of the spheres whispers through its million strings and sings your soul to rest. For I tell you, here and now, Matilda Ann, I, poor, puny, good-for-nothing, insignificant I, have heard that music of the spheres as clearly as you ever heard Funiculi Funicula on that little Naples steamer that used to take you to Capri. And when I'd crawl out from under that old wagon box like a gopher out of his hole, in the first delicate rosiness of dawn, I'd feel unutterably grateful to be alive, to hear the cantatas of health singing deep in my soul, to know that whatever life may do to me, I'd snatched my share of happiness from the pantry of the gods. And the endless change of color, from the tawny foxglove on the lighter land, the pale yellow of a lion's skin in the slanting autumn sun, to the quavering, shimmering glories of the northern lights that dance in the north, that fling out their banners of ruby and gold and green, and tremble and merge and pulse until I feel that I can hear the clash of invisible symbols. I wonder if you can understand my feeling when I pulled that hat pin out of my old gray Stetson yesterday, uncovered my head, and looked straight up into the blue firmament above me. 
Then I said, thank you, God, for such a beautiful day. Dinky Dunk promptly said that I was blasphemous. He's so strict and solemn. But I stared up into the depths of that intense opaline light, so clear, so pure. I realized how air, just air and nothing else, could leave a scatterbrained lady like me half seas over. Only it's a champagne that never leaves you with a headache the next day. End of section 11. Section 12 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Saturday, the 24th. Dinky Dunk, who seems intent on keeping my mind occupied, brought me home a bundle of old magazines last night. They were so frayed and thumbed over that some of the pages reminded me of well-worn banknotes. I've been reading some of the stories, and they all seem silly. Everyone appears to be in love with someone else's wife. Then the people are all divided so strictly into two classes, the good and the bad. As for the other man's wife, prairie life would soon knock that nonsense out of people. There isn't much room for the triangle in a two-by-four shack. Life is so normal and natural and big out here that a Pierre Lotte would be kicked into a sheep dip before he could use up his first box of face rouge. You want your wife, and you want her so bad you're satisfied. Not that Dinky Dunk and I are so goody-goody. We're just healthy and human, that's all, and we'd never do it for fiction. After meals, we push away the dishes and sit side by side with our arms across each other's shoulders, full of the joy of life, satisfied, happy, healthy-minded, now and then a little rebellionism in our talk, meandering innocent-eyed through those earthier intimacies which most married people seem to face without shame, so long as the facing is done in secret. We don't seem ashamed of that terribly human streak in us, and neither of us is bad at heart. But I know we're not like those magazine characters, who all seem to have Florida water instead of red blood in their veins, and are so far, far away from life. Yet even that dip into politely erotic fiction seemed to canalize my poor little grass-grown mind into activity, and Didums and I sat up until the wee small hours discoursing on life and letters. He started me off by somewhat pensively remarking that all women seemed to want to be intellectual and have a salon. No, Dinky Dunk, I don't want a salon, I promptly announced. I never did want one for I don't believe they were as exciting as we imagine. And I hate literary people almost as much as I hate actors. I always felt like they were stage scenery, not made for close inspection. For after five winters in New York and a couple in London, you can't help bumping into the bohemian type, not to mention an occasional collision with them up and down the continent. When they're female, they always seem to be wearing the wrong kind of corsets. And when they're male, they watch themselves in the mirrors or talk so much about themselves that you haven't a chance to talk about yourself. Which is really the completest definition of a bore, isn't it? I'd much rather know them through their books than through those awful Sunday evening soirees where poor old Leonine M. used to perspire reading those socialist poems of his to the adoring ladies. And Sanctuary John used to wear the same flannel shirt that shielded him from the polar blasts up in Alaska, open at the throat, and all that sort of thing, just like a movie actor cowboy. Only John had grown a little stout, and he kept spoiling the strongman picture by so everlastingly posing at one end of the grand piano. You know the way they do it. One pensive elbow on the piano end, and the delicately drooping palm holding up the wary brains the same as you prop up a king orange bough when it gets too heavy with fruit. And then he had a lovely bang and a voice like a maiden lady from Maine. And take it from me, O oh Lord and Master, that man devoured all his raw beef and blood on his typewriter ribbon. I dubbed him the king of the eye socket school. And instead of getting angry, he actually thanked me for it. 
That was the sort of advertising he was after. Dinky Dunk grinned a little as I rattled on. Then he grew serious again. Why is it, he asked, a writer in Westminster Abbey is always a genius, but a writer in the next room is rather a joke. I tried to explain it for him. Because writers are like Indians. The only good ones are the dead ones. And it's the same with those siren affinities of history. Annie Laurie lived to be 80, though the ballad doesn't say so. And Lady Hamilton died poor and ugly and went around with red herrings in her pocket. And Cleopatra was really a red-headed old political schemer. And Paris got tired of Helen of Troy, which means that history, like literature, is only les mensonges convenus. This made Dinky Dunk sit up and stare at me. Look here, Gigi. I don't mind a bit of book learning, but I hate to see you tear the whole tree of knowledge up by the roots and knock me down with it. And it was salons we were talking about, not the wicked ladies of the past. Well, the only salon I ever saw in America had the commercial air of a millinery opening where tea happened to be served, I promptly declared. And the only American woman I ever knew who wanted to have a salon was a girl we used to call a safe tita Anne. And if I explained why, you'd make a much worse face than that, my didums. But she had a weakness for black furs and never used to wash her neck. So the pimpleton mark was always there. Don't get bitter, Gigi, announced Dinky Dunk as he proceeded to light his pipe. And I could afford to laugh at his solemnity. I'm not bitter, honey chili. I'm only glad I got away from all that bohemian rubbish. You may call me a rattlebox and accuse me of being temperamental now and then, which I'm not, but the one thing in life which I love is sanity. And that, Dinky Dunk, is why I love you, even though you're only a big sunburnt farmer fighting and planting and grinding away for a home for an empty-headed wife who's going to fail at everything but making you love her. Then followed a few moments when I wasn't able to talk. The sequel scarce essential. Nay, more than this, I hold it still profoundly confidential. Then as we sat there side by side, I got to thinking of the past and of the bohemians before whom I had once burned incense and remembered a certain visit to Box Hill with Lady Agatha's mother years and years ago. I had to revise my verdict on authors, for one of the warmest memories in all my life is of that dear old Meredith in his wheelchair, with his bearded face still flooded with all its kindly inner light and his spirit still mellow with its unquenchable love of life. And once, as a child, I went on to tell Dinky Dunk, I had met Stevenson. It was at Mentone, and I can still remember him leaning over and taking my hand. His own hand was cold and lean, like a claw. And with the quick instinct of childhood, I realized, too, that he was condescending as he spoke to me, for all the laugh that showed in his white teeth under his drooping black mustache. Wrong as it seemed, I didn't like him any more than I afterward liked the sergeant portrait of him, which was really an echo of my own first impression. Though often and often I've tried to blot out the first unfair estimate of a real man of genius. There is so much in the child garden verse that I love. There's so much in the man's life that demands admiration, that it seems wrong not to capitulate to his charm. But when one's own family or one's own biographers, it's hard to be kept human. Yet there is one thing, Dinky Dunk, that I do respect him for. I went on. He had seen the loveliest parts of this world, and, when he had to, he could lightheartedly give it all up and rough it in this American West of ours, even as you and I. Whereupon Dinky Dunk argued that we ought to forgive an invalid of his stradigious preaching about bravery and manliness and his overemphasis of fortitude, since it was plainly based on an effort to react against a constitutional weakness for which he himself couldn't be blamed. And I confess that I could forgive him more easily than I could Sanguary John with his literary diabolism and that ostentatious Stone Age blugness with which he loved to give the ladies goose flesh 
pretending he was a bull in a china shop, when he's really only a white mouse in an ink pot. And after Dinky Dunk had knocked out his pipe and wound up his watch, he looked over at me with his slow Scotch-Canadian smile. For a couple of hayseeds who have been harpooning the salon idea, he solemnly announced, I call this quite a literary evening. But what's the use in having an idea or two in your head if you can't air them now and then? Tuesday, the 27th. Today, I stumbled on the surprise of my life. It was a man. I took Patty and cantered over to the old Tichborn ranch and was prowling around the corral, hoping I might find a few belated mushrooms, but nary a one was there. So I whistled on my four fingers for Patty. I've been teaching him to come at that call. And happened to glance in the direction of the abandoned shack. Then I saw the door open, and out walked a man. He was a young man, in putties and knickers and Norfolk jacket. And he was smoking a cigarette. He stared at me as though I were the missing link. Then he said, hello, rather inadequately, it seemed to me. I answered back, hello, and wondered whether to take to my heels or not. But my courage got its second wind, and I stayed. Then we shook hands, very formally, and explained who we were, and I discovered that his name was Percival Benson Woodhouse, and the Lord forgive me if they ever call him Piercy for short, and that his aunt is the Countess of D, and that he knows a number of people you and Lady Agatha have often spoken of. He's got a Japanese servant called Kino, or perhaps it's spelt Kino, I don't know which, whose housekeeper, laundress, valet, gardener, groom, and chef, all in one, so at least Percival Benson confessed to me. He also confessed that he'd bought the Tichborne Ranch from photographs, from one of those land chops in London. He wanted to rough it a bit, and they told him there would be jolly good game shooting, so he even brought along an elephant gun, which his cousin had used in India. The photographs which the land chops had shown him turned out to be pictures of the Silkirks. And taking it all in, he fancied that he'd been jolly well bunked, but Percival seemed to accept it with the stoicism of the well-born Britisher. He'd have a try at the place, although there was no game. But there is game, I told him, slathers of it oodles of it. He mildly inquired, where and what? I told him, wild duck, prairie chicken, wild geese, jackrabbits, now and then a fox, and loads of coyotes. He explained then that he meant big game, and how grandly those two words, big game, do roll off the English tongue. He has a sister in the Bahamas who may join him next summer if he should decide to stick it out. He considered that it would be a bit rough for a girl during the winter season up here. Yet before I go any further, I must describe Percival Benson Woodhouse to you, for he is not only our sort, but a type as well. In the first place, he's a Magdalen collegeman, the sort we've seen going up the high many, many a time. He's rather gaunt and rather tall, and he stoops a little. At home, they call it the Oxford Stoop, if I'm not greatly mistaken. His hands are thin and long and bony. His eyes are nice, and he looks very good form. I mean, he's the sort of man you'd never take for the outsider or rotter. He's the sort who seemed to have the royal privilege of doing even doubtfully polite things, and yet doing them in such a way as to make them seem quite proper. I don't know whether I'm making that clear or not, but one thing is clear, and that is that our Percival Benson is an aristocrat. You see it in his oversensitive, over-refined, almost womanishly delicate face with those idolizing and quite unpractical eyes of his. You see it in the thin, high-arched, bony nose, almost as fine a beak as the one that belonged to his grace, the Duke of M., and you see it in the sad and somewhat elongated face, as though he had pored over big books too much, 
and a sort of air of pathos and aloofness from things. His mouth strikes you as being rather meager until he smiles, which is quite often, for glory be, he has a good sense of humor. And besides that, he has a neatness, a coolness, an impersonal sort of ease, which would make you think that he might have stepped out of one of Henry James's earlier novels, of about the time of The Portrait of a Lady. And I like him. I knew that at once. He's effete and old-worldish, and probably useless, out here. But he stands for something I've been missing— and I'll be greatly mistaken if Percival Benson and Chatty McHale are not pretty good friends before the winter's over. He's asked me if he might be permitted to call, and he's coming for dinner tomorrow night. And I do hope Dinky Dunk is nice to him, if we're to be neighbors. But Dinky Dunk says Westerners don't ask to be permitted to call. They just stick their cayuse into the corral and walk in, the same as an Indian does. And Dinky Dunk says that if he comes in evening dress, he'll shoot him. Sure pop. End of section 12. Section 13 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Paree. Thursday, the 29th. Piercy, how I hate that name, was here for dinner last night. And all things considered, we didn't fare so badly. We had tomato bisque and scallop potatoes and prairie chicken. They need to be well basted. And hot biscuits and stewed dried peaches with cream. Then we had coffee and the men smoked their pipes. We talked until a quarter to one in the morning and my poor dinky dunk, who had been working so hard and seeing nobody, really enjoyed that visit and really likes Percival Benson. Piercy got talking about Oxford, and you could see that he loved the old town and that he felt more at home on the Isis than on the prairie. He said he once heard Freeman tell a story about Goodwin Smith, who used to be a Regis professor of history at the university G.S., seemed astonished that F. couldn't tell him, at some viva voce exam, whatever that may mean, the cause of King John's death. Then G.S. explained that poor John died of too much peaches and fresh ale, which would give a man a considerable bellyache, the Regis Professor of History solemnly announced to Friedman. Piercy said his lungs rather troubled him in England and he spent over a year in Florence and Rome and can talk pictures like a Grant Allen guidebook, and he sat through many an opera at La Sica, but considered the Canadian coyote a much better vocalist than most of the minor Italian tenors. And he knows Capri and Tormina and says he'd like to grow old and die in Sicily. He got pneumonia at Messina, and nearly died young there, and after five months in Switzerland, a specialist told him to try Canada. I've noticed that one of the delusions of Americans is that an Englishman is silent. Now, my personal conviction is that Englishmen are the greatest talkers in the world, and I have Piercy to back me up in it. In fact, we sat talking so long that Piercy asked if he couldn't stay all night, as he was a poor writer and wasn't sure of the trails as yet. So we made a shakedown for him in the living room, and when Dinky Dunk came back to bed, he confided to me that Piercy was calmly reading and smoking himself to sleep out of my sadly scorned copy of The Ring and the Book, with the lamp on the floor on one side of him and a saucer on the other for an ashtray. But he was up and out this morning before either of us was stirring, Coming back to Casa Grande, however, when he saw the smoke at the chimney top. His thin cheeks were quite pink, and he apologetically explained that he'd been trying for an hour and a half to catch his cayuse. Oli had to come to his rescue. But our thin shouldered Oxford exile said that he'd never seen such a glorious sunrise and that the ozone had made him a bit tipsy. Speaking of thin shouldered specimens, Matilda Ann, I was once a 36. Now I am a perfect 42.
Friday the 5th. The weather has been bad all this week, but I've had a great deal of sewing to do, and for two days Dinky Dunk stayed in and helped me fix up the shack. I made more bookshelves out of more old biscuit boxes, and my lord made a gun rack for our firearms. Percival Benson rode over once, through the storm, and it took us half an hour to thaw him out. But he brought some books and says he has four cases altogether and that we're welcome to all we wish. He stayed until noon the next day, this time sleeping in the annex, which Dinky Dunk and I have papered so that it looks quite presentable. But as of yet, there's no way of heating it. Our new neighbor, I imagine, is very lonesome. Sunday the 7th. The weather has cleared. There's a Chinook arch in the sky and a sort of St. Martin's summer haze on all of the prairie. But there's news today. Kino, our new neighbor's Jap, has decamped with a good deal of money and about all of Percival Benson's valuables. The poor boy is almost helpless, but he's not a quitter. He said he's chopped his first kindling today, though he had to stand in a wash tub while he did it to keep from cutting his feet. Dinky Dunk's birthday is only three weeks off, and I'm planning for a celebration. Tuesday the 9th. The days slip by and scarcely leave me time to write. Dinky Dunk is a sort of pendulum swinging out to work, back to eat, then out, then back again. Oli is teaming in lumber and galvanized iron for a new building of sorts. My lord, in the evenings, sits with paper and pencil, figuring out measurements and making plans. I sit on the other side of the table, as a rule, sewing. Sometimes I go around to his side of the table and make him put his plans away for a few minutes. We are very happy. But where the days fly to, I scarcely know. We're always looking toward the future, talking about the future, conceding about the future, as the Irish say. Next summer is to be our banner year. Dinky Dunk is going to risk everything on wheat. He's like a general plotting out a future plan of campaign. For when the work comes, he says, it will come in a rush. Help will be hard to get, so he'll sell his British Columbia timber rights and buy a 40-horsepower gasoline tractor. He will at least if gasoline gets cheaper, for with gas still at 26 cents a gallon, horsepower is cheapest. But during the braking season, in April and May, one of these engines can haul eight gang plows behind it. In 24 hours, it will be able to turn over 35 acres of prairie soil, and the ordinary man and team counts two acres of plowing to a decent day's work. Tonight I asked Dinky Dunk why he risked everything on wheat and warned him that we might have to revise the old Kansas Trekkers slogan to In wheat we trusted, in wheat we busted. Dinky Dunk explained that to keep on raising only wheat would be bad for the land and even now meant taking a chance. But situated as he was, it brought the quickest money and he wanted money in a hurry, for he had a nest to feather for a lady wild bird that he'd captured, which meant me. Later on, he intends to go in for flax, for fiber, not for seed. And as our land should produce two tons of the finest flax straw to the acre, and as the Belgian and Irish product is now worth over $400 a ton, he told me to sit down and figure out what 400 acres would produce, with even a two-thirds crop. The Canadian farmer of the West, he went on to explain, mostly grew flax for the seed alone, burning up over a million tons of straw every year, just to get it out of the way. The same as he does with his wheat straw. But all that will soon be changed. Only last week, Dinky Dunk wrote to the Department of Agriculture for information about courtier fiber. That's the kind used for point lace and is worth a dollar a pound for my lord feels convinced his soil and climatic conditions are especially suited for certain of the finer varieties. He even admitted that flax would be better on his land at the present time, as it would release certain of the natural fertilizers which sometimes leave the virgin soil too rich for wheat. 
But what most impressed me about Dinky Dunk's talk was his absolute and unshaken faith in this West of ours, once it wakes up to its opportunities. It's a stored-up granary of wealth, he declares, and all we've done so far is to nibble along the leaks in the floor cracks. Saturday the 21st. Today is Dinky Dunk's birthday. He's always thought, of course, that I'm a pauper and never dreamed of my poor little residuary nest egg. I ordered a box of Okanagan Valley apples and a gramophone and a dozen opera records and a briarwood pipe and two pounds of English honeydew and a smoking jacket and some new ties and socks and shirts and a brand new Stetson for Dinky Dunk's old hat is almost a rag bag and I ordered a half a dozen of the newer novels and a set of Herbert Spencer, which I heard him say he wanted, and a sepia print of the Mona Lisa, which my lord says I look like when I'm planning trouble, and a felt mattress and a set of bed springs. So goodbye, old swayback friend, whose humps have bruised me in body and spirit this many a night, and a dozen big oranges and three dozen little candles for the birthday cake, and then I was cleaned out, every blessed scent gone. But Piercy, we have, you see, been unable to escape that name, ordered a box of cigars and a pair of quilted house slippers, so it was a pretty formidable array. I, accordingly, had Oli secretly team this array all the way from Buckhorn to Piercy's house, where it was duly ambushed and entrenched to await the fatal day. As luck would have it, or seemed to have it, Dinky Dunk had to hit the trail for overnight to see about the registration of his transfers for his new half-section at the town of H. So as soon as Dinky Dunk was out of sight, I hurried through my work and had Tumbleweed and Bronk headed for the old Tichborne Ranch. There I arrived about mid-afternoon. And what a time we had, getting those things unpacked and looking them over and planning and talking— but the whole thing was spoiled. We forgot to tie the horses, so while we were having tea, Bronk and Tumbleweed hit the trail on their own hook. They made for home, harness and all, but of course I never knew this at the time. We looked and looked, came back for supper, then started out again. We searched until it got dark. My feet were like lead. I couldn't have walked another mile. I was so stiff and tired I simply had to give up. Piercy worried, of course, for we had no way of sending word to Dinky Dunk. Then we sat down and talked over possibilities, like a couple of castaways on a Robinson Crusoe island. Piercy offered to bunk in the stable and let me have the shack, but I wouldn't hear of that. In the first place, I felt pretty sure Piercy was what they call a lunger out here and I didn't relish the idea of sleeping in a tuberculosis bed. I asked for a blanket and told him that I was going to sleep out under the wagon, as I have often done with Dinky Dunk. Piercy finally consented, but this worried him too. He even brought out his big game gun so I'd have protection, and felt the grass to see if it was damp, and declared he couldn't sleep on a mattress when he knew I was out on the hard ground. I told him that I loved it and to go to bed, for I wanted to get out of some of my armor plate. He went, reluctantly. It was a beautiful night, and not so cold, with scarcely a breath of wind stirring. I lay looking out through the wheel spokes at the Milky Way, and was just dropping off when Piercy came out still again. He was in a quilted dressing gown and had a blanket over his shoulders, it made him look for all the world like Father Time. He wanted to know if I was all right and had brought me out a pillow, which I didn't use. Then he sat down on the prairie floor, near the wagon, and smoked and talked. He pointed out some of the constellations to me and said the only time he'd ever seen stars bigger was one still night in the Indian Ocean when he was on his way back from Singapore. He would never forget that night, he said. The stars were so wonderful, so big, so close, so soft and luminous. But the northern lights were different. They were without the orange tone that belongs to the south. They seemed remoter and more awe-inspiring, 
and there was always a green tone to their whiteness. Then we got talking about fern parts, and Piercy asked me if I'd ever seen Naples at night from San Martino, and I asked him if he'd ever seen Broadway at night from the top of the Times building. Then he asked me if I'd ever watched Paris from Mount Motre, or seen the Temple of Neptune at Pestum bathed in Lucinian moonlight, which I very promptly told him I had, for it was on the ride home from Pestum that a certain person had proposed to me. We talked about temples and Greek gods and the age of the world and Indian legends until I got downright sleepy. Then Piercy threw away his last cigarette and got up. He said, Good night. And I said, Good night. And he went into the shack. He said he'd leave the door open in case I called. There were just the two of us between earth and sky that night, and not another soul within a radius of seven miles of any side of us. He was very glad to have someone to talk to. He's probably a year or two older than I am, but I am quite motherly with him. And he is shockingly incompetent as a homesteader from the look of his shack. But he's a gentleman, almost too gentle, I sometimes feel. A Laodicean, mentally over-refined until it leaves him unable to cope with real life. He's one of those men made for being a spectator and not an actor in life. And there's something so absurd about his being where he is that I feel sorry for him. I slept like a log. Once I fell asleep, I forgot about the hard ground and the smell of the horse blankets and the fact that I'd lost my poor Dinky Dunks team. When I woke up, it was the first gray of dawn. Two men were standing side by side, looking at me under the wagon. One was Piercy, and the other was Dinky Dunk himself. He'd got home by three o'clock in the morning, by hurrying, for he was nervous about me being alone. But he found the house empty and the team standing beside the corral, and me missing. Naturally, it wasn't a very happy situation. Poor Dinky Dunk hit the trail at once, and he'd been riding all night looking for his lost wife. Then he made for Percy's, woke him up, and discovered her placidly snoring under the wagon box. He didn't even smile at this. He was very tired and very silent. I thought for a moment that I saw distrust on Dinky Dunk's face for the first time, but he has said nothing. I hated to see him go out to work when we got home, but he refused to take a nap at noon, as I'd wanted him to. So tonight, when he came in for his supper, I had the birthday cake duly decked and the presents all out. But his enthusiasm was forced, and all during the meal he showed a tendency to be absent-minded. I had no explanations to make, so I made none. But I noticed that he put on his old slippers. I thought he had done it deliberately. You don't seem to mellow with age, I announced with my eyebrows up. He flushed at that quite plainly. Then he reached over and took hold of my hand. But he did it only with an effort. And after some tremendous inward struggle, which was not altogether flattering to me. Please take your hand away so I can reach the dish towel, I told him. And the hand went away like a shot. After I'd finished my work, I got out my George Meredith and read Modern Love. Dinky Dunk did not come to bed until late. I was awake when he came, but I didn't let him know it. End of section 13section 14 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Sunday, the 29th. I haven't felt much like writing this last week. I scarcely know why. I think it's because Dinky Dunk is on his dignity. He's getting thin, by the way. His cheekbones show, and his Adam's apple sticks out. He's worried about his land payments, and I tell him he'd be happier with a half section. But Dinky Dunk wants wealth, and I can't help him much. I'm afraid I'm an encumbrance, and the stars make me lonely, 
and the prairie wind sometimes gives me the willies, and winter is coming. I'm afraid I'm out of my setting, as badly out of it as Percival Benson is. It wouldn't be so bad, I suppose, if I'd never seen such lovely corners of the world before coming out here to be a dot on the wilderness. If I'd never had that heavenly summer at Fia Soleil and those months with you at Corfu, and that winter in Rome with poor dear dead Katrinka. Sometimes I think of the nights we used to look out over Paris, from the rooftop above Tete Dano's studio. And sometimes I think of the Pencino, with the band playing and the carriages flashing, and the officers in uniform, and the milky white statues among the trees, and the golden mist of the late afternoon over the immortal city. And I tell myself that it was all a dream, and that I feel that I am all a dream, and the prairie is a dream, and Patty and Oli and Dinky Dunk, and all of this new life is nothing more than a dream. Oh, Matilda Ann, I've been homesick this week, so unhappy and homesick for something, for something, and I don't even know what it is. Monday the 7th. Glory be! Winter's here with a double-edged saber, wind out of the north and snow on the ground. It gives a zip to things. It makes our snug little shack seem as cozy as a ship's cabin, and I've got a jumper sleigh. And with my coonskin coat and gauntlets and wedge cap, I can be as warm as toast in any wind. And there's so much to do, and I'm not going to be a piker. This is the land where folks make good or go loco. You've only got yourself to depend on and yourself to blame if things go wrong. And I'm going to make them go right. There's no use wailing out here in the West. A line or two of Lawrence Hopes has been running all day through my head. These are my people, and this is my land. I hear the pulse of her secret soul. This is the life that I understand. Savage and simple and sane and whole. Friday the 11th. Dinky Dunk came home with an Indian girl today, a young half-breed about 16 years old. She's to be both companion and parlor maid, for Dinky Dunk has to hurry off to British Columbia to try to sell his timber rights there to make his land payments. He's off tomorrow. It makes me feel wretched, but I'm consuming my own smoke, for I don't want him to think of me as an encumbrance, my Indian girl speaks a little English. She also eats sugar by the handful whenever she can steal it. I asked her what her name was, and she told me Queenie Mackenzie. That name almost took my breath away. How that untutored Northwest Aborigine ever took unto herself this Broadway chorus girl name, heaven only knows. But I have my suspicions of Queenie. She has certain exploratory movements which convince me she is verminous, she sleeps in the annex, I'm happy to say. At dinner tonight, when I was teaching Dinky Dunk how to make a rabbit out of his table napkin and a seasick passenger out of the last of his oranges, he explained that he might not get back in time for Christmas and asked if I'd mind. I knew his trip was important, so I kept a stiff upper lip and said of course I wouldn't mind. But the thought of a Christmas alone chilled my heart. I tried to be jolly and gave my repertory on the mouth organ, which promptly stopped all activities on the part of the round-eyed Queenie Mackenzie. But all that foolery was as forced as the frivolity of the French Revolution Conciergerie, where the merry diners couldn't quite forget that they were going to lose their heads in the morning. Sunday the 13th not only is Duncan gone, but Queenie has also quite unceremoniously taken her departure. It arose from the fact that I requested her to take a bath. The only disappointed member of the family is poor old Oli, who is actually making sheep eyes at that verminous little baggage. Imagination falters at what he might have done with a dollar's worth of brown sugar. When Queenie went, I find, my mouth organ went with her. I'd like to ling chi that Indian girl. Wednesday, the 16th. 
It was a sparkling, clear day today, with no wind, so I rode over to the old Tichborne Ranch with my little jumper sleigh. There, I found Percival Benson in a most pitiable condition. He had been laid up with the gripe. His place was untidy, his dishes were unwashed, and his fuel was running short. His appearance, in fact, rather frightened me, so I bundled him up and got him into the jumper and brought him straight home with me. He had a chill on the way, so as soon as we got to Casa Grande, I sent him to bed, gave him a shot of whiskey, and put my hot water bottle at his feet. He tried to accept the whole thing as a joke and vowed I was jolly well cooking him, but tonight he has a high fever, and I'm afraid he's in for a serious siege of illness. I intend to send Ole over to get some of his things and have his livestock brought over with ours. Sunday the 20th Piercy has had three very bad nights, but seems a little better today. His lung is congested, and it may be pneumonia, but I think my mustard plastered saved the day. He tries so hard to be cheerful and is so grateful for every little thing, but I wish Dinky Dunk was here to tell me what to do. I could never have survived this last week without Oli. He's as watchful and ready as a farm coley, but I want my dinky dunk. I may have spoiled my dinky dunk a little, but it's only once every century or two that God makes a man like him. I want to be a good wife. I want to do my share and keep a shoulder to the wheel if the going's got to be heavy for the next year or two. I won't be the Dixon type. I won't. I won't. My Duncan will need me this next year, and it'll be a joy to help him. For I love that man, Matilda Ann. I love him so much that it hurts. Sunday, the 27th. Christmas has come and gone. It was very lonely at Casa Grande. I prefer not writing about it. Piercy is improving, but is still rather weak. I think he had a narrow squeak. Wednesday, the 30th. My patient is up and about, looking like a different man. He shows the effects of my force-feeding, though he declares I'm trying to make him into a Strasbourg goose, for the sake of the pâté de foie gras, when I cut him up. But he's decided to go to Santa Barbara for the winter, and I think he's wise. So this afternoon I togged out in my furs, took the jumper, and went kiting over to the Tichborne Ranch. Oh, what a shack. What disorder, what untidiness, what spirit-numbing desolation. I don't blame poor Percival Benson for clearing out for California. I got what things he needed, however, and went kiting home again. End of section 14. Section 15 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Thursday, the 31st. I hardly know how to begin, but it must be written, or I'll suddenly go mad and start to bite the shack walls. Last night, after Piercy had helped me turn the bread mixer, for whatever happens, I've at least got to eat. I helped him pack. Among other things, he found a copy of Houseman's Shropshire Lad, and after running through it, announced he'd like to read me two or three little things out of it. So I squatted down in front of the fire, idly poking at the red coals, and he sat beside the stove with his book, in slippers and dressing gown. And there he was, solemnly reading out loud when the door opened and in walked Dinky Dunk. I say he walked in, but that isn't quite right. He stood in the open door, staring at us, with an expression that would have done credit to the tragic muse. I imagine Enoch Arden wore much the same look when he piped the home circle after that prolonged absence of his. Then Dinky Dunk did the most unpardonable thing. Instead of saying howdy, like a scholar and a gentleman, he backed out of the shack and slammed the door. When I'd caught my breath, I went out through that door after him. It was a bitterly cold night, 
but I did not stop to put anything on. I was too amazed, too indignant, too swept off my feet by the absurdity of it all. I could see Dinky Dunk in the clear starlight, taking the blankets off his team. He'd hurried to the shack without even unharnessing the horses. I could hear the wheel tires whine on the crisp snow, for the poor beasts were tired and restless. I went straight to the buckboard onto which Dinky Dunk was climbing. He looked like a cinnamon bear in his big, shaggy coat. I couldn't see his face, but I remembered how it looked in the doorway. It was the color of a tan shoe, and it was too weather-beaten and burnt by the wind and sun glare ever to turn white, or I suppose it would have been the color of paper. Haven't you, I demanded, haven't you any explanation for acting like this? He sat in the buckboard seat with the reins in his hands. I guess I've got the first right to that question, he finally said in a stifled voice. Then why don't you ask it? was my answer to him. Again, he waited a moment before speaking, as though he felt the need of weighing his words. I don't need to, now, he said as he tightened the reins. Wait, I called out to him. There are certain things I want you to know. I was not going to make explanations. I would not dignify his brute man's stupidity by such things. I scarcely know what I intended to do. As I looked up at him there in his rough fur coat, for a moment, he seemed millions and millions of miles away from me. I stared at him, trying to comprehend his utter lack of comprehension. I seemed to view him across the same gulf which separates a meditative zoo visitor from some abysmally astute animal that eons and eons ago must have been its cave fellow and hearthmate but now seem to have nothing in common, not even a language with which to link up those lost ages. Yet from all that mixture of feelings, only one survived. I didn't want my husband to go. It was the team, as far as I can remember, that really decided the thing. They had been restive, backing and jerking and pawing and nickering at their feed box, and suddenly they jumped forward, but this time they kept going. Whether Dinky Dunk tried to hold them back or not, I can't say, but I came back into the shack, shivering. Piercy, thank heaven, was in his room. I think I'll turn in, he called out quite casually through the partition. I said, all right, and sat down in front of the fire, trying to straighten things out. My Dinky Dunk was gone. He had glared at me with hate in his eyes as he sat in that buckboard. It's all over. He has no faith in me, his own wife. I went to bed and tried to sleep, but sleep was out of the question. The whole thing seemed so absurd, so unreasonable, so unjust. I could feel waves of anger sweep through my body at the mere thought of it. Then a wave of something else of something between anxiety and terror would take the place of anger. My husband was gone, and he'd never come back. I'd put all my eggs in one basket, and the basket had gone over and made a saffron-tinted omelet of all my life. And that's the way I watched the New Year in. I couldn't even afford the luxury of a little ball, for I was afraid Piercy would hear me. It must have been almost morning when I fell asleep. When I woke up, Percival Benson was gone, bag and baggage. At first I resented the thought of him going off that way, without a word, but on thinking it over, I decided he'd done the right thing. There's nothing like the hard, cold light of a winter's morning to bring you back to the hard, cold facts. Ole had driven Piercy to the station, so I was alone in the shack all day. I did a heap of thinking during those long hours of solitude, and out of all that straw of self-examination, I threshed out just one little grain of truth. I could never live on the prairie alone. And whatever I did, or wherever I went, I could never be happy without my dinky dunk. I had just finished supper tonight, as blue as indigo and as spiritless as a wet hen, when I heard the sound of voices. 
it took me only 10 seconds to make sure whose they were. Dinky Dunk had come back with Oli. I made a high dive for a book from the nearest shelf, swung the armchair around with a jerk, and sank luxuriously into it, with my feet up on the warm damper and my eyes leisurely and contentedly perusing George Moore's Confessions of a Young Man, although I hate the libidinous stuff like poison. Then Dinky Dunk came in. I could see him stare at me a little awkwardly and contritely. What woman can't read a book and study a man at the same time? and I could see that he was waiting for an opening, but I gave him none. Naturally, Oli had explained everything to him, but I had been humiliated. My pride had been walked over from end to end. My spirit had been stamped on, and I had decided on my plan of action. I simply ignored Duncan. I read for a while, then I took a lamp and went to my room and deliberately locked the door. My one regret is that I couldn't see Dinky Dunk's face when that key turned. And now I must stop writing and go to bed, for I'm dog tired. I know I'll sleep better tonight. It's nice to remember there's a man near. If he happens to be a man you care a trifle about, even though you have calmly turned the door key on him. End of section 15. Section 16 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Paree. Sunday the 3rd. Dinky Dunk has at least the sensibilities to respect my privacy of life. He knows where the deadline is and doesn't disregard it. But it's terribly hard to be tragic in a two by four shack. You miss the dignifying touches and you haven't much leeway for bulky swings of grandeur. For one whole day, I didn't speak to Dinky Dunk. I didn't even so much as recognize his existence. I ate by myself and did my work, when the monster was around, with all the preoccupation of a sleepwalker. But something happened, and I forgot myself. Before I knew it, I was asking him a question. He answered it, quite somberly, quite casually. If he had grinned or shown one jot of triumph, I would have walked out of the shack and never spoken to him again. I think he knew he was on terribly perilous ground. He picked his way with care. He asked me a question back, quite offhandedly, and for the time being let the matter rest there. But the breach was in my walls, Matilda Ann, and I was quite defenseless. We were both very impersonal and very polite when he came in at supper time, though I think I turned a visible pink when I sat down at the table, for our eyes met there, just a moment and no more. I knew he was watching me, covertly, all the time, and I knew I was making him pretty miserable, but I wasn't the least bit ashamed of it. After supper, he indifferently announced that he had nothing to do and might as well help me wash up. I went to hand him the dish towel. Instead of taking the towel, he took my hand, with the very profane ejaculation as he did so of, Oh, hell, Gigi, what's the use? Then, before I knew it, he had me in his arms. Our butter dish was broken in the collision. And I was weak enough to feel sorry for him and his poor, tragic, pleading eyes. Then I gave up. If I was silly enough to have a little cry on his shoulder... I had the satisfaction of feeling him give a gulp or two himself. You're the most wonderful woman in the world, he solemnly told me. And then, in a much less solemn way, he began kissing me again. But the barriers were down, and how we talked that night, and how different everything seemed, and how nice it was to feel his arms over my shoulder and his quiet breathing on the nape of my neck as I fell asleep. It seemed as though love were fanning me with its softest wings. I'm happy again, but I've been wondering if it's environment that makes character or character that makes environment. Sometimes I think it's one way, and sometimes I feel it's the other. But I can't be sure of my answer, yet. It's hard for a spoiled woman to remember that her life has been merged into somebody else's life. 
I've been wondering if marriage isn't like a two-paneled screen, which won't stand up if both of its panels are too much in line. Heaven knows I want harmony, but a woman likes to feel that instead of being out of step with her whole regiment of life, it's the regiment that's out of step with her. Tonight I unlaced Dinky Dunk's shoes and put on his slippers, and sat on the floor between his knees with my head against the steady tick-tock of his watch pocket. Dinky Dunk, I solemnly announced, that gink called Pope was a poor guesser. The proper study of a man should have been woman. Thursday the 7th Everything at Casa Grande has settled back into the usual groove. There's been a great deal to do about the shack. The grimiest bugbear of domestic work is dishwashing. A pile of greasy plates is the one thing that gets on my nerves. And it's a little waterloo that must be faced three times every day, of every week, of every month, of every year. And I was never properly broke for domesticity and the dishpan. Why can't some genius invent a self-washing frying pan? My hair is growing so long that I can now do it up in a sort of half-hearted French roll. It has been quite cold, with a wonderful fall of snow. The sleighing could not be better. Saturday the 9th Dinky Dunk's Christmas present came today, over two weeks late. He had never mentioned it, and I had not only held my peace, but had given up all thoughts of getting a really, truly gift from my lord and master. They brought it out from Buckhorn in the bobsleigh, all wrapped up in buffalo robes and blankets and tarpaulins. It's a baby grand piano. And a butte. It came all the way from Winnipeg. But either the shipping or the knocking about or the extreme cold has put it terribly out of tune, and it can't be used until the piano tuner travels a couple hundred miles out here to put it in shape. And it's far too big for the shack, even when pushed right up into the corner. But Dinky Dunk says that before next winter, there'll be a different sort of house on this spot where the Casa Grande now stands. And that's to keep your soul alive in the meantime, he announced. I scolded him for being so extravagant, when he needs every dollar he could lay his hands on. But he wouldn't listen to me. In fact, it only started an outburst. My God, Gigi, he cried. Haven't you given up enough for me? Haven't you sacrificed enough in coming out here to the end of nowhere and leaving behind everything that made life decent? Why, honey chili, didn't I get you? I demanded. But even that didn't stop him. Don't you suppose I ever think what it's meant to you, to a woman like you? There are certain things we can't have, but there are some things we're going to have. This next 10 or 12 months will be hard, but after that, there's going to be a change. If the Lord is with me and I have a white man's luck, And supposing we have bad luck, I asked him. He was silent for a moment or two. We can always give up and go back to the city, he finally said. Give up? I said with a whoop. Give up? Not on your life, Mr. Dower Man. We're not going to be Dixonites. We're going to win out. And we were together in a death clinch, hugging the breath out of each other, when Ole came in to ask if he hadn't better get the stock stabled, as there was bad weather coming. Monday the 11th We are having the first real blizzard of the winter. It began yesterday, as Ole intimated, and for all the tail end of my day, Dinky Dunk was on the go, in the bitter cold, looking after fuel and feed and getting things shipshape for all the world like a skipper who's read his barometer and seen a hurricane coming. There had been no wind for a couple of days, only dull, heavy skies with a disturbing sense of quietness. Even when I heard Ole and Dinky Dunk shouting outside and shoring up the shack walls with poles, I could not quite make out what it meant. Then the blizzard came. It came down out of the northwest, like a cloudburst. It hummed and sang, and then it whined, and then it screamed, 
screamed in a high falsetto that made you think old Mother Earth was in her last throes. The snow was fine and hard, really minute particles of ice, and not snow at all, as we know it in the East. Little sharp-angled diamond points that sting the skin like fire. It came in almost horizontal lines, driving flat across the unbroken prairie and defying anything made of God or man to stop it. Nothing did stop it. Our shack, the bunkhouse, and stables, and haystacks tore a few pin feathers off its breast, though. And those few feathers are drifts higher than my head, heaped up against each and all of the buildings. I scratched the frost off the window pane, where feathery little drifts were seeping in through the sill cracks when it first began, but the wind blew harder and harder, and the shack rocked and shook with tension. Oh, such a wind. It made a whining and wailing noise, with each note higher, and when you felt that it couldn't possibly increase, that it simply must ease off, or the whole world would go smash, why, that whining note merely grew tenser, and the wind grew stronger. How it lashed things, how it shook and flailed and trampled this poor old earth of ours. Just before supper, Ole announced that he'd look after my chicks for me. I told him, quite casually, that I'd attend them myself. I usually strew a mixture of wheat and oats on the litter in the hen house overnight. This had two advantages. One was that it didn't take me out quite so early in the morning, and the other was that the chicks themselves started scratching around first thing in the morning and so got exercise and kept themselves warmer bodied and in better health. It was not essential that I should go to the hen house myself, but I was possessed with the sudden desire to face that singing white tornado. So I put on my things while Dinky Dunk was at work in the stables. I put on furs and leggings and gauntlets and all, as I thought I was starting out for the 90-mile drive, and slipped out. Dinky Dunk had tunneled through the drift in front of the door, but that tunnel was already beginning to fill again. I plowed through it and tried to look about me. Everything was a sort of streaked misty gray, an all-enveloping, muffling-laden maelstrom that hurt your skin when you lifted your head and tried to look it in the face. Once, in a lull of the wind when the snow was not so thick, I caught sight of the haystacks. That gave me a line on the hen house, so I made for it, on the run, holding my head low as I went. It was glorious at first. It made my lungs pump and my blood race and my legs tingle. Then the storm's devil howled in my eyes and the ice lashes slapped in my face. Then the wind went off on a rampage again, and I couldn't see. I couldn't move forward. I couldn't even breathe. Then I got frightened. I leaned there against the wind, calling for Dinky Dunk and Oli, whenever I could gasp breath enough to make a sound. But I might as well have been a baby crying in mid-ocean to a Kensington garden nurse. Then I knew I was lost. No one could ever hear me in that roar and there was nothing to be seen, just a driving, blinding, stinging gray pall of flying fury that nettled the naked skin like an electric massage and took the breath out of your buffeted body. There was no landmark, no glimpse of any building, nothing whatever to go by, and I felt so helpless in the face of that wind. It seemed to take the power of locomotion from my legs, I was not altogether amazed at the thought that I might die there, within a hundred yards of my own home, so near those narrow walls within which were warmth and shelter and quietness. I imagined how they would find my body, deep under the snow, some morning, how Dinky Dunk would search, perhaps for days. I felt so sorry for him, I decided not to give up, that I wouldn't be lost, that I wouldn't die there like a fly on a sheet of tanglefoot. I had fallen down on my knees with my back to the wind, and already the snow had drifted around me. I also found my eyelashes frozen together and lost several winkers to getting rid of those solidified tears. But I got on my feet and battled on, 
calling when I could. I kept on, going around and around in a circle, I suppose, as people always do when they're lost in a storm. Then the wind grew worse again. I couldn't make any headway against it. I had to give up. I simply had to. I wasn't afraid. I wasn't terrified at the thought of what was happening to me. I was only sorry, with a misty sort of sorrow I can't explain. And I don't remember that I felt particularly uncomfortable, except for the fact that I found it rather hard to breathe. It was Oli who found me. He came staggering through the snow with extra fuel for the bunkhouse and nearly walked over me. As we found out afterward, I wasn't more than 30 steps away from that bunkhouse door. Oli pulled me up out of the snow, the same as you'd pull a skein of darning silk out of a work basket. He half carried me to the bunkhouse, got his bearings, then steered me for the shack. It was a fight, but we made it. And Dinky Dunk was still out looking after his stock and doesn't know how nearly he lost his ladybird. But I've made Oli promise not to say a word about it. But the top of my nose is red and swollen. I think it must have got a trifle frost-nipped in the encounter. The weather has cleared now, and the wind has gone down. But it is very cold, and Dinky Dunk has just reported that it is already 48 below zero. End of section 16. Section 17 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Tuesday the 19th. The days slip away and I scarcely know where they go. The weather is wonderful. Clear and cold, with such heaps of sunshine, you'd never dream it was zero weather. But you have to be careful and always wear furs when you're driving or out for any length of time. Three hours in this open air is as good as a pint of Chinky's best champagne. It makes me tingle. We're living high with several barrels of frozen game, geese, duck, and prairie chicken, and also an old tin trunk stuffed full of beef roasts, cut the right size. I bring them in and thaw them out overnight, as I need them. The freezing makes them very tender, but they must be completely thawed before they go into the oven, or the outside will be overdone and the inside still raw. I learned that by experience. My appetite is disgraceful, and I'm still gaining. Chinky could never again say I reminded him of one of the lean keen in Pharaoh's dream. I have been asking Dinky Dunk if it isn't downright cruelty to leave the horses and cattle out on the range in weather like this. My husband says not, so long as they have a windbreak in time of storms. The animals paw through the snow for grass to eat, and when they get thirsty, they can eat the snow itself, which Dinky Dunk solemnly assures me almost never gives them sore throat. But the open prairie, just at this season, is a most inhospitable-looking pasturage, and the unbroken glare of white makes my eyes ache. There is one big indoor task I finally have accomplished, and that is tuning my piano. It made my heart heavy, standing there useless, a gloomy monument of ironic grandeur. As a girl, I used to watch Katrinka's long-haired Alsatian put her concert grand to rights, and I knew that my ear was dependable enough. So the second day after my baby grand's arrival, I went at it with a monkey wrench. But that was a failure. Then I made a drawing of a tuning hammer and had Oli secretly convey it to the Buckborn blacksmith, who in turn concocted a great steel hollow-headed monstrosity, which actually fits over the pins to which the piano wires are strung, even though the aforesaid monstrosity is heavy enough to stun an ox with. But it did the work, although it took about two half days, and now every note is true. So, now I have music, and Dinky Dunk does enjoy my playing these long winter evenings. Some nights we let Oli come in and listen to the concert. He sits rapt, 
especially when I play ragtime, which seems the one thing that touches his holy of holies. Poor Oli. I surely have a good friend in that silent, faithful, uncouth Swede. Dinky Dunk himself is so thin that it worries me. But he eats well and doesn't anathematize my cooking. He's getting a few gray hairs at the temples. I think they make him look rather distingué. But they worry my poor Dinky Dunk. Holy gee, he said yesterday, studying himself for the third time in his shaving glass. I'm getting old, he laughed when I started to whistle. Believe me if all those endearing young charms which I gaze on so fondly today. But at heart, he was really disturbed by the discovery of those few white hairs. I've been telling him that the ladies won't love him anymore and that his cut-up days are over. He says I'll have to make up for the others. So I started for him with my Australian crawl stroke. It took me an hour to get the taste of shaving soap out of my mouth. Dinky Dunk says I'm so full of life that I sparkle. All I know is that I'm happy, supremely and ridiculously happy. Sunday the 31st The inevitable has happened. I don't know how to write about it. I can't write about it. My heart goes down like a freight elevator, slowly, sickeningly, even when I think about it. Dinky Dunk came in and saw me studying the little rows of dates written on the wallpaper beside the bedroom window. I pretended to be draping the curtain. What's the matter, Lady Bird? He demanded when he saw my face. I calmly told him that nothing was the matter, but he wouldn't let me go. I wanted to be alone, to think things out, but he kept holding me there with my face to the light. I suppose I must have been all eyes and probably shaking a little, and I didn't want him to suspect. Excuse me if I find you unmistakably annoying, I said in a voice that was so desperately cold that it even surprised my own ears. He dropped me as though I had been a hot potato. I could see that I'd hurt him, and hurt him a lot. My first impulse was to run to him with a shower of repentant kisses, as one usually does, the same as one sprinkles salt on claret stains. But in him I beheld the original and entire cause, and I just couldn't do it. He called me a high-spirited devil with a hair-trigger temper, but he left me alone to think things out. Tuesday the 9th I've started to say my prayers again. It rather frightened Dinky Dunk, who sat up in bed and asked me if I wasn't feeling well. I promptly assured him that I was in the best of health. He not only agreed with me, but said I was as plump as a partridge. When I am alone, though, I get frightened and fidgety. So I kneel down every night and morning now to ask God for help and guidance. I want to be a good woman and a better wife, but I shall never let Duncan know. Never. Wednesday the 17th Do you remember Aunt Harriet who always wept when she read the Isles of Greece? She didn't even know where they were and had never been east of Salem, but all the Woodburys were like that. Dinky Dunk came in and found me crying today for the second time in one week. He made such a valiantly ponderous effect to cheer me up, poor boy, and shook his head and said I'd soon be an improvement on the Snyder system, which is a system of irrigation by spraying overnight from pipes. My nerves don't seem so good as they were. The winter's so long. I'm already counting the days to spring. Thursday, the 25th. Dinky Dunk has concluded that I am too much alone. He's been worrying over it. I can tell that. I'm not trying to be moody, but sometimes I simply can't help it. Yesterday afternoon, he drove up to Casa Grande, proud as punch, with a little black and white kitten in the crook of his arm. He'd covered 28 miles of trail for that kitten. It is to be my companion. But the kitten's as lonesome as I am and has been crying and nearly driving me crazy. 
Tuesday the 2nd. The weather has been bad, but winter is slipping away. Nicky Dunk has been staying in from his work these mornings, helping me about the house. He is clumsy and slow and has broken two or three of the dishes. But I hate to say anything. His eyes get so tragic. He declares that as soon as the trails are passable, he's going to have a woman to help me, that this sort of thing can't go on any longer. He imagines it's merely the monotony of housework that's making my nerves so bad. Yesterday morning, I was drying the dishes and Dinky Dunk was washing. I found the second spoon with egg on it. I don't know why it was, but that trivial streak of yellow along the edge of a spoon suddenly seemed to enrage me. It became monumental, an emblem of vague possibilities which I would have to face until the end of my days. I flung that spoon back in the dishpan. Then I turned on my husband and called out to him in a voice that didn't quite seem like my own. Oh, God, can't you wash him clean? Can't you wash him clean? I even think I ran up and down the room and pretty well made what Percival Benson would call a bally ass of myself. Dinky Dunk didn't even answer me. But he dried his hands and got his things and went outdoors to the stables, I suppose. His face was as colorless as it could possibly get. I felt sorry, but it was too late, and my sniffling didn't do any good. And it startled me as I started thinking things over to realize I'd lost my sense of humor. Thursday the 4th. Dinky Dunk thinks I'm mad. I'm quite sure he does. He came in at noon today and found me on the floor with the kitten. I'd tied a piece of fur to the end of a string. Oh, how that kitten scrambled after that fur, round and round in a circle until he tumbled over on his own ears. I was squeaking and weak with laughing when Dinky Dunk stood in the door. Poor boy. He takes things so solemnly. But I know that he thinks I'm quite mad. Perhaps I am. I cried myself to sleep last night, and for several days now, I have been longing for caviar. Wednesday the 17th. Spring is surely coming. It promises to be an early one. I feel better at the thought of it, and of getting out again. But the roads are quite impassable. Such mud, such oceans of glue pot dirt. They have a saying out here that soil is as rich as it is sticky. If this is true, Dinky Dunk has a second Garden of Eden. This mud sticks to everything, to feet, to clothes, to wagon wheels. But there's getting to be real warmth in the sun that shines through my window. Saturday, the 27th. A warm Chinook has licked up the last of the snow. Even Dinky Dunk admits that spring is coming. For three solid hours, an awakened blue bottle has been buzzing against the pane of my bedroom window. I wonder if most of us aren't like that fly, mystified by the illusion of light that fails to lead to liberty. This morning, I caught sight of Dinky Dunk in his fur coat, climbing into the buckboard. I shall always hate to see him in that rig. It makes me think of a certain night, and we hate to have memory to put a finger on our mental scars. When I was a girl, Aunt Charlotte's second fiend of a husband locked me up in that lonely derby house of theirs because I threw pebbles at the swans. Then off they drove to dinner somewhere and left me a prisoner there, where I listened to the bells of all saints as the house gradually grew dark. And ever since then, bells at evening have made me feel lonely and left me unhappy. But the renaissance of the buckboard means that spring is here again, and for my dinky dunk, that means harder work. He's what they call a rustler out here. He believes in speed. He doesn't even wait until the frost is off the ground before he starts to seed, just puts a drill over a two-inch batter of thawed-out mud. He's so mad about getting early on the land. He says he wants early wheat or no wheat. But he has to have help, and men are almost impossible to get. He had hoped for a gasoline tractor, but it can't be financed this spring, he has confessed to me. And I know, in my secret heart of hearts, that the tractor would have been here if it hadn't been for my piano. 
there are still hundreds and hundreds of acres of prairie sod to break for spring wheat. Dinky Dunk declares that he's going to risk everything on wheat this year. He says that by working two outfits of horses, he himself can sow 40 acres a day, but that means keeping the horses on the trot part of the time. He is thinking so much about his crop that I accused him of neglecting me. Is the varnish starting to wear off? I inquired with a secret gulp of womanish self-pity. He saved the day by declaring I was just as crazy and just as adorable as I ever was. Then he asked me, rather sadly, if I was bored. Bored? I said. How could I be bored with all these discomforts? No one is ever bored until they are comfortable. But the moment after I said it, I was sorry. Tuesday the 6th. Spring is here, with a warm Chinook creeping in from the Rockies and the sky of robin egg blue. The gophers have come out of their winter quarters and are chattering and racing about. We saw a phalanx of wild geese going northward, and Dinky Dunk says he's seen any number of ducks. They go in drifting Vs, and I love to watch them melt into the skyline. The prairie floor is turning into the loveliest of greens, and it is a joy just to be alive. I have been out all afternoon. The gophers aren't going to get ahead of me. End of Section 17「Eighteen of the Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Monday the 12th. What would you say if you saw Brunhild drive up to your back door? What would you do if you discovered a Norse goddess placidly surveying you from a green wagon seat? How would you act if you beheld a big, blonde Valkyrie suddenly introducing herself into your little earthly affairs? Well, you can wonder that I stared all eyes when Dinky Dunk brought home a figure like this in the shape of a fin girl named Olga Saristo. Olga is to work in the fields and to help me when she has time, but I'll never get used to having a Norse legend standing at my elbow, for Olga is the most wonderful creature I have ever clapped eyes on. I say that without doubt, without exaggeration. And what made the picture complete? She came driving a yoke of oxen, for Dinky Dunk will have need of every horse and hauling animal he can lay his hands on. I simply held my breath as I stared up at her, high on her wagon seat, locked out in silhouette against the pale skyline. A Brunhild with cowhide boots on. She wore a pale blue petticoat and a Swedish-looking black shawl with bright-colored flowers worked along the hem. She had no hat, but she had two great ropes of pale gold hair, almost as thick as my arm, and hanging almost as low as her knees. She looked colossal up in the wagon seat, but when she got down on the ground, she was not so immense. She is, however, a strapping big woman, and I don't think I ever saw such shoulders. She's Olympian, titanic. She makes me think of the Venus de Milo. There's such a largeness and calmness and smoothness of surface about her. I suppose a St. Gaudens might say that her mouth was too big, and a Gibson might add that her nose hadn't the narrow rectitude of a Greek statue's, but she's a beautiful, a beautiful woman was the word I was going to write, but the word animal just bunts and shoves itself in, like a stabled cow insisting on its own stall. But if you regard her as only animal, you must at least accept her as a perfect one. Her mouth is large, but I never saw such red lips, full and red and dewy. Her forehead is low and square, but milky smooth, and I know she would crack a chicken bone between those white teeth of hers. Even her tongue, I noticed, is a watermelon red. She must be healthy. Dinky Dunk says she's a find, that she can drive a double-seater as well as any man in the West, and that by taking her for the season, he gets the use of the ox team as well. 
He warned me not to ask her about her family, as only a few weeks ago her father and younger brother were burned to death in their shack, a hundred miles or so north of us. Tuesday the 20th Olga has been with us a week, and she still fascinates me. She is installed in the annex and seems calmly satisfied with her surroundings. She brought everything she owns tied up in an oat sack. I have given her a few of my things, for which she seems dumbly grateful. She seldom talks and never laughs, but I'm teaching her to say yes instead of yow. She studies me with her limpid blue eyes, and if she is silent, she is never sullen. She hasn't the heavy forehead and jaw of the Galatian women, and she hasn't the Asiatic cast of face that belongs to the Russian peasant. She has the finest mouth of teeth I ever saw in a human head, and she never used a toothbrush in her life. She's only 19, but such a bosom and limbs, such strength. This is a great deal of talk about Olga, I'm afraid. But you must remember that Olga is an event. I expected Oli would be keeled over by her arrival, but they seem to regard each other with silent contempt. I suppose that's because racially and physically they are of the same type. I'm anxious to see what Percival Benson thinks of Olga when he gets back. They would be such opposites. Olga is working with her ox team on the land. Two days ago, I rode out on Patty and watched her. There was something Homeric about it. Something Sorolla would have jumped at. She seemed so like her oxen. She moved like them, and her eyes were like theirs. She has the same strength and solemnity when she walks. She is so primitive and natural and instinctive in her actions. Yesterday, after dinner, she curled up on a pile of hay at one end of the corral and fell asleep for a few minutes, flat in the strong noonday light. I saw Dinky Dunk stop on his way to the stable and stand and look down at her. I stepped out beside him. God, what a woman, he said under his breath. A vague stab of jealousy went through me as I heard him say that. Then I looked at her hand, large, relaxed, roughened with all kinds of weather and calloused with heavy work. And this time, it was an equally vague stab of pity that went through me. Monday, the 26th. The rush is on, and Dinky Dunk is always out before six. If it's true, as someone once said, that the pleasures of life depended on its anxieties, then we ought to be a hilarious household. Everyone is busy, and I do what I can to help. I don't know why it is, but I find an odd comfort in the thought of having another woman near me, even Olga. She also helps me a great deal with the housework. Those huge hands of hers have a dexterity you'd never dream of. She thinks of the piano as a sort of miracle, and me a second miracle for being able to play it. In the evening, she sits back in a corner, the darkest corner she can find, and listens. She never speaks, never moves, never expresses one iota of emotion. But in the gloom, I can often catch the animal-like glow of her eyes. They seem almost phosphorescent. Dinky Dunk had a long letter from Percival Benson today. It was interesting and offhandedly jolly and just the right sort. And Percy says he'll be back on the Titchborn Place in a few weeks. Wednesday, the 28th. Olga went through the boards of her wagon and got a bad scrape on her leg. She showed me the extent of her injuries without the slightest hesitation and I gave her first aid treatment with my carbolated Vaseline. And still again, I had to think of the Venus de Milo, for it was a knee like a statue's, milky white and round and smooth, with a skin like a baby's, and so different to her sunburnt forearms. It was Olympian more than Fifth Avenue-y. It was a leg that made me think not of Rubens, but of Titan, and my thoughts at once went out to the right-hand lady of the sacrifice and profane love in the Borghese. There is such a softness and roundness combined with its strength, and Dinky Dunk walked in and stood staring at it, himself, with never so much as a word of apology. 
Olga looked up at him without a flicker of her ox-like eyes. It wasn't until I made an angry motion for her to drop her skirt that she realized any necessity of covering that tightened knee, but again I felt that odd pang of jealousy needle through me as I saw his face. At least I suppose it was jealousy. The jealousy of an artful little Mona Lisa minx who didn't even class in with the demigods. When Olga was gone, however, I said to Dinky Dunk, Isn't that a limb for your life? He merely said, we don't grow limbs up here, Tabby. They're legs. Just plain legs. Anything but plain, I corrected him. Then he acknowledged that he'd seen those knees before. He stumbled on Olga and her brother knee-deep in mud and cow manure, treading a mixture to plaster their shack with, the same as the Dukabors do. It left me less envious of those Juno-esque knees. Monday the 2nd. Keeping chickens is a much more complicated thing than the outsider imagines. For example, several of my best hands, quite untouched by the modern spirit of feminine unrest, have been developing broodiness, and I have been trying to break them up, as the Poltoners put it. But they are determined to set. This mothering instinct is a fine enough thing in its way, but it's been spoiling too many good eggs. I've been trying to emancipate these ruffled females. I lift them off the nests by their tail feathers ten times a day. I fling cold water in their solemn maternal faces. I put little rings of barbed wire under their sentimental old bosoms, but still they set. And one, having pecked me on the wrist until the blood came, got her ears promptly boxed. In face of the fact that all poultry keepers acknowledge that kindness to a hen improves her laying qualities. Thursday the 5th. Casa Grande is a beehive of industry. Everyone has a part to play, and I'm no longer expected to sit by the fire and purr. At nights, I sew. Dinky Dunk is so hard on his clothes. When it's not putting on patches, it's sewing on buttons. Then we go to bed at half past nine. At half past nine, think of it. Little me, who more than once went humming up Fifth Avenue when morning was showing gray over the East River, and often left Sherry's, oh, those dear old dancing days, when the milk wagons were rumbling through 44th Street, and once triumphantly announced, on coming out of Dorland's and studying the old oyster letter clock, that I'd stuck it out to Y minutes past O. But it's no hardship to get up at five these glorious mornings. The days get longer and the weather is perfect. And the prairie looks as though a vacuum cleaner had been at work on it overnight. Positively, there's a charwoman who does this old world over while we sleep. By morning, it's as bright as a new pin. And out here, everyone is thinking of the day ahead. Dinky Dunk of his crop. Olga of the pair of sky-blue corsets I've written to the Winnipeg mail order house for. Oli of the final weatherproofing of the granaries so the wheat won't get spoiled anymore. Gigi herself of, of something which she's almost afraid to think about. Dinky Dunk, in his deviling moods, says I'm an old married woman now, that I'm settled, that I've eaten my pie. Perhaps I have. I'm not imaginative, so I must depend on others for my joy of living. I know now that I could never create, never really express myself in any way worthwhile, either on paper or canvas or keyboard. And people without imagination, I suppose, simply have to drop back into racial simplicities, which means I'll have to have a family and feed hungry mouths and keep a home going, and I'll have to get all my art at second hand from magazines and gramophone records and plaster of Paris casts. Just a housewife. And I so wanted to be something more once. Yet, I wonder if, after all, the one is so much better than the other. I wonder. And here comes Dinky Dunk, and in three minutes, he'll be kissing me on the top of the chin and asking me what there's going to be good for supper. And that is better than fame. 
For all afternoon, those twelve little lines of Dobson's have been running through my head. Fame is a food that dead men eat. I have no stomach for such meat. In little light and narrow rooms, they eat it in the silent tombs, with no kind voice of comrade near to bid the banquet be of cheer. But friendship is a noble thing. Of friendship it is good to sing. For truly when a man shall end, he lives in memory of his friend, who doth his better part recall, and of his faults make funeral. When you put the word love there instead of friendship, you make it even better. Olga, by the way, is not so stupid as you might imagine. She discovered something which I did not intend her to find out. And Oli, also, by the way, has solved the problem of breaking up my setting hens. He has made a swinging coop with a wire netting bottom, for all the world like the hanging gardens of Babylon, and into this all the ruffled mothers-to-be have been thrust and the coop hung up on the hen house wall. Open wire is a very uncomfortable thing to set on, and these hens have at last discovered that fact. I have been out looking at them. I never saw such a parliament of solemn indignation. But their pride has been broken, and they're beginning to show a healthier interest in their meals. Tuesday the 10th I've been wondering if Dinky Dunk is going to fall in love with Olga. Yesterday, I saw him staring at her neck. She's the type of woman that would really make the right sort of wilderness wife. She seems an integral part of the prairie, broad-bosomed, fecund, opulent, and she's so placid and large and soft-spoken and easy to live with. She has none of my moods and tantrums. Her corsets came today, and I showed her how to put them on. She is incontentedly proud of them, but in my judgment, they only make her ridiculous. It is as foolish as putting on a French toque on one of her oxen. The skin of Olga's great shoulders is as smooth and creamy as a baby's. I have been watching her eyes. They are not a dark blue, but in a strong sidelight, they seem deep wells of light, layer on layer of azure. And she is mysterious to me, calmly and magnificently inscrutable, and I once thought of her an uncouth animal. But she is a great help. She has planted rows and rows of sweet peas all about Casa Grande and is starting to make a kitchen garden, which she is going to fence off and look after with her own hands. It will be twice the size of Oli's. But I do hope she doesn't ever grow into something mysterious to my dinky dunk. This morning, she said I ought to work in the garden, that the more I keep on my feet, the better it would be for me later on. As for Dinky Dunk, the poor boy is working himself gaunt. Yet tired as he is, he tries to read a few pages of something worthwhile every night. Sometimes we take turns in reading. Last night, he handed me over his volume of Spencer with a pencil mark along one passage. This passage said, Intellectual activity in women is liable to be diminished after marriage by that antagonism between individuation and reproduction throughout the organic world. I don't know why, but that passage made me as hot as a hornet. In the background of my brain, I carried some vague memory of George Eliot once catching this same philosophizing Spencer fishing with a composite fly and remarking on his passion for generalizations, declaring that he even fished with a generalization. So I could afford to laugh. Spencer's idea of a tragedy, I told Dinky Dunk, is a deduction killed by a fact. And again, I smiled my Mona Lisa smile. And I'm going to be one of those facts, I proudly proclaimed. Dinky Dunk, after thinking this over, broke into a laugh. You know, Gigi, he solemnly announced, there are times when you seem almost clever. But I wasn't clever in this case, for it was hours later before I saw the trap which Dinky Dunk had laid for me. End of section 18.
Section 19 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Monday the 16th All day Saturday, Olga and Dinky Dunk were off in the chuck wagon, working too far away to come home for dinner. The thought of them being out there, side by side, hung over me like a cloud. I remembered how he had absently stared at the white column of her neck, and I pictured him stopping in his work and studying her faded blue cotton waist pulled tight against the line of that opulent breast. What man wouldn't be impressed with such bodily magnificence, such lavish and undulating youth and strength? And there's something so soft and diffused about those ox-like eyes of hers. You do not think, then, of her eyes being such a pale blue, any more than you can stop to accuse summer moonlight of not being ruddy. And those unruffled blue eyes never seem to see you. They rather seem to bathe you in a gaze as soft and impersonal as moonlight itself. I simply couldn't stand it any more. I got on Patty and galloped out for my dinky dunk, as though it were my sudden and solemn duty to save him from some imminent and awful catastrophe. I stopped on the way to watch a couple of prairie chickens minuetting through the turns of their vernal courtships. The pompous little buggers with puffed-out waddles and neck ruffles were positively doing can-cans and two-steps along the prairie floor. Love was in the air that perfect spring afternoon, even for the animal world. So instead of riding openly and honestly to Dinky Dunk and Olga, I kept under cover as much as I could and stalked them, as though I had been a timber wolf. Then I felt thoroughly and unspeakably ashamed of myself, for I caught sight of Olga high on her wagon, like a Valkyrie on a cloud, and Dinky Dunk hard at work a good two miles away. He was a little startled to see me come cantering up on Patty. I don't know whether it was silly or not, but I told him straight out what had brought me. He hugged me like a bear and then sat down on the prairie and laughed. With that cow? He cried. And I'm sure no man could ever call a woman he loves a cow. I believe Dinky Dunk suspects something. He's just asked me to be more careful about riding Patty and he's been more solemnly kind lately. But I'll never tell him. Never, never. Tuesday the 24th. Piercy will be back tomorrow. It will be a different-looking country to what it was when he left. I've been staring up at a cobalt sky and began to understand why people used to think heaven was somewhere up in the midst of such celestial blue. And on the prairie, the sky is your first and last friend. Wasn't it Emerson who somewhere said that the firmament was the daily bread for one's eyes? And oh, the lovely green floor of the wheat country now. Such a soft yellow-green glory, stretching so far in every direction, growing so much deeper day by day. And the sun and space and clear light on the skyline and the pillars of smoke miles away from the wonderful, mysterious promise that is hanging over this teeming, steaming, shimmering, abundant, broad bosom of earth. It thrills me in a way I can't explain. By night and day, before breakfast and after supper, the talk is of wheat, 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 until I nearly go crazy. I complained to Dinky Dunk that he was dreaming of wheat, living wheat, breathing wheat, that he and all the rest of the world seemed mad about wheat. And there's just one other thing you must remember, Lady Bird, was his answer. All the rest of the world is eating wheat. It can't live without wheat, and I'd rather be growing the breads that feed the hungry than getting rich making cordite and croup guns. So he's risking everything on this crop of his, and is internally figuring and planning and getting ready for the grand debacle. He says it'll be like a battle, and no general goes into battle without being prepared for it. But when we read about the doings of the outside world, it seems like reading of happenings that have taken place on the planet Mars. 
We're our own little world just now. Self-contained, rounded out, complete. Friday the 3rd Two things of vast importance have happened. Dinky Dunk has packed up and made off for Edmonton to interview some railway officials, and Piercy is back. Dinky Dunk is so mysteriously silent as to the matter of his trip that I'm afraid he is worried about money matters. And he's asked me if I mind keeping the household expenses down as low as I could without actual hardship for the next few months. As for Piercy, he seemed a little constrained, but looked ever so much better. He is quite sunburned, likes California, and says we ought to have a winter bungalow there. And Dinky Dunk just warned me to save on the pantry pennies. He's brought a fastidious little old Englishwoman back with him as a housekeeper, a Mrs. Watson, and she looks both capable and practical, notwithstanding the fact that she seems to have stepped right out of Dickens and carries a huge Manx cat about with her. Piercy said he thought they'd muddle along in some way. Thoughtful boy that he was, he brought me a portamento packed full of the newer novels and magazines and a two-pound jar of smoking tobacco for Dinky Dunk. Thursday the 9th A Belasco couldn't have more carefully staged the first meeting between Piercy and Olga. I felt that she was my discovery, and I wanted to spring her on him at the right moment and in the right way. I wanted to get the Valkyrie on a cloud effect, so I kept Piercy in the house on the pretext of giving him a cup of tea until I should hear the rumble of the wagon and know that Olga was sweeping home with her team. It so happened when I heard the first faint far thunder of that homing wagon that Piercy was sitting in my easy chair with a cup of my thinnest china in one hand and a copy of Walter Patter's Marius the Epicurean in the other. We had been speaking of climate, and he wanted to look up the passage where Patter said, One only dies of the cold, which I consider a slur on the Northwest. I couldn't help realizing, as I sat staring at Piercy, at the thin, oversensitive face, and the high-arched, over-refined nose, and the narrow, stooping, over-delicate shoulders, what a direct opposite he was to Olga in every way. Instead of thin china and patter in her hand at that very moment, I remembered she'd probably have a four-tined fork or a mud-stained fence stretcher. I went to the door and looked out. At the proper moment, I called Piercy. Olga was standing up in the wagon box, swinging about one corner of the corral. She stood with her shoulders well back, for her weight was already on the lines to pull the team up. Her loose, blue skirt edge was fluttering in the wind, but at the front it was held tight against her legs, like the drapery of the peace figure in the Sherman statue at the plaza. Across that Artemis-like bosom, her thin waist was stretched tight. She had no hat on, and her pale gold hair, which had been braided and twisted up into a heavy crown, had the sheen of metal on it in the latter afternoon sun. And in that clear glow of light, which so often plays mirage-like tricks with vision, she loomed up like a demigod or a she-Mercury who ought to have little bicycle wheels attached to her heels. Piercy is never demonstrative, but I could see that he was more than impressed. He was amazed. My word, he said very quietly. What does she make you think of? I demanded. Piercy put down his teacup. Don't go away, I commanded, but tell me what she makes you think of. He stood still, staring at her with puckered-up eyes. She's like band music going by, he proclaimed. No, she's more than that. She's Wagner on wheels, he finally said. No, not that. A Norse myth in dimity. I told him it wasn't dimity, but he was too interested in Olga to listen to me. Half an hour later, when she met him, she was very shy. She turned an adorable pink and then calmly rebuttoned the top two buttons of her waist 
which had been hanging loose. And I noticed that Piercy did precisely what I saw Dinky Dunk once doing. He sat staring absently, yet studiously, at the milky white column of Olga's neck. And I had to speak to him twice before he even woke up to the fact that he was being addressed by his hostess. Wednesday the 15th. Dinky Dunk is back and very busy again. During the day, I scarcely get a glimpse of him, except at mealtimes. I have a steadily growing sense of being neglected, but I know how a worried man hates petulance. The really important thing is that Piercy is giving Olga lessons in reading and writing. For, although a Finn, she is a Canadian Finn from almost the shadow of the subarctics and has had little chance for education. But her mind is not obtuse. Yesterday, I asked Olga what she thought of Percival Benson. A la Kim, she calmly admitted in her majestic, monosyllabic way. He is a funny little man. And the funny little man, who isn't really little, seems to like Olga odd as it may sound. They are such opposites, such contradictions. Piercy says she's Homeric. He says he's never saw eyes that were so limpid or such pools of peace and calm. He insists on the fact that she's essentially maternal, as maternal as the soil over which she walks, as Piercy put it. I told him what Dinky Dunk once told me about Olga killing a bull. The bull was a vicious brute, that had attacked her father and knocked him down. He was striking at the fallen man with his forepaws when Olga heard his cries. She promptly came for that bull with a pitchfork. And speaking of Homer, it must have been a pretty epical battle, for she killed the bull and left the fork tines eight inches in his body while she picked up her father and carried him back to the house. And I won't even kill my own hens, but have always appointed Oli as the executioner. Friday the 17th. It is funny to see Piercy teaching Olga. She watches him as though he were a miracle man. Her dewy red lips form the words slowly, and the full white throat utters them largely laboriously, instruments on them, and perhaps in some uncouth way makes them lovely. I sit with my sewing, listening. Sometimes I open the piano and play, but I feel out of it. I seem to be on the fringe of things that are monumentous only to other people. Last night, when Piercy said he thought he'd sell his ranch, Dinky Dunk looked up from his paper-littered desk and told him to hang on to that land like a leech. But he didn't explain why. Saturday the 19th. I can't even remember the date, but I know that midsummer is here that the men folks are so busy I have to shift for myself, and that talk is still of wheat, and how it's heading, and how the dry weather of the last few weeks will affect the length of the straw. Dinky Dunk is making desperate efforts to get men to cut wild hay. He's bought the hay rights of a large stretch between the sloughs about seven miles east of our place. He says men are scarcer than hen's teeth, but has the promise of a couple of cutthroats who were thrown off a freight train near Buckhorn. Piercy volunteered to help and was convinced of the fact that he could drive a mower. Oli, who nurses a vast contempt for Piercy and, I secretly believe, rather resents his attentions to Olga, put the new team of colts on the mower. They promptly ran away with Piercy, who came within an ace of being thrown in front of the mower knife which would have chopped him up into very unscholarly mincemeat. Olga got on the horse, bareback, and rounded up the colts. Then she cooed about poor bruised Piercy and tried to coax him to come to the house. But Piercy said he was going to drive that team even if he had to be strapped to the mower seat. And oddly enough, he did get down beat, as Olga expressed it. But it tired him out and wilted his collar and the sweat was running down his face when he came in at noon. Olga was very proud of him, but she announced that she'd drive the mower herself and sailed into Oli for giving a tenderfoot a team like that to drive. It was her first outburst. I couldn't understand a word she said, but I know that she was magnificent. 
she looked like a statue of justice that had suddenly jumped off its pedestal and was doing its best to put a Daniel Webster out of business. Friday the 28th. The weather is still very dry, but Dinky Dunk feels sure it will not affect his crop. He says the filaments of a wheat plant will go almost two feet deep in search for moisture. Yesterday, Piercy appeared in a flannel shirt and without his glasses. I think he's secretly practicing calisthenics. He says he's going to cut out this afternoon tea because it doesn't seem to fit in with prairie life. I fancy I see the re-barbarianized influence of Olga at work on Percival Benson Woodhouse. Either Dinky Dunk or Oli, I find, has hidden my saddle. Saturday the 29th. Today has been one of the hottest days of the year. It may be good for the wheat, but I can't say that it seems good for me. All day long I've been fretting for faraway things, for foolish and impossible things. I tried reading Keats, but that only made me worse than ever. I've been longing for a glimpse of the Luxembourg Gardens in spring, with all the horse chestnuts in bloom. I've been wondering how lovely it would be to drift into the blue grotto at Capri and see the azure seawater drip from the trailing boat oars. I've been burning with a hunger to see a New England orchard in the slanting afternoon sunlight of an early June afternoon. The hot white light of this open country makes my eyes ache and seems to dry up my soul. I can't help thinking of cool green shadows and musky little valleys of gloom with a brook purling over mossy stones. I long for the solemn greenery of great elms, aisles and aisles of cathedral-like gloom and leaf-filtered sunlight. I'd love to hear an English cuckoo again and feel the soft, mild sea air that blows up through Louis's dear little Devonshire garden. But what's the use? I went to the piano and pounded out Kunst du das Land with all my soul, and I imagined it did me good. It at least bombarded the silence out of Casa Grande. The noise of life is so far away from you on the prairie. It is not utterly silent, just that dreamy and disembodied sigh of the wind and grass, against which a human call targets like a laden bullet against metal. It is almost worse than silence. End of section 19Section 20 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Sunday, the 30th. My mood is over. Early, early this morning, I slipped out of bed and watched daybreak. I saw the first faint orange rim along the limitless skyline, and then the pearly pink above it and all the sweet dimness and softness and mystery of God's hand pulling the curtains of morning apart, and then the rioting orchestras of colors struck up, and I leaned out of the window, bathed in glory, as the golden disk of the sun showed over the dewy prairie edge. Oh, the grandeur of it, and oh, the God-given freshness of that pellucid air. I love my land. I love it. Tuesday the 1st. I have married a man. My dinky dunk is not a softie. I had that proved to me yesterday when I put Patty in the buckboard and drove out to where the men were working in the hay. I was taking their dinner out to them, neatly packed in the chuck box. One of the new men, who had been hired for the rush, had been overworking his team. The brute had been prodding them with a pitchfork instead of using a whip. Dinky Dunk saw the marks and noticed one of the horses bleeding, but he didn't interfere until he caught the man in the act of jabbing the tines into Maid Marian's flank. Then he jumped for him, just as I drove up. He cursed that man, cursed and damned him most dreadfully, and pulled him down off a hayrack. Then they fought. They fought like two wildcats. 
Dinky Dunk's nose bled, and his lip was cut, but he knocked that other man flat, and when he tried to get up, he knocked him again. It seemed cruel, it was revolting, but something in me rejoiced and exalted as I saw that hulk of an animal thresh and stagger about the hay stubble. I tried to wipe the blood away from Dinky Dunk's nose, but he pushed me back and said this was no place for a woman. I had no place in his universe at that particular time, but Dinky Dunk can fight, if he has to. He's sa migerful a mon. He is afraid of nothing. But that was nearly a costly victory. Both the new men, of course, threw up their jobs, then and there. Dinky Dunk paid them off on the spot, and they started off across the open prairie, without even waiting for their meal. Dinky Dunk, as we sat down on the dry grass and ate together, said it was a good riddance, and he was just saying I could have only the left-hand side of his mouth to kiss for the next week when he suddenly dropped his piece of custard pie, stood up, and stared toward the east. I did the same, wondering what had happened. I could see a long, thin, slanting column of smoke driving across the hot noonday air. Then my heart stopped beating. It was the prairie on fire. I had heard a great deal about fire guards and fire guarding, three rows about crops and ten about buildings, and I knew that Oli hadn't yet finished turning those essential furrows. That column of smoke, which was swinging up through the silvery haze where the indigo vault of heaven melted into the dusty whiteness of the parched grasslands, had come from the mouth of a siege gun which was cannoning us where we stood, it couldn't have more completely chilled my blood. For I knew that that east wind would carry the line of fire crackling across the prairie floor to Dinky Dunk's wheat, to the stables and outbuildings, to Casa Grande itself, and all our scheming and planning and toiling and moiling would go up in one yellow puff of smoke, and once underway, nothing could stop that widening river of flame. It was Dinky Dunk who jumped to life as though he had indeed been cannonaded. In one bound, he was at the buckboard and was snatching out the horse blanket that lay folded up under the seat. Then he unsnapped the reins from Patty's bridle, snapping them on the blanket, one to the buckle and the other to the strap end. In another minute, he had the hobble off Patty and had swung me up on that astonished Pinto's back. The next minute, he himself was on Maid Marian, poking one end of the long rein into my hand and telling me to keep up with him. We rode like mad. I scarcely understood what it meant at the time, but at least I kept up with him. We went floundering through one end of a slough until the blanket was wet and heavy and I could hardly hold it. But I hung on for dear life. Then we swung off across the dry grass toward that advancing semicircle of fire as far apart as the taunt reins would let us ride. Dinky Dunk took the windward side. Then on we rushed along that wavering frontier of flame, neck to neck, dragging the wet blanket along its orange-tinted crest flattening it down and wiping it out as we went. We made the full circle, panting, saw there were flames that had broken out again and swung back with our dragging blanket. But when one side was conquered, another side would revive, and we'd have to go again until my arm felt as though it was going to be pulled out of its socket. But we won that fight in the end. I slipped down off of Patty's back and lay full length on the sod, weak, shaking, wondering why the solid ground was rocking slowly from side to side like a boat. But Dinky Dunk didn't even observe me. He was fighting out the last patch of fire on foot. When he came over to where I was waiting for him, he was as sooty and black as a boilermaker. He dropped down beside me, breathing hard. We sat there holding each other's hand for several minutes in utter silence. Then he said rather thickly, Are you all right? And I told him that of course I was all right. Then he said without looking at me, I forgot. Then he got Patty and patched up the harness and took me home in the buckboard. 
But all the rest of the day he hung about the shack, as solemn as an owl. And once in the night he got up and lighted the lamp and came over and studied my face. I blinked up at him sleepily, for I was dog-tired and had been dreaming that we were back in Paris at the Bol de Quezat, and we were about to finish up with an early breakfast at the Madrid. He looked so funny with his rumpled-up hair and his faded pajamas that I couldn't help laughing a little as he blew out the light and got back into bed. Dinky-dunk, I said as I turned over my pillow and got comfy again. Wouldn't it have been hell if all our wheat had been burned up? I forgot what Duncan said, for in two minutes I was asleep again. Monday the 7th The dry spell has been broken, and broken with a vengeance. One gets pretty well used to the high winds in the West. There used to be days at a time that that unending high wind would make me think something was going to happen filling me with a vague sense of impending calamity and making me imagine a big storm was going to blow up and wipe Casa Grande and its little cotri off the map. But we've had a real windstorm this time, with rain and hail. Dinky Dunk's wheat looks sadly draggled out and beaten down, but he says there wasn't enough hail to hurt anything, that the straw will straighten up again, and that this downpour was just what he wanted. Early in the afternoon, on looking out the shack door, I saw a tangle of clouds on the skyline. They seemed twisted up, like a skein of wool a kitten had been playing with. Then they seemed to marshal themselves into one solid line and sweep up over the sky, getting blacker and blacker as they came. Olga ran in with her yellow hair flying, slamming and bolting the stable doors, locking the chicken coop, and calling out for me to get my clothes off the line or they'd be blown to pieces. Even then I could feel the wind. It whipped my own loose hair and flattened my skirts against my body. I had to lean forward to make any advance against it. By this time, the black army of the heavens had rolled up overhead, and a few big frog-like drops of rain began to fall, throwing up little clouds of dust as a rifle bullet might. I trundled out a couple of tubs in the hopes of catching a little soft water. It wasn't until later I realized the meaning of Olga's mild stare of reproof. For the next moment the downpour came, and with it the wind and such wind. There had been nothing to stop its sweep, of course, for hundreds and hundreds of miles, and it hit us the same as a hurricane at sea hits a liner. The shack shook with the force of it. My two wash tubs went bounding and careening off across the landscape, and the chicken coop went over like a nine pin, and the air was filled with bits of flying timber. Olga's wagon, with the hay rack on top of it, moved solemnly and ponderously across the barnyard and crashed into the corral, propelled by no power but that of the wind. My sweet pea hedges were torn from their vines, and an armful of hay came smack against the shack window and was held there by the wind, darkening the room more than ever. The storm blew itself out, though it poured for two or three hours afterward. And all the while, Although I exulted in the play of elemental force, I was worrying about my dinky dunk, who was away for the day, doing what he could to arrange for some harvest hands when the time for cutting came. For the wheat, it seems, ripens all at once. And then the grand rush begins. If it isn't cut the moment it's ripe, the grain shells out, and that means loss. Olga has been saying that the wheat on the common section will easily run 40 bushels to the acre and over. It will also grade high, whatever that means. There are 640 acres of it in that section, and I've just figured out that this means a little over 25,000 bushels of grain. Our other piece on the home range is a larger tract, but a little lighter in crop. That wheat is just beginning to turn from green to the palest of yellow, and it has a good show, Olga says, if frost will only keep off and no hail comes. Our one occupation for the next few weeks will be watching the weather. 
Sunday the 13th. Piercy and Mrs. Watson drove over to see how we'd all weathered the storm. They found the chicken coop once more right side up and everything shipshape. Piercy promptly asked where Olga was. I pointed her out to him, breast high in the growing wheat. She looked like Ceres in her big new loose-fitting blue waist, with the noonday sun on her yellow gold head and her mild, ruminative eyes with their misted skyline effect. She always seems to fit into the landscape here. I suppose it's because she's a born daughter of the soil, and a sea of wheat makes a perfect frame for that massive, bignative figure of hers. I looked at Piercy, at thin-nosed, unpractical Piercy, with all his finicky sensibilities, with his high, fastidious reticies, with his effete, inbred meagerness of bone and sinew, with his distinguished pride of distinguished race rather running to seed. And I stood marveling at the wisdom of Mother Nature, who was so plainly propelling him towards this revitalizing, revivifying, reanimalizing, redeeming type, which his pale austerities of spirit could never quite neutralize. Even Dinky Dunk has noticed what is taking place he saw them standing side by side in the grain. When he came in, he pointed them out to me and merely said, Hermann und Dorthea. But I remembered my Goethe well enough to understand. End of section 20。Section 21 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Monday, the 28th. I woke Dinky Dunk up last night, crying beside him in bed. I just got to thinking about things again. How far we are away from everything, how hard it will be to get help if we need it, and how much I'd give if I only had you, Matilda Ann, for the next few weeks. I got up and went to the window and looked out. The moon was big and yellow like a cheese, and the midnight prairie itself seemed so big and wide and lonely, and I seemed such a tiny speck on its face, so far away from everyone, from God himself, that the courage went out of my body like the air out of a tire. Dinky Dunk was right. It is life that is taming me. I stood at the window praying, and then I slipped back into bed. Dinky Dunk works so hard and gets so tired that it would take a Chinese devil gong to awaken him once he's asleep. He did not stir when I crept back into bed, and that, as I lay there wide awake, made me feel that even my own husband had betrayed me. And I bawled. I must have shaken the bed, for Dinky Dunk finally did wake up. I couldn't tell him what was the matter. I blubbered out that I only wanted him to hold me. He took me in his arms and kissed my wet eyelids, hugging me up close to him until I got quieter. Then I fell asleep. But poor Dinky Dunk was awake when I opened my eyes about four and had been that way for hours. He was afraid of disturbing me by taking his arm from under my head. Today he looks tired and dark around the eyes, but he was up and off early. There is so much to be done these days. He's putting up a grub tent and a rough sleeping shack for the harvest hands, so I won't be bothered with a lot of rough men about the house here. I'm afraid I'm an encumbrance when I should be helping, but they seem to be taking everything out of my hands. Saturday the 2nd I love to watch the wheat now that it's really turning. It waves like a sea and stretches off into the distance as far as the eye can follow it. It's as high as my waist, and sometimes it moves up and down like a slowly breathing beast. When the sun is low, it turns it pure Roman gold and makes my eyes ache. But I love it. It strikes me as being glorious and at the same time pathetic, I scarcely know why. I can't analyze my feelings. 
but the prairie brings a great peace to my soul. It is so rich, so maternal, so generous. It seems to brood under a passion to give, to yield up, to surrender all that is asked of it. And it is so tranquil. It seems like a bosom breathed on by the breath of God. Wednesday the 6th It is nearly a year now since I first came to Casa Grande. I can scarcely believe it. The nights are getting very cool again, and any time now there may be a heavy frost. If it should freeze this next week or two, I think my dinky dunk would just curl up and die. Poor boy, he's working so hard. I pray for that crop every night. I worry about it. Last night I dreamt it was burned up in a prairie fire and woke up screaming for wet blankets. Dinky Dunk had to hold me until I got quiet again. I asked him if he loved me, now that I was getting old and ugly. He said I was the most beautiful thing God ever made and that he loved me in a deeper and nobler way than he did a year ago. Then I asked him if he'd ever get married again, if I should die. He called me silly and said I was going to live to be 80 and that a gasoline tractor couldn't kill me. But he promised I'd be the only one, whatever happened. And I believe him. I know Dinky Dunk would go in black for a solid year if I should die. And he'd never, never marry again. For he's the sort of old sober sides who can only love one woman in one lifetime. And I'm the woman. Glory be. Tuesday, the 12th. Harvest time is here. The stage is cleared. And the last and great act of the drama now begins. It's a drama with a stage a thousand miles wide. I can hear through the open window the rattle of the self-binders. Olga is driving one, like a tawny Bodica up on her chariot. She said she never saw such heads of wheat. This is the first day's cutting, but those flapping canvas belts and those tireless arms of wood and iron won't have one-tenth of Dinky Dunk's crop tied up by midnight. It is very cold, and Oli has lugubriously announced that it's sure going to freeze. So three times I've gone out to look at the thermometer, and three times I've said my solemn little prayer— Dear God, please don't freeze poor Dinky Dunk's wheat. And the Lord heard that prayer, for a Chinook came about two o'clock in the morning, and the mercury slowly but steadily rose. Thursday, the 14th. I had a great deal to talk about today, but I can't write much, I'm afraid. I dread being alone. I wish I'd been a better wife to my poor old gold brick Dinky Dunk, but we are what we are, character kinks and all, so when he understands, perhaps he'll forgive me. I'm like a cotton tail in the middle of a wheat patch, with the binders going round and round, and every swath cutting away a little more of my covering. And there can't be much more hiding away with my secret, but I shall never openly speak of it. The binder can cut off my feet first. The same as Oli did with that mother rabbit which stood trembling over her nest of young. Why must life sometimes be so ruthlessly tragic? And why, oh why, are women sometimes so absurd? And why should I be afraid of what every woman, who would justify her womanhood, must face? Still, I'm afraid. Wednesday the 5th Three long weeks since those last words were written, and what shall I say, or how shall I begin? In the first place, everything seemed gray. The bed was gray, my own arms were gray, the walls looked gray, the window glass was gray, and even Dinky Dunk's face was gray. I didn't want to move for a long time. Then I got the strength to tell Mrs. Watson that I wanted to speak to my husband. She was wrapping something up in a soft flannel and purring over it quite proudly and calling it a blessed little lamb. 
When poor pale-faced Dinky Dunk bent over the bed, I asked him if it had a receding chin or if it had a nose like Oli's, and he said it had neither, that it was a king of a boy and could holler like a good one. Then I told Dinky Dunk what had been in my secret soul for so many months. Uncle Carlton had a receding chin, a boneless, dewlappy sort of chin I'd always hated, and I'd been afraid it might kind of slip and carry one and fasten itself on my innocent offspring. Then later on, I'd been afraid of Oli's frozen nose, with the split down the center. And all the while, I kept remembering what the Morley's old colored nurse had said to me when I was a schoolgirl, a girl of only 17, spending that first vacation of mine in Virginia. Lordy, child, you ain't no bigger in a minute. Don't you never have no baby, child. Isn't it funny how those foolish old things stick in a woman's memory? For I've had my baby, and I'm still alive. And although I sometimes wanted a girl, Dinky Dunk is so ridiculously proud and happy seeing it's a boy that I don't much care. But I'm going to get well and strong in a few more days, and here against my breast I'm holding the God-lovest little lump of pulsing manhood, the darlingest, solemnest, placidest, pinkest hope of the white race that ever made life full and perfect for a foolish mother. The doctor, who finally got here, when both Olga and Mrs. Dixon agreed that he couldn't possibly do a bit of good, announced that I had come through it, all like the true prairie woman that I was. Then he somewhat pompously and redundantly explained that I was a highly organized individual, a bit high-strung, as Miss Dixon put it. I smiled into the pillow when he turned to my anxious-eyed Dinky Dunk and condoningly enlarged on the fact that there was nothing abnormal about a woman like me being, well, rather abnormal as to temper and nerves during the last few months. But Dinky Dunk cut him short. On the contrary, sir, she's been wonderful, simply wonderful, Dinky Dunk stoutly declared. Then he reached for my hand under the coverlet. She's been an angel. I squeezed the hand that held mine. Then I looked at the doctor, who turned away to give some orders to Olga. Doctor, I quite stoutly declared, I've been a perfect devil, and this dear old liar knows it. But our doctor was too busy to pay much attention to what I was saying. He merely murmured that it was all normal, quite normal, under the circumstances. So, after all, I'm just an ordinary, everyday woman. But the man of medicine has ordered me to stay in bed for 12 days, which Olga regards as unspeakably preposterous, since one day, she proudly announced, was all her mother ever asked for, which shows the disadvantages of being too civilized. Sunday, the 9th. I'm day by day getting stronger, though I'm a lady of luxury and lay in bed until almost ten every morning. Today, when I was sitting up to eat breakfast, with my hair braided in two tails and a pink and white hug me tight over my nightie, Dinky Dunk came in and sat by the bed. He tried to soft soap me by saying he'd be mighty glad when I was running things again so he could get something fit to eat. Olga, he admitted, was all right, but she hadn't the touch of his Gigi. He confessed that for nearly a month now, the house had been a damp grinocracy, and he was getting tired of being bossed around by a couple of women. Mio Piccino no longer looks like a littered whelp of the animal world, as he did at first. His wrinkled little face and his closed eyes used to make me think of a little old man with all the wisdom of the ages shut up in his tiny body. And it is such a knowing little body, with all its stored-up instincts and guardian appetites. My little tenor robusto, how he can sing when he's hungry. Last night I sat up in bed, listening for my son's, Dinky Dunk's, breathing. At first I thought he might be dead. He was so quiet. Then I heard his lips move in the rhapsodic deglutition of babyland dreams. 
Dinky Dunk, I demanded, what would we do if Babe should die? And I shook him to make him answer. He stared up at me with a sleepy eye. That whale? He commented as he blinked contentedly down at his offspring and then turned over and went to sleep. But I slipped a hand under little Dinky Dunk's body and found it as warm as a nesting bird. Monday the 10th. I noticed that Dinky Dunk has not been smoking lately, so I asked him what had become of the rest of his cigars. He admitted that he'd given them to Oli. When? I asked. And Dinky Dunk colored up as he answered rather casually, Oh, the day Buddy Boy was born. How men merge down into the conventional in their more epochal moments. The second day after my baby's birth, Olga rather took my breath away by carrying in as neat a little wooden cradle as any prince of the royal blood would care to lie in. Oli had made it. He had worked on it during his spare hours in the evening. And even Dinky Dunk hadn't known. I made Olga hold it up at the foot of the bed so I could see it better. It had been scroll sawed and sandpapered and polished, like any factory-made baby bed. And my faithful old Oli had even attempted some hand carving along the rockers and the headboard. But as I looked at it, I realized that it must have taken weeks and weeks to make. And that gave me an odd little earthquakey feeling in the neighborhood of the Midrift, for I knew then that my secret had been no secret at all. Dinky Dunk, by the way, has just announced that we're to have a touring car. He says I've earned it. Tuesday, the 11th. Yesterday was so warm that I sat out in the sun and took an ozone bath. I sat there staring down at my boy, realizing that I was a mother. My boy. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. It's so hard to believe. And now I am one of the mysterious chain and no longer an idle link. I am a mother. And I'd give an arm if you and Chinky and Schemin' Jack could see my boy at this moment. He's like a rose leaf, and he's got six dimples, not counting his hands and feet, for I've found and kissed them all on different parts of his blessed little body. Dinky Dunk came back from Buckhorn yesterday with a lot of the foolishest things you've ever clapped eyes on. A big cloth elephant that grunts when you pull its tail, a musical spinning top, a high chair, and a projecting lantern. They're for Dinky Dunk, of course, but it will be a week or two before he can manipulate the lantern. Wednesday the 13th. Dinky Dunk has taken Mrs. Dixon home and come back with a brand new hand, which of course is Prairie Land Syndicate for New Hired Man. His name is Terry Dillon, and as that name might lead you to imagine, he's about as Irish as Patty's pig. He is blessed with a potato lip, a buttermilk brogue, and a nose which, if he follows it faithfully, will someday lead him straight to heaven. But Terry, Dinky Dunk tells me, is a steady worker and a good man with horses, and that, of course, rounds him out as a paragon in the eyes of my slave-driven lord and master. I asked where Terry came from. Dinky Dunk, with a rather grim smile, acknowledged that he'd been working for Piercy. Terry, it seems, has no particular love for an Englishman, and Piercy had affronted his howdy Irish spirit with certain ideas of caste, which can't be imported into the Canadian West— where the hired man is every whit as good as his master, as that master will tragically soon find out if he tries to make his help eat at second table. At any rate, Piercy and Potato Lip Terry developed friction, which ended up in every promise of a fight. Only Dinky Dunk arrived in the nick of time and took Terry off his harassed neighbor's hands. I told him he had rather a habit of catching people on the bounce, but I am reserving my opinion of Terry Dillon. We are a happy family here, and I want no troublemakers in my neighborhood. I have been studying some of the New York magazines, going rather hungrily through their advertisements, 
where such lovely layettes are described. My poor little dinky dunks things are so plain and rough and meager. I envy those city mothers with all those beautiful linens and laces. But my little Spartan man-child has never known a single day's sickness, and some day he'll show em. End of section 21「of the Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Thursday the 14th. When Oli came in after dinner yesterday, I asked him where my husband was. Oli, after some hesitation, admitted that he was out in the stable. I asked just what Dinky Dunk was doing there for I noticed that after each meal he slipped silently away. Again, Oli hesitated. Then he finally admitted that he thought maybe my lord was out there smoking. So I went out, and there I found my poor old dinky dunk sitting on a grain box, puffing gloomily away at his old pipe. For a minute or two he didn't see me, so I went right over to him. What does this mean? I demanded. Why? He rather guiltily equivocated. Why are you smoking out here? I, er, I rather thought you might think it wouldn't be good for the boy. He looked pathetic as he said that. I don't know why, though I loved him for it. He made me think of a king who'd been dethroned, an outsider, a man without a home. It brought a lump into my throat. I wormed my way up close to him on the grain box so that he had to hold me to keep from falling off the end. Listen to me, I commanded. You are my true love, my kiakobod, and my man-god, and my soulmate. And no baby is ever going to come between me and you. You shouldn't say such awful things, he declared, but he did it only half-heartedly. But I want you to sit and smoke with me. Beloved, the same as you always did, I told him. We can leave the windows open a little, and it won't hurt, Dinky Dink, for that boy gets more ozone than any city child that was ever wheeled out in the mall. It can't possibly hurt him. What hurts me is being away from you so much. And now give me a hug, a tight one, and tell me that you still love your ladybird. He gave me two, and then two more until Tumbleweed turned around in his stall and whinnied for us to behave. Friday the 15th I've been keeping Terry under my eye, and I don't believe he's a troublemaker. His first move was to lift Babe out of the cradle, hold him up, and publicly announce that he was a darling. Then he pointed out to me what a wonderful head the child had, feeling his frontal bone and declaring he was sure to make a great scholar in his time. Dinky Dunk, grinning at the sober way in which I was swallowing this, pointedly inquired of Terry whether it was Milton or Archimedes that Babe most resembled as to skull formation. But it isn't Terry's blarney that has made me capitulate. It's the fact that he has proved so companionable and has slipped so quietly into his place in our little lonely circle of lives on this ragged edge of nowhere. And he's as clean as a cat, shaving every blessed morning with a little broken-handled razor which he strops on a strip of oiled bootleg. He declares that razor to be the finest bit of steel in all the Americas, and showed off before Oli and Olga yesterday morning by shaving without a looking-glass, which trick he said he learned in the army. He also gave Oli a haircut, which was badly needed. On Sunday, he promised to rig up a soldering iron and mend all my pots for me. He looks a little over 20, but is really 30 or more, and has been to India and Mexico and Alaska. I caught him neatly darning his own woolen socks. Instead of betraying shame at being detected in that effeminate pastime, he proudly explained that he'd learned to do a bit of stitching in the army. He hasn't many possessions, but he is very neat in his arrangement of them. A good soldier, he solemnly told me, always had to be a bit of an old maid. 
And you were a grand soldier, Terry, I know. I frankly told him. I've done a bit of killing in me time, he proudly acknowledged. But he sat there darning his sock heel and looked as though he couldn't kill a field mouse. And in his idle hours, he reads Nick Carter, a series of paper-bound detective stories, almost worn to tatters, which he is going through for the second or third time. These adventures, I find, he later recounts to Oli, who is slowly but surely succumbing to the poison of the penny dreadful and the virus of the shilling shocker. I even caught Dinky Dunk sitting over one of these blood-curdling romances the other night, though he laughed a little as I dragged him off to bed at the absurdity of the situations. Terry's eyes lighted up when he saw my books and magazines. When I told him he could take anything he wanted, he beamed and said it would sure be a glorious winter he'd be having with all that book reading when the long nights came. But before those long nights are over, I'm going to try to pilot Terry into the channels of respectable literature. Continuation of Section 22 Read by Lori Banza Saturday the 16th I love the milky smell of my dinky dink better than the perfume of any flower that ever grew. He's so strong now that he can almost lift himself up by his two little hands. At least he can really and actually give a little pull. Two days ago, our touring car arrived. It is a beauty. It skims over these smooth prairie trails like a yacht. From now on, we can run into Buckhorn, do our shopping, and run out again inside of two or three hours. We can also reach the larger towns without trouble, and it will be so much easier to gather up what we need for Casa Grande. Dinky Dink seems to love the car. Ten minutes after we have started out, he is always fast asleep. Olga, who holds him in the back seat when I get tired, sits in rapt and silent bliss as we rock along at 30 miles an hour. And no wonder, for it's the next best thing to sailing out on the briny deep. I can't help thinking of Terry's attitude toward Olga. He doesn't actively dislike her, but he quietly ignores her, even more so than Oli does. I've been wondering why neither of them has succumbed to such physical grandeur. Perhaps it's because they're physical themselves. And then I think her largeness oppresses Terry, for no man, whether he's been a soldier or not, likes to be overtopped by a woman. The one exception, of course, is Percy. But Percy is a man of imagination. He can realize that Olga is more than a mere type. He agrees with me that she's a sort of miracle. To Terry, she's only a mute and muscular finished servant girl with an arm like a grenadier. To Percy, she is a goddess made manifest, a superhuman body of superhuman vigor and beauty and at the same time, a body crowned with majesty and robed in mystery. And I still incline to Percy's opinion. Olga is always wonderful to me. Her lips are such a soft and melting red, the red of perfect animal health. The very milkiness of her skin is an advertisement of that queenly and all-conquering vitality, which lifts her so above the ordinary ruck of humanity. And her great ruminative eyes are as clear and limpid as any woodland pool. She blushes rose color sometimes when Percy comes in. I think he finds a secret joy in sensing that reaction in anything so colossal. But he defends himself behind that mask of cool and personality, which is the last attribute of the mental aristocrat, no matter what his feelings may be. His attitude toward Terry, by the way, is a remarkably companionable one in view of the fact of their earlier contentions. They can let bygones be bygones and talk and smoke and laugh together. It is Terry, if anyone, who is just a wee bit condescending. 
And I imagine that it is the aura of Olga which has brought about this oddly democratizing condition of affairs. She seems to give a new relationship to things, softening a point here and illuminating a point there as quietly as moonlight itself can do. Monday the 17th Yesterday, Olga carried home a whole pailful of mushrooms, for an Indian summer seems to have brought on a second crop of them. They were lovely but she refused to eat any. I asked her why. She heaved her huge shoulders and said she didn't know. But she does, I feel sure. And I've been wondering why she's afraid of anything that can taste so good once they are creamed and heaped on a square toast. As for me, I love them, I love them. And who shall dare to chide me for loving that mushroom fair? Wednesday the 19th. I found myself singing for all I was worth as I did my work this morning. Dinky Dunk came and stood in the door and said it sounded like old times. I feel strong again and have ventured to ask my lord and master if I couldn't have the weentiest gallop on Patty once more. But he's made me promise to wait for a week or two. The last two or three nights have been quite cold, and away off, miles and miles across the prairie, we can see the glow of fires where different ranchers are burning their straw after the windstackers have blown it from the threshing machines. Sometimes it burns all night long. End of section 22. Section 23 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Friday the 21st. I have this morning found out why Olga won't eat mushrooms. It was very cold again last night for this time of year. Percy came over and we had a ripping fire and popped Ontario popcorn with Ontario maple syrup poured over it. Olga, Oli, and Terry all came in and sat about the stove, and being absolutely happy and contented and satisfied with life in general, we promptly fell into talking horrors, the same as a cook stirs lemon juice into her pudding sauce, I suppose, to keep its sweetness from being too cloying. That revel in the bypaths of the Poesque began with Dinky Dunk's casual reference to the McKinnon Ranch and Piercy's inquiry as to why its earlier owner had given it up. So Dinky Dunk recounted the story of Andrew Cochran's death, and it was noticeable that poor old Oli betrayed visible signs of distress at this tale of a young ranchman being frozen to death alone in his shack in midwinter. So Dinky Dunk, apparently with malice prepense, enlarged on his theme, describing how all young Cochran's stock had starved in their stalls and how his coley dog, which had been chained to a kennel box outside the shack, had first drawn attention to the tragedy. A government inspector, in riding past, had noticed the shut-up shack, had pounded on the door, and had promptly discovered the skeleton of the dog with the chain and collar still attached to the clean-picked neck bones. And inside the shack, he had found the dead man himself, as lifelike, because of the intense cold, as though he had fallen asleep the night before. It was not a pleasant story, and my efforts to picture the scene gave me rather a bristly feeling along the pinfeather area of my anatomy, and again undoubted signs of distress were manifest in poor Oli. The face of that simple-souled Swede took on such a look of wondering trouble that Dinky Dunk deliberately, and at great detail, told of a ghost that had been reportedly seen in an abandoned wickiup a little further west in the province. And that, of course, fired the Celtic soul of Terry, who told of the sister of his old country master who had once been taken to a hospital. And just at dusk, on the third day after that, his young master was walking down the dark hall. As he passed his sister's door, there she stood, all in white, 
quietly brushing her hair, as plain as day to his eyes. And with that, the master rushed downstairs to his mother asking how Sheila got back from the hospital. And his old mother, being slow of movements, started for Sheila's room. But before she could so much as reach the foot of the stairs, a neighbor woman came running in, wiping her eyes with her shawl end and saying, Poor Sheila died this minute over at the hospital. I can't tell it as Terry told it, and I don't know whether he himself believed it or not, but the huge bulk of Ole Larson sat there bathed in a fine sweat, with his eyes fixed on the stove front. He was by no means happy, and yet he seemed unable to tear himself away, just as Gimlet's and I used to sit chained to the spot while Grandfather Hempelwhite continued to intone the dolorous history of the babes in the woods until our ultimate and inevitable collapse into tears. So Piercy, who is not without his spirit of ragging, told several whoppers, which he later confessed came from the Society of Psychical Research Records, and I huskily recounted Uncle Carlton's story of the neurasthenic lady patient who went into a doctor's office and there beheld a skull standing on his polished rosewood desk. Then, as she sat staring at it, this skull started to move slowly toward her. It later turned out to be only a plaster of Paris paperweight, and a mouse had got inside it and found a piece of cracker there. And a cracker? I had to explain to Piercy, was the name under which a biscuit usually masqueraded in America. That mouse, in its efforts to get the last of that cracker, had, of course, shifted the skull along the polished wood. This reminded Dinky Dunk of the three medical students who had tried to frighten their landlady's daughter by smuggling an arm from the dissecting room and hiding it under the girl's pillow. Dinky Dunk even solemnly avowed that the three men were college chums of his. They waited to hear the girls scream, but there was nothing but silence. They finally stole into the room, and there they saw the girl sitting on the floor, holding the arm in her hands. As she sat there, she was mumbling to herself and eating one end of it. Of course, the poor thing had gone stark raving mad. Ole groaned audibly at this and wiped his forehead with his coat sleeve. But before he could get away, Terry started to tell of the four-bottle Irish sea captain, who was sober only when at sea, and one night in port stumbled up to bed three sheets in the wind. When he had navigated into what he thought was his own room, he was astounded to find a man already in bed there, and even drunker than he himself. Too drunk, in fact, to move and even the candles had been left burning. But the old captain climbed over next to the wall, clothes and all, and would have been fast asleep in two minutes if two stout ladies hadn't come in and started to cry and say a prayer or two at the side of the bed. Thereupon, the old captain, muddled as he was, quietly but inquisitively reached over and touched the man beside him, and that man was cold as ice. The captain gave one howl and made for the door, but the old ladies went first. They all rolled down the stairs, one after the other, and the three of them up and ran like the wind. And nearest once did they stop, declared the broke-mouthing Terry, till they leapt flat against the seawall. Ole, who had moved away to the far end of the table, got up at this point and went to the door and looked out. He sighed lugubriously as he stared into the darkness of the night. The outer gloom apparently was too much for him as he came slowly and reluctantly back to his chair at the far end of the table, and it was plain to see that he was as frightened as a five-year-old child. The men, I suppose, would have badgered him until midnight, for Terry had begun a story of a Negro who had been sent to rob a grave and found the dead man not quite dead. But I declared that we'd had enough horrors and declined to hear anything more about either ghosts or debtors. I was, in fact, getting a wee bit creepy along the nerve ends myself. And Babe whimpered a little in his cradle and brought us all suddenly back from the Wendigo age to the time of the kerosene lamp. Fra witches and warlocks, I solemnly atoned. 
fra whirlicoos and evil spirits, and fra a furly things that whelp and gang bump in the night. God, Lord, deliver us. And that incantation, I feel sure, cleared the air for both my own spirit-threatened offspring and for the simple-minded Oli himself, although Dinky Dunk explained that my scotch was rather worse than the stories. But it was this morning, after breakfast, that I learned from Olga why she never cared to eat mushrooms. And all day long, her story has been hanging between me and the sun, like a cloud. Not that there was anything so wonderful about the story itself, outside of its naked tragedy, but I think it was more the way that huge placid-eyed girl told it, with her broken English and her occasional pauses to grope after the right word. Or perhaps it was because it came as such a grim reality after those trifling, grotesque queries of the night before. At any rate, as I heard it this morning, it seemed as terrible as anything in Tolstoy's Heart of Darkness, and more than once sent my thoughts back to the sorrows of the house of Oedipus. It startled me a little, too, for I never thought to catch an echo of Greek tragedy out of the full soft lips of a Finnish girl who was helping me wash my breakfast dishes. It began as I was deciding on my dinner menu and looked to see if all our mushrooms had been used up. That prompted me to ask the girl why she never ate them. I could see a barricaded look come into her eyes, but she merely shrugged and said that sometimes they were poison and killed people. I told her that this was absurd and that anyone with ordinary intelligence soon got to know a meadow mushroom when he saw one. But sometimes, Olga insisted, they were death cups. If you ate a death cup, you died, and nothing could save you. I tried to convince her that this was just peasant superstition, but she announced that she had seen death cups, many of them, and had seen people who had been killed by them. And then brokenly, and with many heavy gestures of hesitation, she told me the story. Nearly 70 miles northwest of us, up near her old home, so she said, a Pole named Andrei Przenikowski and his wife used to live. They had one son, whose name was Joseph. They were poor, always poor, and could never succeed. So when Joseph was 15 years old, he went to the coast to make his fortune. The old father and mother had a hard time of it, for old Andre found it no easy thing to get about, having had his feet frozen years before. He stumped about like a hen with frostbitten claws, Olga said and his wife, old as she was, had to help him in the fields. One whole winter, he told Olga's father, they had lived on turnips. But season after season dragged on, and still they existed, God knows how. Of Joseph, they never heard again. But with Joseph himself, it was a different story. The boy went up to Alaska, before the days of the Klondike strike. There he worked in the fisheries and in the lumber camps, and still later he joined a mining outfit. Then he went into the Yukon. That was 12 years after he had first left home. He was a strong man by this time and spoke English very well. The next year he struck luck and washed up a great deal of gold, thousands of dollars worth of gold, but he saved it all for he had never forgotten the old folks on their little farm. So he gathered up his money and went down to Seattle, and then he crossed to Vancouver. From there, he made his way back to his old home, dressed like a man of the world and wearing a big gold watch and a chain and a gold ring. And when he walked in on the old folks, they failed to recognize him. And that, Joseph thought, the finest of jokes. He filled the little sod-cover shack with his laughter, for he was happy. He knew that for the rest of their days, their troubles had all ended. So he walked out and made plans. But still, he did not tell them who he was. It was so good a joke that he intended to make the most of it. But he had said he had news of their Joseph, who was not so badly off for a ne'er-do-well. 
Before he left the next day, he promised they should be told about their boy. And he laughed again and slapped his pocket full of gold, and the two old folks sat blinking at him in awe until he announced that he was hungry and confided to them that his friend Joseph had once told him there were wonderful mushrooms roundabout at that season of the year. Andre and his wife talked together in the cowshed before the old man hobbled out to gather the mushrooms. Poverty and suffering had made them hard, and the sight of this stranger with so much gold was too much for them. So it was a plate full of death cups which Andre's wife cooked for the brown-faced stranger with the loud laugh. And they stood about and watched him eat them. Then he died, as Andre knew he must die. But the old woman hid in the cowshed until it was over, for it took some time. Together, then, the old couple searched the dead man's bags and his pockets. They found papers, certain marks on his body. They knew then that they had murdered their own son. The old man hobbled all the way to the nearest village, where he sent a letter to Olga's father and bought a clothesline to take home. The journey took him an entire day. With that clothesline, Andre Prezinkowski and his wife hanged themselves from one of the rafters in the cowshed. Olga said that she was only five years old then, but she remembered driving over with the others after the letter had come to her father's place. She can still remember seeing the two old bodies hanging side by side and twisting slowly about in the wind and she saw what was left of the mushrooms. She says she can never forget it, and dreams of it quite often, and Olga is not what you would call emotional. She told me, as she dried her hands and hung up the dishpan, that she can still see her people staring down at what was left of that plate of poisoned death cups, which had turned quite black, almost as black as the dead man she saw them lift up on the dirty bed. End of section 23. Section 24 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Monday, the 12th. Yesterday was Sunday, and Olga, in her best bib and tucker, sat out in the sun with Dinky Dink. She seemed perfectly happy merely to hold him. I looked out to make sure he was all right, for a few days before, Olga had nearly given me heart failure by balancing my boy on one huge hand, as though he were a mutton shop, so that the adoring Oli might see him kick. As I stood watching Olga crooning over Buddy Boy, Percy rode up. Then he came over and joined Olga, who carefully lifted the veil covering Dinky Dink's face and showed him off to the somewhat intimidated Percy. Percy poked a finger at him and made absurd noises and felt his legs as Olga directed, then sat down in front of Olga. They talked there for a long time, quite oblivious of everything about them. At least Percy talked for Olga's replies seemed mostly monosyllabic, but she kept bathing him in that mystic moonlight stare of hers, and sometimes she showed her teeth in a slow and wistful sort of smile. Percy clattered on, quite unconscious that I was standing in the doorway staring at him. They seemed to be great pals, and I've been wondering what they talked about. Wednesday the 14th Today after dinner, Dinky Dunk took the boy and held him up on Patty's back, where he looked like a bump on a log. And that started me thinking that it wouldn't be so long before my little snoozerette had a pony of his own and would be cantering off across the prairie like a monkey on a circus horse. For I want my boy to ride, and ride well. And then a little later, he would be cantering off to school. And then it wouldn't be such a great while before he'd be hitting the trail side by side with some clear-eyed prairie girl on a dappled pinto. 
and I'd be a silvery-haired old lady, wondering if that clear-eyed girl was good enough for my son. And there I was, as usual, dreaming of the future. All day long, the fact that Dinky Dunk is getting extravagant has been hitting me just under the fifth rib. So I asked him if we could really afford a six-cylinder car with tan slipcovers and electric lights. Afford it? He echoed. Of course we can afford it. We can afford anything. Hang it all. Our lean days are over and we haven't had the imagination to wake up to the fact. And do you know what I'm going to do if certain things come my way? I'm going to send you and the babe down to New York for the winter. And where will you be? I promptly inquired. The look of mangled pride and determination went out of his face. Oh, I'll have to hang around the polar regions up here to look after things, but you and the boy have got to have your chance, and I'll come down for two weeks at Easter and bring you home with me. And will you be enjoying it up here? I inquired. Of course I won't, acknowledged Dinky Dunk. But think what it will mean to you, Gigi, to have a few months in the city again. And think what you've been missing. Goosey, goosey, gander, I said as I got his foolish old head in chancery. I want you to listen to me. There's nothing I've been missing. And you are plum loco, honey child, if you think I'd ever be happy away from you in New York or any other city. And I wouldn't go there for the winter if you gave me the plaza and all the park for a backyard. That declaration of mine seemed to puzzle him. But think what it would mean for the boy, he contended. Well, what? I demanded. Oh, good Good pictures and music and all that sort of thing, he vaguely explained. I couldn't help laughing at him. But, Dinky Dunk, don't you think Babe's a month or so too young to take up Debussy and the post-impressionists? You big, foolish, adorable, old, muddle-headed captor of helpless ladies' hearts. And I firmly announced that he could never, never get rid of me. Thursday, the 15th. Now that Olga is working all together inside with me, she is losing quite a little of her sunburn. Her skin is softer, and she has acquired a little more of the Leonardo da Vinci look. She almost seems to be getting spiritualized, but it may be simply because she's lengthened her skirts. She loves Babe, and I'm afraid is rather spoiling him. I find her a better and better companion, not only because she talks more, but because she seems in some way to be climbing up to a newer level. Between whiles, I'm teaching her to cook. She learns readily and is proud of her progress. But the thing of which she is proudest is her corsets, and they do make a difference. Even Dinky Dunk has noticed this. Yesterday, he stood and stared after her. By gum, he sagely remarked. That girl is getting a figure. Men are so absurd. When this same Olga was going about half uncovered, he never even noticed her. Now that she's mystified her nether limbs with a little drapery, he stands staring after her as though she were the Venus de Milo come to life. And Olga is slowly but surely losing a little of her Acadian simplicity. Yesterday, I caught her burning up her cowhide boots. She is ashamed of them. And she is spending most of her money on clothes, asking me many strange questions as to apparel and carrying off my fashion magazines to her bedroom for secret perusal. For the first time in her life, she is using cold cream, and the end seems to justify the means, for her skin is now like apple blossoms, Rodin, I feel sure, would have carried that woman across America on his back, once to have got her into his atelier. Last week, I persuaded Terry to take a try at Meredith, and I lent him my green cloth copy of Harry Richmond. Three days ago, I found the seventh page turned down at the corner and suspected that this marked the final frontier of his advance. I tied a strand of green silk thread about the volume. 
It was still there this morning, though Terry daily and stoutly maintains that he's getting on grand with that fine green book of mine. But at noon today, when Dinky Dunk got back from Buckhorn, he handed Terry a parcel, and I noticed the latter glanced rather uneasily about as he unwrapped it. This afternoon, I discovered that it held two new books in paper covers. One was The Hidden Hand, and the other was called The Terror of the Tamaraska Gulch. Terry, of late, has been doing his reading in his own room. And Nick Carter, apparently, is not to be so easily displaced. But a man who could make you read his book for the third time must be a genius. If I were an author, that's the sort of man I'd envy. And I think I'll try Percival Benson with The Terror of the Tamaraska Gulch when Terry is through with it. Friday the 16th We were just finishing dinner today, and an uncommonly good one, it seemed to me, and I was looking contentedly about my little family circle, wondering what more life could hold for a big, healthy hulk of a woman like me when the drone and purr of an approaching motor car broke through the sound of our talk. Dinky Dunk, in fact, was laying down the law about the farmers in the West, maintaining that he was a broader-spirited and bigger-minded man than his brother of the East, and pointed out that the Westerner's wife was a queen who, if she had a little ease at least, had great honor. And I was just thinking that one glorious thing about this same queen was that at least she escaped from all the 20th century strain and dislocation in the relationship between city men and women. When the hum of that car brought me back to earth and reminded me that I might have a table full of guests to feed. The car itself drew up with a flutter of its engine halfway between the shack and the corral. And at that sound, I imagine we all rather felt like Robinson Crusoe's, listening to the rattle of the anchor cable in Juan Fernandez's quietest bay. And through the open window, I could make out a huge touring car, pretty well powdered with dust and with no less than six men in it. Terry, all eyes, dove for the window, and Oli, all mouth, for the door. Olga leaned halfway across the table to look out, and I did a little staring myself. The only person who remained quiet was Dinky Dunk. He knocked out his pipe, stuck it in his pocket, put on his hat, and caught up a package of papers from his work table. Then he stalked out, with his gray fighting look about the eyes. He went out just as one of the bigger men was about to step down from the car so that the bigger man changed his mind and climbed back in his seat, like a king reascending his throne. And they all sat there so sedate and noncommittal and dignified, rather like dusty pallbearers in an undertaker's wagonette, that I promptly decided that they had come to foreclose a mortgage and take my dinky dunk's land away from him at one fell swoop. I could see my lord walk right up to the running board, with curt little nods to his visitors, and I knew by the trim of his shoulders that there was trouble ahead. Yet they started talking quietly enough, but inside of two minutes, my dinky dunk was shaking his fist in the face of one of the younger and bigger men, and calling him a liar, and somewhat tautologically accusing him of knowing that he was a liar, and that he always had been one. This altogether ungentlemanly language naturally brought forth language quite as ungentlemanly from the accused, who stood up in the car and took his turn at dancing about and shaking his own fist. And then the others seemed to take sides. The voices rose to a shout, and I saw that there was going to be another fight at Casa Grande, and I promptly decided to be in it. So... Off went my apron, and out I went. It was funny, for oddly enough, the effect of my entrance on the scene was like that on a noisy classroom at the teacher's return. The tumult stopped, rather sheepishly, and that earful of men instinctively slipped on their armor plate of over-obsquiesced sex gallantry. 
They knew I wasn't a lowbrow. I went right up to them, though something about their funereal discomfiture made me smile. So Dinky Dunk, mad as a wet hen though he was, had to introduce every man jack of them to me. One was a member of parliament, and another belonged to some kind of railway committee, and another was a road construction official, and another was a mere capitalist who owned two or three newspapers. The man Dinky Dunk had been calling a liar was a civil engineer, although it seemed to me that he had been acting decidedly uncivil. They ventured a platitude about the beautiful Indian summer weather and labored out a ponderous joke or two about such a bad-tempered man having such a good-looking wife, for which I despised them all. But I could see that even if my intrusion had put the soft pedal on their talk, it had also left everything uncomfortably tentative and noncommittal. For some reason or another, this was a man's fight, one which had to be settled in a man's way. So I decided to retire with outward dignity, even if with inward embarrassment. But I resented their uncouth commercial gallantry almost as much as I abominated their trying to bully my true love, and I gave them one Parthian shot as I turned away. The last prize fight I saw was in a sort of souteneur's cabaret in the Avenue du Tilleul, I sweetly explained to them. But that was nearly three years ago, so if there's going to be a bout in my backyard, I trust you gentlemen will be so good as to call me. And smiling up at their somewhat puzzled faces, I turned on my heel and went into the house. One of the men laughed loud and deep at this speech of mine, and a couple of the others seemed to sit puzzling over it. Yet two minutes after I was inside the shack, that most uncivil civil engineer and Dinky Dunk were at it again. Their language was more than I should care to repeat. The end of it was, however, that the six dusty pallbearers all stepped stiffly down out of their car, and Dinky Dunk shouted for Ole and Terry. At first I thought it was to be a duel, only I couldn't make out how it was to be fought with a post-hole auger and a few lengths of joined gas pipe, for this was what the men carried away with them. Away across the prairie, I could see them apparently engaged in the silly and quite profitless occupation of putting down a post hole where it wasn't in the least needed, and then clustering about this hole like a bunch of professional bigwigs about a new specimen on a microscope slide. They then moved on and made another hole, and still another, until I got tired of watching them. It was two hours later before they came back. Their voices now seemed more facetious, and there was more laughing and joking, Dinky Dunk and the uncivil civil engineer being the only quiet ones. And then the car engine purred and hummed, and they climbed heavily in and lighted cigars and waved hands and were off in a cloud of dust. But Dinky Dunk, when he came back into the shack with his papers, was in no mood for talking, and I knew better than to try to pump him. Tonight, he came in early for supper and announced that he'd have to leave for Winnipeg right away and might even have to go on to Ottawa. So I cooked his supper and packed his bag and held Babe up for him to kiss goodbye. But still, I didn't bother him with questions, for I was afraid of bad news. And he knew that I knew I could trust him. He kissed me goodbye in a tragically tender, or rather, a tenderly tragic sort of way, which made me wonder for a moment if he was possibly never coming back again. So I made him all wait while I took one extra, for good measure, in case I should be a grass widow for the rest of my days. Tonight, however, I sat Terry down at the end of the table and third-degreed him to the Queen's taste. The fight, as far as I can learn from this circuitous young Irishman, is all about the right-of-way through our part of the province. Dinky Dunk, it seems, has been working for it for over a year, and the man he called wicked names had been sent out by the officials to report on the territory. 
My husband claims he was bribed by the opposition party and turned in a report saying our district was without water. He also proclaimed that our land, our land, mark you, was unvaryingly poor and inferior soil. No wonder my dinky dunk had stormed. Then Terry rather disquieted me by chortlingly announcing that they had put one over on the whole bunch, for three days before, he'd quietly put down 20 soil and water test holes and carefully filled them in again. But he'd found what he was after, and that little army of paid knockers, he acknowledged, had been steered into the neighborhood where the soil was deepest and the water was nearest and that soon showed who the liar was. For of course, everything came out as Dinky Dunk wanted it to come out. But this phase of it I didn't discuss with Terry, for I had no desire to air my husband's moral obliquities before his hired man. Yet I am still disturbed by what I have heard. Oh, Dinky Dunk, I never imagined you were one bit sly, even in business. End of section 24. Section 25 of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Jennifer Perry. Sunday the 18th. Ole and Terry seem convinced of the fact that Dinky Dunk's farming has been a success. We have saved all our wheat crop, and it's a whopper. Terry, with his crazy Celtic enthusiasms, says that by next year, they'll be calling Dinky Dunk the Wheat King of the West. Olga and Piercy went buggy riding this afternoon. I wish I had some sort of scales to weigh my suzerette. I know he's doubled in the last three weeks. Sunday, the 25th. My Dinky Dunk is home again. He looks a little tired and hollow-eyed, but when the boy crowed and smiled up at him, his poor, tired face softened so wonderfully that it brought the tears to my eyes. I finally persuaded him to stop petting Babe and pay a little attention to me. After supper, he opened up his extra handbag and hauled out the heaps of things he'd bought for Babe and me. Then I sat on his knee and held his ear and made him blow away the smoke, every shred of it, so I could kiss him in my own particular places. Tuesday, the 27th. Dinky Dunk has sailed off to Buckhorn to do some telegraphing he should have done Saturday night. My suspicions about his slyness, by the way, were quite unfounded. It was the guileless-eyed Terry who'd led those railway officials out to the spot where he'd already secretly tested for water and found signs of it, and Terry can't even understand why Dinky Dunk is so toweringly angry about it all. Wednesday, the 28th. When Dinky Dunk came in last night after his drive out from Buckhorn, there was a look on his face that rather frightened me. I backed him up against the door after he'd had a peep at the boy and said, Let me smell your breath, sir. For with that strange light in his eyes, I surely thought he'd been drinking. Lips that touch liquor, I sang, shall never touch mine. But I was mistaken, and Dinky Dunk only laughed in a quiet, inward, rumbling sort of way that was new to him. I believe I am drunk, Boca Chica, he solemnly confessed. Drunk as a lord. Then he took both my hands in his. Do you know what's going to happen? He demanded. And of course I didn't. Then he hurled it point blank at me. The railway's going to come. Come where? I gasped. Come here, right across our land. It's settled, and there's no mistake about it this time. Inside of ten months, there'll be choo-choo cars steaming past Casa Grande. Skookum! I shouted. And there'll be a station within a mile of where you stand. And inside of two years, this seventeen or eighteen hundred acres of land will be worth forty dollars an acre easily, and perhaps even 50. And what that means, you can figure out for yourself. Whoopee! I gasped, 
trying in vain to figure out how much 40 times 1700 was. But that was not all. It would do away with the road haul to the elevator, which might have taken most of the profit out of his grain growing. To team wheat into buckhorn would have been a terrible discount, no matter what luck he might have had with his crops. So he'd been moving heaven and earth to get the steel to come his way. He pulled wires and interviewed members and guaranteed a water tank supply and promised a right-of-way and made use of his old engineering friends until his battle was won. And his last fight had been against the liar who'd sent in false reports about his district. But that was over now, and Casa Grande will no longer be the jumping-off place of civilization, the dot on the wilderness. It will be on the timetables and the mail routes, and I know my dinky dunk will be the first mayor of the new city, if there's ever a city to be mayor of. Friday the 30th Dinky dunk came in at noon today, tiptoed over to the crib to see if the boy was all right, and then came and put his hands on my shoulders, looking me solemnly in the eye. What do you suppose has happened? He demanded. Another railroad? I ventured. He shook his head. Of course, it was useless for me to try to guess. I pushed my finger against Dinky Dunk's Adam's apple and asked him what the news was. Percival Benson Woodhouse has just calmly announced to me that next week he's going to marry Olga, was my husband's answer. And he wondered why I smiled. Sunday the 1st. Little Dinky Dink is fast asleep in his hand-carved Scandinavian cradle. The night is cool, so we have a fire going. Big Dinky Dunk, who has been smoking his pipe, is sitting on one side of the table, and I am sitting on the other. Between us lies the bundle of house plans, which have just been mailed up to us from Philadelphia. This is the second night we've poured over them, and we've decided what we're to do at Casa Grande. We're to have a telephone as soon as the railway gets through, and a windmill and running water, and a new barn with a big soft water tank at one end, and a hot water furnace in the new house, and sleeping porches, and a butler's pantry, and a laundry chute, and next winter in California, if we want it and Dinky Dunk blames himself for never having brains enough to plant an avenue or two of poplars or Manitoba maples about Casa Grande, for now we'll have to wait a few years for foliage and shade. And he intends to have a playground for little Dinky Dink, for he agrees with me that our boy must be strong and manly and muscular, and must not use tobacco in any form until he's twenty at least. And Dinky Dunk has also agreed that I shall do all the punishing, if any punishing is ever necessary. His father, by the way, has just announced that he wants Babe to go to McGill and then to Oxford. But I have been insisting on Harvard, and I shall be firm about this. That promised to bring us to a deadlock, so we went back to our house plans again and Dinky Dunk pointed out that the new living room would be bigger than all our present shack and the annex put together, and that caused me to stare about our poor little cat-eyed cubbyhole of a wickium and for the first time realize that our first home was to be wiped off the map, and nothing would ever be the same again, and even the prairie over which I had stared in my joy and my sorrow would always be different. A lump came in my throat, and when Olga came in and I handed Dinky Dink to her, she could see that my lashes were wet, but she couldn't understand. So I slipped over to the piano and began to play. Very quietly, I sang through Herman Lore's Irish song that begins, In the dead of the night, a Krushla, when the new big house is still. But before I got to the last two verses, I'm afraid my voice was rather shaky. In the dead of the year, Akrushla, when me wild new fields are brown, I think of a wee old house on the edge of an old grey town. 
I think of the rush-lit faces, where the room and loaf was small, but the new years seem the lean years, and the old years best of all. Dinky Dunk came and stood close beside me. Has my Gigi a big sadness in her little prairie heart? He asked as he slipped his arms about me. But I was sniffling and couldn't answer him. And the cling of his blessed big arms about me only seemed to make everything worse. So I was bawling openly when he held up my face and helped himself to what must have been a terribly briny kiss. But I slipped away into my bedroom, for I am not one of those apple blossom women who can weep and still look pretty. And for two blessed hours, I've been sitting here, Matilda Ann, wondering if our new life will be as happy as our old life was. Those old days are over and gone, and the page must be turned. And on that last page, I was about to write Tamam Shud. But king-like and imperative through the quietness of Casa Grande, I hear the call of my beloved little tenor Robusto, and if it is the voice of hunger, it is also the voice of hope. The End End of Section 25 End of The Prairie Wife by Arthur Stringer